Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous people. Clark, are there any documents? Yes, Mr. President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. And are there any proposals for committees to meet? Indeed. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Austin. Um, I seek leave to move government business notice of motion number one relating to Senator Mirabella's first speech. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Oh, Senator Patrick, you're seeking the call? As an I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of the Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill as circulated. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Pursuant to contingent notice of motion standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended that, as would prevent me from moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion relating to the consideration of an Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill. Mr President, uh, I'm going to quickly address uh, a concern that Senator Rustin will, will no doubt raise uh, in her response to uh, uh, my short contribution here, and that is she's going to say that this is a stunt, that this is uh, a stunt brought on to waste government business time, but it's not. One of the roles of the Senate is to make sure we oversight the government, to make sure that the government does their work properly, to make sure that the government meets its, its commitments, the commitments it's made to the Australian public. Now, I draw the Senate's attention to back to uh, the 13th of December 2018, where the Prime Minister promised the Australian public that uh, were he to uh, uh, be given the opportunity to govern again, that he would introduce a Federal Integrity Commission bill. Now, I don't know whether that was a core promise. I don't know whether it was a promise. I don't know whether it was a commitment, an undertaking. I don't know which one of those uh, it was and, and how uh, the Prime Minister may uh, uh, consider each of those sorts of commitments, but I know the Australian public want, would want to accept that on prima, fa prima facie that if the Prime Minister says that, that the Prime Minister would do that. But he hasn't. He was either lying to the, to the public or he, was, or he simply uh, has misled them. It's not like we're at the start of the, of the uh, 46th parliament. We're at the end. We're at the end. And there's a commitment by the Prime Minister to deal with a Federal Integrity Commission that has not been met. And that's why this is urgent. That's why this must be dealt with today. Because We've run out of time otherwise. We don't have a bill that the government's brought uh, to the chamber. So there's a bill that I've uh, tabled that has been worked up by uh, eminent experts in this area, former judicial uh, officers included, thanks to, um, thank, thanks to the member for Indi, Helen Haynes. And we need to deal with that. We need to deal with this urgently. We have a situation where we've got a government 
going into the last election, knowing full well that there is no uh, Federal Integrity Commission, who engaged in car park rorting. Who engaged in rorting. And I say that with the backing of the Auditor General. The backing of the Auditor General. We find that in the Treasurer's uh, um, own seat, four car parks were allocated. One of those car parks comes in at a cost of $220,000 per car park. Now, let me just explain to, to, to how this, how this uh, principle works. We are supposed to take taxpayers' money and spend it on the basis of need and on the basis of merit. That's what we're supposed to do. And yet, against the rules, against the objectives of the grant program, the Treasurer awarded uh, or, or announced grants to his own electorate. Now, if you are a public official and you, uh, and, and you uh, subvert process and give money for the purposes of personal benefit, that being getting re-elected, that is corruption. That is corruption. And we have to be able to deal with that. We've seen sports rorts where people uh, or communities were, were given a, uh, a grant, not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of a colour-coded spreadsheet. And that is wrong. We've seen water purchases that well exceed market values. In fact, we find that, uh, in, in one instance, uh, the department seemed to not be able to uh, uh, understand evaluation properly. We've got blind trusts where ministers are getting paid a million dollars from unknown contributors, and the, the, the government is not standing for, uh, tall and saying that's wrong. There are so many issues that we need to uh, have addressed in relation to corruption so that people can regain confidence in this place and in the other place. And that's why we need to urgently deal with this bill. And I ask that uh, senators support my motion to suspend. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the government does not support Senator Patrick's motion uh, to, uh, to suspend. Uh, the government does not support it on the basis that, uh, that we uh, have a well-developed draft legislation uh, established, published in relation to Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Now, Mr. President, there are, there are many misconceptions peddled uh, by some in relation to these debates. Uh, they are peddled in the context of seemingly uh, trying to create an impression that there is no anti-corruption framework uh, in Australia, which is just patently untrue, Mr. President. It's patently untrue, Mr. President. We have existing frameworks uh, that tackle corruption clearly already. Under the frameworks, multiple agencies across the Commonwealth Government have responsibilities for preventing, detecting and responding to corruption. Uh, these agencies, such as the Commonwealth, uh, the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, bring specialist skills to address corruption across law enforcement agencies. The Australian Federal Police uh, Mr. President, uh, have the powers and work across partner agencies right across the Commonwealth to leverage their expertise and capabilities, information and data collection capabilities to respond to serious and complex corruption offences, uh, including any allegations of fraud, foreign bribery uh, or the like uh, under existing corruption laws. The Commonwealth Ombudsman Mr. President, uh, considers and investigates complaints where people believe they have been treated unfairly by an Australian government department. Uh, even in relation to uh, matters such as our own expenses, we have the Independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority uh, that advises reports on expenses of, uh, of parliamentarians and their staff. This is all set within, of course, laws clearly enabled and established that deal with corrupt conduct uh, and, uh, and, of course, all of the other elements of scrutiny applied uh, within this parliament and a free media across our democracy. But, Mr President, uh, we have seen benefit uh, in acknowledging that having greater consolidation, uh, greater coordination across those different entities and efforts for handling uh, corruption matters uh, would be a positive. That's why we've gone through an extensive process in relation to developing uh, the legislation around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. The Integrity Commission that we propose, uh, backed by several hundred pages 
of legislation, detailed modelling that, uh, that has been put there. We'll investigate the most serious forms of criminal corruption that threaten good public administration, but it won't duplicate the roles of existing bodies uh, that already investigate uh, corruption. Uh, the arrangement we're proposing reflects the different nature of the corruption risks that exist across law enforcement bodies as opposed to those that exist in the public sector. And when we talk about the public sector, we mean, of course, across the public sector, from uh, office holders at ministerial level right through the public service and public sector. Uh, where the public sector division of our proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission find evidence of a criminal offence, it would refer a matter rightly to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, ensuring that the courts remain the relevant arbiter of whether someone is innocent or guilty of a corrupt offence. Mr President, we have put in place uh, funding arrangements uh, for the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. The 1920 uh, budget committed more than $106 million uh, of support for that, in addition to more than $40 million for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. The substantial investment that we have made, Mr President, is in stark contrast uh, to uh, the very low levels of budgeting and support that had been provided under previous governments for uh, anti-corruption and uh, uh, related activities and enforcement. We've already implemented phase one of our Commonwealth Integrity Commission by expanding uh, the jurisdiction of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity to cover additional agencies, the ATO, ASIC, uh, APRA and the ACCC. So, Mr President, the work is there, the legislation uh, has, been, uh, has been developed. What we're very clear about, though, is that you know, we're not interested in establishing star chamber type processes. We're not interested in establishing processes that are simply there as political playthings. So the invitation stands to the crossbench, to the Greens, to the Labor Party. Make clear you'll support the model the government has developed for an integrity commission. Uh, that will clearly bring together the elements of being able to further strengthen and uphold Australia's anti-corruption framework. Uh, and we will see that legislation past. Uh, but we're not interested in entertaining uh, a model that simply creates opportunities for more political grandstanding uh, that becomes a kangaroo court or a show trial model. This has got to be done in the type of proper way that our government has proposed. I'll go to Senator Gallagher next, but I know you do wish to speak. Senator Roberts. Thank you, thank you Mr President. Um, Thank you, Senator Roberts, uh, on indulgence. Uh, Labor will be uh, supporting the suspension this morning, and we certainly support uh, the motion being moved by Senator Patrick, should the suspension uh, get up. Uh, we have been calling for an anti-corruption commission for some time. The government promised a national anti-corruption commission 1,154 days ago. Uh, and then we hear from the leader of the government in the Senate today all the reasons why we're not in a position to debate a government bill. The reality is, over 1,154 days ago, this was a promise. It was a promise by the Prime Minister. It was a promise by a Prime Minister under pressure um, because of the scandals and failing and the lack of integrity in his government and the lack of trust and the lack of public trust in his government. And he had to politically manage a situation at the time, so he promised an anti-corruption commission. He promised he would bring in legislation to do that. And then the government went around spending three years ensuring that they don't deliver on that promise. And this has been a conscious decision by the government, because a government without integrity doesn't want an integrity commission, because that is a fundamental problem for a government without integrity and for a government with ministerial scandals after ministerial scandals, where after you do a bit of time on the backbench, on the bleachers, you get forgiven and brought back in. And all of the sins that were committed and the standards of ministerial accountability that used to exist in every other government of both political colours which have been kicked to the curb, all the rules have been rewritten under this government. You can be rehabilitated. Everyone's guaranteed a spot in the cabinet room, regardless of what offence you commit. That's the standard this government set. So why on earth would they want to bring an, an integrity commission when they fundamentally have a massive problem with integrity? 
They don't want scrutiny. And when they did work up their draft bill, it was a model that had no teeth, that set a lower standard for ministers and politicians. What a surprise! And was universally rejected by every organisation and every expert who understands anything around anti-corruption commissions. That was a big achievement, and I think it was a conscious decision by the government. They wanted to ensure that they had a work plan for the last 1,154 days, which ultimately didn't deliver an anti-corruption commission in this country. And they have systematically and comprehensively gone about their business, making sure that never happens. Uh, and they've achieved it. And every time, I think every sitting week for the past uh, year or so, where someone in this place brings forward a motion and has the numbers, um, on a bill that passed this place and now for debate on another bill, the government opposes it and then tries to blame the finger at everybody else who's actually arguing for a stronger um, anti-corruption uh, commission. And let's make no mistake of why this government's in this position. We have had scandal after scandal uh, with ministers like Minister Taylor. Remember the forged documents? Remember that old chestnut? Yeah. Remember Grassgate, also yeah, in his portfolio? We had Watergate. Yeah. We've got all the rorts and uh, funds that have been established where the government doesn't even pretend they're trying to do the right thing by that. Billions of dollars hidden in the budget to splash out on seats they either need to hold or they want to win. And we know in the last uh, mid year update, $16 billion of our money hidden in the budget for more election gift giving to certain seats. We've got a treasurer in this country who appropriated money for all of us through the budget and then went and awarded himself in his own seat four car parks. I don't think any of them have been built. That is the standard where the treasurer, the prime minister, senior ministers conduct themselves in this way without integrity and do everything they can to resist the bringing on of debate for an anti-corruption commission. The Senate should stand up and support the suspension of standing orders and the motion Senator Patrick uh, has brought in today. Senator Waters was on her speech first. First, Senator Roberts. So, Senator Waters, you have Thanks, a call. Thanks, President. The Greens will, of course, support this suspension of standing orders. We've been trying to get a corruption watchdog federally for 13 years now. And we don't care whose name is on the bill, we just want this done. And it's no surprise that this government once again wants to shut down debate on setting up an effective corruption watchdog because half of their cabinet have been implicated in integrity scandals. Oh, yeah. Half. Yeah. Now, it was 1,154 1, days since the Prime Minister made a promise that he would, in fact, introduce an integrity commission. It was long overdue even then, but it was a welcome commitment. Since that time, we've seen a draft outline that was rubbished by every expert who reviewed it. Nearly 18 months after that, a much maligned draft bill that failed to address any of the earlier criticisms by experts. There was some more obfuscation in there. We then had multiple estimates hearings where we were told that more consultation was happening and amendments were being drafted. But then the Prime Minister said that there'd be no changes from the earlier draft, and if Labor and the Crossbench wanted an integrity commission, we just have to take the pathetic version on offer. And then nothing happened. And then this week, the Attorney General said that an integrity commission was not a priority before the election. They're so busy discriminating against gay kids, they just can't get on with their actual job. Um, and then the Prime Minister said, oh, no, we'll see, but then he continues to prioritise legislation uh, that promotes bigotry in our community. So uh, one has to really wonder, can you trust a single word this Prime Minister and this government says? And I think we all know the answer to that question. There are a few things that the Australian community is more unified on than the need for a strong corruption watchdog. Nearly 90 per cent of Australians want this, and it's an absolute disgrace that this government finds every trick in the book to try and delay doing it. Public confidence in the integrity of Australian politicians is plummeting, and rightly so. The latest Transparency International Corruption Perception Index gives Australia its lowest ever ranking. 
Lack of progress on the Integrity Commission was a key factor in that lowest ever score. We need a strong, an independent and a powerful corruption watchdog with powers to root out corruption that runs rife in this place and continues to undermine our democracy. We have been pushing for this for 13 years, and two years ago this Senate passed the Greens bill for a strong, independent corruption watchdog with teeth. Now, that was two years ago, and the government's refused to bring that on for a vote in the House. It's running scared of integrity. Now, we support um, Senator Patrick's bill, which is a, a, a replica of Dr Haynes' bill in the other place. We don't care whose name is on the bill. We just want it done. Without a federal ICAC, Australians have to rely on a patchwork of other bodies to try and find out the dodgy dealings of this government. You've got the ANAO, Senate inquiries, OPDs, FOI challenges, state and territory corruption bodies, AEC disclosures and investigative journalism. And even with that, uh, that schema, which the government now contends is adequate, it's clearly not, you've revealed a litany of scandals. The list is long and unedifying. Sports rorts, pork and ride, the urban congestion fund, the Leppington Triangle, Watergate, Grassgate, millions of dollars being handed to polluting gas companies headed up by Liberal donors. Last week's AEC disclosures revealed uh, Empire Energy made some sizeable donations before they got a government grant of public money to frack the Beedaloo Basin against the wishes of First Nations communities. Every single one of the grants programs that the ANAO have audited since 2009, to the tune of $10 billion, every single one of them was found to be flawed with problems identified ranging from minor improvements uh, to serious maladministration. Now, this patchwork of integrity measures is clearly not enough because corruption is rife. It's allowing far too many things to slip through the cracks, and you, the Australian public can't understand the full scale of corruption and fraud and dishonesty without a strong independent corruption watchdog, and nor can we deter such behaviour without a strong watchdog. As Australians head back to the polls, and that can't come soon enough, voters need to have confidence that a new government will be overseen by a corruption watchdog with broad powers. They need to have confidence that there will be consequences when corrupt conduct is identified and that there won't be a protection racket for politicians, which is the uh, short version of what this government is proposing. We support bringing this bill on and giving Australia what it needs to start rebuilding that confidence in our democracy and that the people they elect will work in the public interest. But it's no surprise that a government without integrity doesn't want to bring on a bill to set up an integrity commission. Just before I give you the call, Senator Roberts, I'll also indicate that Senator Scar has indicated he wishes to participate remotely, so he will get the call after Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. One Nation has always supported an Integrity Commission being established for the Federal Parliament, once we realised the Parliament could not look after itself. We do, though, oppose Senator Patrick's suspension, motion to suspend standing orders, and I'll explain why. Corruption of federal taxpayer money to the tune of billions of dollars was a subject that we moved a motion to have an inquiry into, a Senate inquiry. The Liberal Party opposed it after initially supporting it. The Labor Party opposed it. The Greens opposed it. Senator Patrick opposed it. That was billions of dollars at stake. Secondly, water trading. It's a breach of the Water Act, and the Liberal Nationals have allowed it to continue. We moved a, a motion in, in this parliament to get it fixed. It went to the lower house where the Labor Party opposed it, the Liberal Party opposed it, the National Party opposed it. Billions of dollars again there and unfairness destroying regional communities. We also have a list of 28 people supposed to be on a, a watch list or a, a list with regard to paedophilia. I contacted the person who raised that in an earlier Senate, in an earlier parliament. A barrister on my behalf read that list. That list has no complainant, no identification as to who put forward that list. It also has no formal complaint and no evidence. But in the process of that, the barrister I used found extensive need for cleaning up parliament with regard to supporting pedophiles 
and other criminals. We need though, to extend it properly from parliamentarians to judges to police to bureaucrats. We need to do a good job. Now, the government's bill for an integrity commission is hopeless. It is not sincere, in my view. Second, thirdly, Helen Haynes's bill has much to commend it. That's the Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill 2021, which is what Senator Patrick is supporting. It, supporting. We support it in principle. However, it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of some details because it leaves people vulnerable and open to being besmirched, as we've seen happen in New South Wales, without evidence. And that we cannot support. It must be done. Such a bill must be debated extensively and not rushed through parliament. We cannot do that in a morning. Senator Patrick himself said that we are now at the end of the 46th parliament. Exactly. Let the people judge in an, in an election within the next three months. Let the people judge because the Liberal National Party has not delivered on its promise. The Prime Minister has told Furfies about vaccine mandates not existing in this country. Tell that to 25 million people in this country. That is a lie. And yet we now have the, the breaching, breaching of his promise. The people can judge him in just a few months, three months. Each party should have a policy on this and let the people judge each party on that. It seems to me that we need to assess people by their actions, by their deeds, not their words. I think this is a stunt trying to get media before a flagging election campaign. Regardless of my opinion, one thing is for sure, one thing is for sure. This Order. parliament serves the parties, the major parties and their donors and vested interests, some of whom are outside this country. We need to end that. We need to regain the confidence of the people, their confidence in parliament. We need to do that by making sure, we're making sure that the parliament re returns to serving the people. We need the parliament to serve the people. That's its job. So we need to change the parliament. We need to change the parliament. And to do that, we need to change the way Australians vote. We as voters, as Australians, need to change the way we vote. Put the majors last. Remember that in the coming election. Put the majors last. Senator Henderson. President, this motion to suspend standing orders should be absolutely rejected. One Nation is right about one thing. This is a stunt. We saw one yesterday, Order. and we're going to see rolling stunts in this parliament rather than allow the parliament Order. to get on with the business of governing in the interests of the Australian people. And I'm going to start my contribution by reminding those opposite the dangers of implementing the model that they are advocating for. Amanda Stapledon, who committed suicide tragically, committed suicide after facing allegations by IBAC in Victoria. A parliamentary Order. committee has called urgent talks, and this is reported in The Australian, to consider complaints about the conduct of Victorian anti-corruption agencies after the suicide of the former mayor. Parliament's Integrity and Oversight Committee has ordered a special meeting to discuss complaints from witnesses involved in the marathon investigation into allegedly corrupt land deals involving Casey councillors and a property developer. And I'm reading from The Australian. In formal complaints to the committee, several witnesses have accused the Independent Broad-Based Anti-Corruption Commission and the Victorian Inspectorate, the body charged with monitoring IBAC, of having blood on their hands over the death of Amanda Stapledon because of the fact that this model in Victoria, like New South Wales, is akin to a star chamber. There is not adequate natural justice, and the model we put forward provides Order. proper justice. Senator Patrick. And shame on those opposite for not recognising that natural ju justice in an integrity Senator commission Wise. is important. And these are the consequences 
These are the consequences of the star chamber that we see in Victoria. This woman had a disabled son who's now been left on his own. You think about the consequences of Order. You think about the consequences of putting someone into a star chamber under the most extraordinary Order. pressure, arguably false allegations, driving this woman to the brink. Shame on you. So what we have put forward, which is not supported by Labor, not supported by you, Senator Patrick, not supported by the Greens or the crossbench, is a model which provides natural justice. It will hold the entire public sector, including parliamentarians and their officers, to account. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission is to investigate corruption. It is not some tool used to air vexatious and politically motivated claims. And I just consider what I've gone through in the last few months, from the likes of Fairfax and the New Daily. I've been accused of corruption because I delivered an election commitment to support the Torquay Bowls Club. I mean, honestly, this is Order. out of control. Politics in this country, courtesy of the cross pension Greens and Labor, has become so toxic that you can't even deliver a community-supported grant without being accused of corruption. It is no wonder Order. that Senator this Lambie. government is taking this issue responsibly. And I say, as a tribute to Amanda Stapleton and all those other victims of anti-corruption commissions who have been subjected to false allegations, whose lives have been destroyed, we are not going to follow that model. We are not going to have blood on our hands. On point of order. We are not going to embrace your model. Senator Henderson, point of order. Order, um, Mr. President. The the senator should be making a contribution through the chair and not uh, directly at other senators. Look, where are we? Well, Senator Henderson, I, I'm sorry, but we, this is actually a time-limited debate, and no, 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 the, 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 the time is limited to half an hour, and sometimes a speaker is still on their feet when the half an hour ends. Um, so I'm afraid we are actually at the end of the debate. Uh, I will now put the question on the suspension of standing orders. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. Uh, the question is on the motion to suspend standing orders. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 29. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. We will now return to the order of business and I'll give senators a moment to resume their seats and then I will call the clerk. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform, Maves Law Bill 2021, second reading debate. Senator Gallagher, you're in continuation. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. And I'll start where I left off last night in acknowledging that the bill does raise concerns for some senators and on votes of conscience when the colours of party are stripped away we just stand here as individuals and we bring our own perspective and our own life experience to the chamber. I come to this vote as someone who spent years working in the disability sector. I come to this vote as someone who spent eight years as a Minister for Health. And I come to this vote as someone who's experienced the death of loved ones and of the deep grief that follows. But mostly I come uh, to this vote as a mum of three amazing children. And I have read the stories uh, from parents about their experience uh, with dealing uh, and supporting and loving a child with mitochondrial disorder. I do support this bill and I really hope that it passes the Senate this week. I acknowledge the Minister for Health for his pursuit of these reforms and my colleagues, the former Shadow Minister for Health, Chris Bowen and current Shadow Minister for Health and Ageing Mark Butler for working together on this bill and working across the chamber to draft a bill that has the greatest opportunity of passing the parliament. Much gets achieved quietly across the chambers in this place and when that happens often good things are achieved. This bill is an example of that and there should be more of it. It has taken years to get to this point, but it's now the time to pass Maeve's law and give parents the chance to have a family without the stress and distress of passing on a life-threatening condition. If the bill passes, it will prevent the birth of children who would otherwise be severely challenged with disabilities and illness and whose parents and families find themselves often in heartbreaking situation of loving and caring for a child with significant health challenges. 
I think anyone who's raised a child knows the joys that it brings to one's life, and anyone who has longed for a child and been unable to have one knows the pain that that can bring. This bill, well, it, you know, from my point of view, this bill isn't complex. It gives some Australian families the opportunity to experience the joy of having children without the worry of passing on mitochondrial disease. The bill uses improvements in health technology, in science, in health policy and in ethics to ma map out a small but significant way of improving the lives of our fellow citizens. This is why I, I will be supporting this bill. I see it as my job as a legislator to use the position of power and influence to help make a better, more caring world. This bill helps to do that. But thank you to everyone who has worked to get the bill to this point. I really hope we can pass the bill this week and give you all the certainty you have been seeking for years when Maeve's law becomes the law. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise today to provide some remarks on the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Bill 2021, known as Maeve's Law. In doing so, I would first and foremost like to extend my gratitude to my colleagues from all sides of this chamber and in the other place for approaching this debate in such a respectful manner. This is a complex piece of legislation which attack, attempts to tackle a complex issue. And I recognise that there are a broad range of views which have been raised throughout this debate. Our ability to do so in this place in such a considerate and measured way is a testament to this parliament. This bill amends a number of existing pieces of legislation to allow for the introduction of mitochondrial donation in Australia for the purposes of research and, eventually, human reproduction under a national regulatory framework. The ultimate aim of this is to develop the technology to prevent the passing on of mitochondrial disease to future generations. Mitochondrial disease, or MITO as it's colloquially known, occurs due to mutations of mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA which impacts the function of mitochondria, the part of every human cell that contains DNA. It manifests in a variety of symptoms which can become apparent very early on in a child's life, including seizures, developmental delays, fatigue and muscle pain, vision and hearing issues, potential organ failure and sometimes death. There are currently no known cures. I have met with sufferers of MITO, and there is no denying the significant pain and despair that they must endure because of this horrible disease. You can see it on their faces, in the visible pain they are experiencing just by doing the things that other people take for granted—going for a walk, drinking a cup of coffee, sometimes even just sitting upright in a chair. Mitochondrial disease is hereditary, and in the vast majority of cases this occurs through the mother. While it can vary depending on the genetic makeup of both parents, generally speaking, um, by my measure, there's a 25 to 50 per cent chance that a faulty mitochondrial DNA will be passed on to a child. If both parents have the gene, that chance is effectively 100 per cent. This bill enables a framework to research and potentially implement the use of mitochondrial donation so that a family with a genetic predisposition to the disease may have a healthy child. This practice was legalised in the United Kingdom in 2015 and involves the transfer of genetic material extracted from a mother's egg and the placing of that material into a donor egg, which has its own genetic material removed but retains its own intact mitochondria. Under the framework proposed in this bill, the initial egg can be fertilised before or after the mitochondrial donation has occurred. I'm not going to stand here today and assert that it was easy to decide whether to support this bill because it wasn't. The concept of mitochondrial donation engages a number of different ethical questions, not least because we are attempting to regulate here a, something that is incredibly new and a not especially well-tested technology. And I note that many of those questions have been traversed and pondered by my colleagues in their contributions. But the key question for me personally is, do those questions and concerns outweigh the possibility of protecting future generations of children from inheriting this insidious mitochondrial disease. To be very clear, 
I worry about what might come next. And we should never pretend in this place that our actions in legislating today have no bearing on what might happen a year, five, ten, fifty years' time, because of course they do. I also worry about the untested nature of some of these technologies and what other health concerns might result from this fusion of DNA, because we have very limited data from the United Kingdom where mitochondrial donation has been legal as to what the long-term health prospects of such children might be. And I was particularly worried about this bill allowing parents the ability to only implant male embryos. And I sincerely congratulate my colleagues in the other place in amending this bill to remove the option for sex selection. These are all genuinely held concerns. And judging by the correspondence I've received from many Australians about this legislation, I know that these concerns are not just held by me. But then I think about the concerns of those Australians who are suffering from mitochondrial disease, and particularly those sufferers who wish to have a child free of the debilitating ailments they themselves have had to endure. I'm not a mother myself, but I obviously know plenty of women who are. I also know plenty of women who have struggled through infertility and miscarriage and the inevitable heartbreak that comes from not being able to have a child. And as a woman, I don't think I can come into this place and deny other women, those who may be carriers of mitochondrial disease, the possibility of having a healthy child. And that's what this legislation provides. I'm glad to see further amendments to this legislation in the other place which have increased reporting requirements and safeguarding to the regulatory scheme for this research, and I will certainly be considering any further amendments which may be moved by honourable senators to that same extent on their merits. But regardless of the success of those amendments, I will be supporting this bill, and I hope that in future years we can confidently say that no Australian child will be born with the tragic burden of suffering from this awful disease. Senator. Um, I bring to your attention the state of the chamber. Ring the bells. Uh, no, it's, been, it's, it's changed. Oh, no, um, stop. The Can't cancel a quorum. Uh, Senator Thorpe, you just have to wait till we do the quorum. You can, as long as you remain in the room, you're okay. We have quorum. I stop the bells. Senator Lyons, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I must say I've listened um, with great interest to all of the debate uh, that's um, occurred so far on this bill in the chamber, and it reminds me very much of the debates we had in Western Australia when the state parliament moved the voluntary euthanasia bill because it does actually, for many people, go to an issue of conscience. But um, like many debates, uh, what becomes a key feature of the debate seems to miss the whole intention. And certainly that occurred with the Voluntary Euthanasia Bill. Despite that bill in Western Australia having overwhelming support 
of Western Australians, I think something like 80 per cent of West Australians supported <coughs> the right of people with a severe terminal illness to decide uh, the timing of their death. It was held up um, by, in the end, a handful of people who, who I'm not criticising in any way. They, their views were passionately held. But it did get down to an issue, I guess, of people's personal morality, of what they thought was OK. Now, the, the problem with that is that's then balanced against this, these horrendous stories. And there's no doubt in Western Australia, I have to say, I started um, feeling pretty agnostic about voluntary euthanasia. I didn't really have an opinion. I'd have to say I was probably slightly uncomfortable with the concept. But it was when I started to read the stories and to meet the people whose um, relatives and friends had passed away in horrendous circumstances, in deaths none of us would want to imagine for anyone, that I started to see actually this was bigger. This was bigger than someone's personal morality. This was giving people who wanted the right to do so to end their own life. And through that process, I met the most amazing young woman, uh, Belinda Tay. You might remember, if you followed the West Australian debates, Belinda's mother died of breast cancer uh, very tragically and in a very painful way, despite having the best of palliative care available to her, she had a very tragic death. And Belinda was so motivated and moved and uh, devastated by the loss of her mother at such a young age that she decided to raise awareness by walking from Melbourne to Perth. And during that journey, Belinda herself became politicised, and she was one of the key leaders of the community debate in Western Australia for voluntary euthanasia. I'm really proud to say that she worked as part of my team for several months, and she's an extraordinary woman. But that experience that touched her mother changed Belinda's life. It's forever changed because what she saw her mother suffer. And so if I think about the mitochondrial debate and I look to the stories that are around uh, about the sufferers of that disease, they are equally as horrendous. For most people who contract that disease, inherit it genetically, it's a death sentence. And it's not an easy death sentence. The, the, the pain and the suffering and the trauma experienced by those who have the disease is horrendous. And seemingly we don't have uh, the treatments or the care to enable that suffering to be eased in any way. And I was very moved to read of a young West Australian woman, Pippa. Her story is on the Mito Foundation's website. And I was so moved by her story and her bravery that uh, we contacted her family. Pippa sadly passed away almost two years ago. The second year anniversary has just passed. And asked if I could read Pippa's story. Uh, and they've given me that permission. So I wanted uh, to take some time in my contribution to do that. In 1997, Pippa woke up in severe pain and was unable to move. She was admitted to hospital and stayed for one month. She was initially diagnosed with a form of chronic fatigue and had to undergo intensive rehabilitation and physiotherapy to learn to walk again. Six months later, Pippa woke up disoriented and confused. She begged for someone to turn on the lights in her room, but they were already on. Pippa had gone temporarily blind and endured multiple seizures, which caused a loss of consciousness and violent muscle contractions. At this point, she was diagnosed with grand mal epilepsy. On her 21st birthday, 
Pippa suffered a complete nervous breakdown, characterised by violent hallucinations and a string of seizures. It was at this point that she was diagnosed with mitochondrial disease and after the tireless efforts of her doctors. After this, Pippa and her mum both had muscle biopsies and Melis, a maternally inherited form of mito, was identified. Later, Pippa's sister Toby also tested positive for Melas. As a result, Toby chose not to have children, not willing to run the gauntlet <clears throat> of potentially passing on the disease to her own children. Over the years, <clears throat> Pippa spent countless months in and out of hospital and was placed on life support no less than five times. Her family was told there was no chance of recovery. Yet Pippa shone in the face of adversity. She kept her humour and continued to celebrate other people's success and happiness. She was empathetic, compassionate and caring. Pippa was given 12 months to live, but she fought on for another 22 years. The final 12 months of her life was unimaginably tough as her health gradually deteriorated even further. Towards the end, she suffered several stroke-like events, gut and bowel issues and a declining cognitive function. Despite defying her doctors countless times, Pippa died almost exactly two years ago, on the 4th of February 2020, surrounded by her loving family and friends. Although the last few years of her life were incredibly difficult, Pippa's family went to Europe three times, had several holidays interstate, and went on as many trips throughout WA as they could manage. Before she passed away, the whole family went to Melbourne for Pippa's 40th birthday, which included a memorable overnight stay at Werribee One Plains Zoo. Despite all that Pippa had been through, her family said she never lost her big laugh, which they all knew so well. And Pippa sounds like someone that I really would love to have met. But of course, what keeps families going in all of this, and it was exactly the same for uh, those people whose stories I read in the euthanasia debate, is they want to remember the person before the illness. And nobody ever wants an illness to define the person. And it seems to me that Pippa was able to strive above that, to continue to be Pippa despite these horrific health issues that she faced. And of course, what we know from Pippa's story and what we know from the other stories that have been told in this place is that mitochondrial disease is a debilitating genetic discord that robs the body's cells of energy, causing multiple organ dysfunctions or failures and sometimes, and I think often, death. There's no cure. Now, it might well be that there's a cure in the future, and I hope that we keep dedicating medical research uh, to that, and let's hope that there is a cure. But right now, there isn't a cure. And current treatments aim to decrease the effect of the symptoms, but of course can't change the course of the disease. And as we heard in Pippa's case, and in other cases that I've read, uh, the, the, the treatments that she had um, didn't really reduce the severity of the pain and disability that Pippa um, suffered. One in 5,000 babies will develop a severely disabling and likely terminal form of mitochondrial disease. That's 56 births a year in Australia, more than one per week. This is why I support this legislation. It's why I'm, I really believe it's an important milestone for us as a parliament to vote, to vote on and to vote yes, because we're not forcing anyone to do anything. Just like the voluntary euthanasia laws in Australia 
or women's reproductive rights when it comes to terminations. We are enabling a choice. It mightn't be the choice that any of us make, but it will be the choice that other families and other individuals make. And that's what I want to achieve in this parliament, is to simply give people that choice. And of course, to focus our energy on cures and on easing the symptoms through pain management and of doing whatever else we can. But this is a course of action that not only stops um, the baby developing mitochondrial disease, but it stops the genetic transfer so that, so that people like Pippa's sister Toby don't have to make that incredibly difficult decision to not have children because she feared passing it on. So I would urge people, please don't stand in the way of giving people that choice, that personal choice. Please don't let your morality or your beliefs stand in the way to stop other people from simply being given that choice. And it may well be that some families with mitochondrial disease have the same view as some senators in here, that that's not a choice for them. And that's okay. But there will be many families who see their child suffering who would make that choice. And I'd challenge any of us in here, faced with our, the suffering of our own children or our friends' children, or even people like Pippa that I don't know, who would want people to have that level of suffering? I don't think any senator in here, regardless of your personal belief, would want that on anyone. And so we have a choice here today, or whenever we get to, to finally vote on this bill, to end that suffering for people who choose this course of action, or to continue to stick to our own moral beliefs and to force them across the whole community. That isn't the role of us here as senators. And that's the reason, in the end, I became a passionate supporter of the Youth of Asia bill, bill in Western Australia. Because on hearing Belinda Tay and other stories uh, of reading all of the dying with dignity um, stories of watching their videos, I realised it wasn't for me to impinge my views on them. It was for me, as a legislator, to enable that choice for others to take it or not to take it. And we have a lot of laws on our statute books that give people choice. Women's reproductive rights, abortion, voluntary euthanasia. And this law, if this bill, if it's passed here this week, will become just one of those that gives people a choice, a real choice. Imagine if this was available to Toby, and I don't know how old Toby is, she may be past the age of wanting children, and let's assume she took this option up. It changes her life, that suddenly she's able to confidently make a choice to have children, knowing that she isn't going to, if she uses this procedure, she's not going to pass on this debilitating disease to the next generation, to her children, to her flesh and blood. Because none of us would willingly choose that. We just wouldn't. That's not a choice we would make to, to uh, pass on a genetic disorder um, to our children and to watch them suffer. Because that's the worst thing a parent can do, is to watch your own children suffer. Because we always think as parents it's our role to protect our children, which of course it is, and to do the best by them. So I urge you, please, to pass this legislation. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, now, in, in considering this bill and this legislation, uh, a lot of people do find it confusing. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm a veterinary, a veterinary surgeon and a scientist, and, and I even found it confusing until I delved right down deeply into it. Um, I feel like it's a little bit misnamed, uh, mitochondrial donation. People kind of equate it with um, organ donation. So you may decide that when you die you want to donate your organs. Um, the person who uh, receives that organ 
gets that organ, it's donated by you, you've said you can take that from me when I die, hopefully after you die, not before, um, and, and that person receives that organ donation and they have it until they pass away. Um, this is not a donation as such because it's the taking of genetic material from one cell and putting it in another. So um, it might seem like semantics, but I think in people's heads they hear donation and they equate it to organ donation, uh, which is a, a very well understood and long practiced technique. So if we just go into a little bit of the, <clears throat> the science of it. Um, so the mitochondria, as um, others might have said, are, are little structures in our cells. They exist in, in all cells. And they're often described as the, the powerhouse or the engine room. Uh, so they're the structures which take essentially what we eat and turn it into energy for the cell to function. Now in mitochondrial disease, which is becoming um, better and better understood, and this is a fairly recent thing in, in terms of um, medical research, it's becoming a, a more understood uh, disease. Um, in recent times. So there's various different types of mitochondrial disease. Um, and it's basically a, a dysfunction of the genetic material within the mitochondria, which, which leads to various uh, manifestations. And they can be extremely mild, so much so that the person with the condition doesn't even realise there's anything wrong with them. Or they can be quite devastating. Uh, leading to, to very, very early death um, of, of babies or children, or uh, devastating long-term medical effects, as Senator Lyons detailed with the case of Pippa. Um, very, very distressing to hear about that case, and I'm, I'm sure no one uh, would, would um, not have sympathy for someone that, that had to live with such a debilitating disease and uh, a premature death. So that's the, the basic um, what mitochondrial disease can, can do in effect. It can be very mild, to, not noticeable to the person, to something that, that is incompatible with life. Um, so what does mitochondrial donation do? So you're basically taking uh, a cell from a donor that doesn't have mitochondrial disease, so uh, a normal healthy person, and you're taking the genetic material which is, is in this case an egg um, because most of your mitochondria is inherited maternally, so from your mother, um, although that's not 100% uh, cut and dried, but the majority of it comes from your mother. <clears throat> so this is generally passed on from mothers to their children. So you're taking the egg and uh, two eggs, one from a donor who doesn't have mitochondrial disease, one from the mother who does have mitochondrial disease, and you're removing the healthy DNA uh, from the donor and implanting it, taking out the DNA that's, um, that's in the mother with the mito disease and implanting the DNA from that healthy egg to the defective egg. Then fertilising it and, um, and then it goes on to hopefully, the theory is because as far as I'm aware this hasn't actually been done to produce a normal healthy human but the theory is that you will get a normal baby that has the mother's genetic material, the father's genetic material, and the mitochondria only will have the genetic material from the donor. So, so that's the theory of it. Um, <clears throat> as Senator Lyons said, there is, no, there is no cure, there is no treatment for this disease. And, and that's true, and, and this, this, um, this technique isn't either. And there's, there's actually about five different techniques you can use, and they, they do vary slightly. I know Senator Canavan is moving um, some amendments, and um, some of those go to the different techniques that are used, uh, because there is concern amongst um, some people that in destroying um, a zygote or an embryo that, that you're taking of a life, so I, I, I get that. It's not my concern, but I understand that is the concern of many. <clears throat> but the theory is so that you get this um, normal embryo, uh, which then hopefully turns out to a normal person 
without the mitochondrial disease. Um, and, uh, and yes, there is currently no, no effective treatment and no cure, um, but there is a prevention. There's definitely a prevention. Um, and then this goes to your, your morals and your ethics and goes to the question of do you think, do you believe it's a person's absolute right to have a child of their genetic makeup? And I, I, I'm not going to argue that because, I mean, my point of view personally is, is no, having a child is not an absolute right that every single person on the planet has. Um, we all have a lot of things that we have burning desires for, and I, I get that for some people that is having a child that is of their genetic makeup. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other people that have um, just as great burning desires about various things, and, um, and we know that in life you don't always get what you want. Um, so I, I would argue that it's not an absolute government guaranteed right for every single person to be able to have a child of their genetic makeup. But as I said, that's, a, that's an ethical um, and moral debate. Um, but you, as I said, you can prevent, you can prevent mitochondrial disease currently. Um, you can pre prevent it by diagnosing it in, um, in the mother or the father. Um, and, and that's something that I think we need to focus on. I think we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit with this legislation because this would only ever come into effect if you've diagnosed the disease first. So I think we need to put a lot more effort into genetic screening so that people know they have this and, and many other genetic diseases before they make the, the choice to have a child. Um, so I think that's essential. Um, because if you know you have mitochondrial disease, you can choose, there's a few choices you can make. You can choose not to have a child. You can choose, right, children are not going to be for me, I'm not going to have children. You can choose IVF. So you can still have a child that is of your partner's genetic makeup, um, a donor, and, and you can carry that child and give birth to that child. And you have a child that's your child that you've given birth to, all right, it doesn't have the mother's genetic material. Um, but as we've seen for many, many years all around the world, that, that doesn't stop people from, from having, loving and raising children. So you've still got that option. The other option is if you've got a burning desire to have a child, you can adopt. And that's something that I would also like to see more effort put into in this country is um, facilitating adoptions. There's a whole pile of, of kids, babies, kids, um, teenagers out there that would um, love to have a loving family raise them. And adoption in this country is quite difficult. Um, so I would like to see that facilitated, to give that as an option. It's not going to be for everybody because, as we know, some people have that burning desire, this child must be of my genetic makeup. But for those that just want a child, that can give uh, a child a loving family home and, and a great life, then we should be doing all we can to facilitate that before we're putting billions of dollars into developing techniques that can give someone, okay, potentially, let's, uh, let's not forget, this is potentially because this is um, experimental still. And it does concern me that we've had these laws in place in the UK for six years now, and we don't have evidence that um, these techniques can produce um, normal, healthy, children. So that, that is a bit of a concern. Um, so, you know, I, th I, think, I think we need to consider how much effort we're putting into these laws and this research compared to other uh, things that we could be facilitating, such as adoption, IVF. Um, however, saying that, um, I think it's important that Australian researchers are given the opportunity to conduct um, world-leading research, and it's something that Australia does very well. We've been world leaders in um, a lot of different aspects of medical research. So I think enabling the research and the testing to occur is, is important, 
And I know one of Senator Canavan's um, amendments concerns the second phase, if you like. So it, it allows um, the research to occur. So Australian medical researchers can start conducting this research in Australia. Um, but it stops short of allowing some minister in some government uh, in the future, and we're told it's probably at least 10 years before this would go on to, to actually the phase two of the, the clinical trials and the um, clinical application. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for starting the process, and, and not just because this technique could give um, a, 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 fa a family a genetic child of their making, but we don't know what else this research could lead to. Uh, we really just don't know that yet. It, it could well be that some of the techniques that are developed with this research, some stage in the future, could save humanity. Um, so I, I really do think it's important to start the research, um, to allow, to have legislation that allows that to occur. But I would like to see it stop short of legislating here and now for, as I said, something that some minister from some government at some stage in the future um, can make up the regulations which will then determine how this is clinically applied. We've got time. This is not time critical. Time critical to start the research, but not time critical um, to legislate for the clinical applications. Um, we've, got, we've got at least 10 years, maybe even more. I mean, the, the UK hasn't done much in six years. So we've got time um, and we, ha we can come back to the, the parliament in the future. And that may be a few years, that may be 10 years, whatever time frame it is. We can come back when we've got the results of the research that the UK is doing and that also our own researchers are doing. That can be brought back to the parliament and the parliament can then make legislation. So I, I certainly would support this bill with amendments and um, that would be one amendment that um, I would really need to see is that we, we split it, we can go ahead with phase one, but it needs to actually come back to the parliament rather than just be delegated to a, a minister to make regulations on. Um, so that would be a, a critical thing that I would need to see to support this legislation. Thank you. Senator Keneally. I rise to contribute to the debate on the mitochondrial donation law reform bill. As acknowledged by Senator Murray Watt, who represents Labor's Shadow Minister for Health in this chamber, Labor members and senators have a conscience vote on this bill. In my public life, I participated in many conscience votes, and I appreciate that the Australian Labor Party in its rules and processes acknowledges there are certain matters which engage significant moral, ethical and spiritual issues, and therefore the most appropriate way to deal with them is to recognize that members and senators ought to exercise their consciences and vote accordingly. Accordingly. Usually these are matters of life and death, such as abortion and euthanasia, though the Labor Party has also extended conscience votes appropriately in the past to matters pertaining to the removing of discrimination or granting equal rights to persons regardless of sexual orientation. Today's vote is one that deals with matters of life and death. Before I get to the bill, I want to speak briefly about my approach to conscience votes in general. My view of conscience and the formation of conscience is shaped by my Catholic faith. An often misunderstood view about in the, in the public is that uh, all church, Catholic church positions and teachings are infallible, that is, without error, and therefore required to be followed without question. That is not quite correct. There are some teachings that are infallible, but the vast majority are not. In fact, the church teaches that Catholics have a duty to follow their conscience above all else, and no Catholic can be compelled to act against their conscience. To, full, to fully form a conscience, Catholics are required to consider both faith and reason, to consider the human experience, and to consider the evidence that exists in the fields of science and, and other relevant fields, and also consider church tradition and scripture. In some cases, this process of conscience formation has led me to vote in accordance with the positions of my church. For example, when I voted to oppose the use of embryos in stem cell research. In other circumstances, I voted in contradiction of what my church taught, such as when the Keneally government in New South Wales brought forward a conscience vote to grant same-sex couples adoption rights, a bill I supported, and a bill that passed the parliament.
I was aided in the process of conscience formation on this bill by participating in the Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee inquiry in June 2018, chaired by Green Senator Rachel Seward, where I had first-hand experience and opportunity to examine the issues, the evidence, and the experiences of people who'd be impacted by this bill. Now, this bill proposes to legalize a technique that would assist women with a genetic condition known as mitochondrial disease to conceive a healthy genetically related baby. Mitochondrial disease is a term that covers hundreds of conditions. It can be mild with little or no symptoms, or it can be severe enough to be life-threatening. It can occur spontaneously at conception, or it can be passed on by mothers who have a mutated mitochondrial DNA. Fathers generally cannot pass on mutated mitochondrial DNA because, to their children because all mitochondrial DNA comes from our mothers. Currently, children with my, currently mothers, or women I should say, currently women with mitochondrial disease have some options if they want to have children. Some women use IVF and donor eggs to avoid passing on the disease. Others choose IVF with their own eggs but screen embryos before implantation to select those with the lowest risk of carrying the disease. Some may choose to adopt or foster children and some may choose not to become a parent. But some women with the disease see mitochondrial donation as another option to create a healthy genetically linked child. The desire to have a child that is genetically related is foundational and universal to the human condition. Sadly, there are people who are not able to fulfill that desire due to genetic conditions, medical infertility, or social infertility. While my own situation of stillbirth is not perfectly analogous to the matters this bill covers, I note that my second child, my daughter Caroline, died of a condition that runs in sibling groups, a genetic condition for which there is no known clear cause or cure. Her death was a warning to me that any of my future children would carry a high risk of death as well, which in turn prompted our family to change our hopes and dreams in response to the children we would not have. Knowing that the strong human desire to have a genetically related child will be unfulfilled, no matter the reason, brings great sadness. It can be profoundly devastating. And I am sure I am not the only member of this parliament or the community to experience this sadness. And yet, in my conscience, I will be voting against this bill. In my conscience, while I can deeply and personally understand the desire of some parents with mitochondrial disease to access this process, I cannot support its legalization at this stage of scientific evidence or while significant moral and ethical problems remain unanswered. The 2018 Senate inquiry into mitochondrial donation took evidence from people with mitochondrial disease, as well as from medical and ethical experts. Our Senate inquiry did not recommend that mitochondrial donation be legalized in Australia. One of my key concerns relates to the lack of scientific evidence on the impact of human beings and our DNA when mitochondrial donation occurs. The process of mitochondrial donation results in a baby with three people con contributing to its genetic makeup, which is why the technique is sometimes referred to as creating three parent babies. In Australia, the Cloning Act prohibits the implantation of a human embryo with genetic material from more than two people, and for good reason. We simply don't know the scientific effects on future generations of altering mitochondrial DNA. The Senate report went into this in some detail, noting that this is, quote, a foundational question to be answered prior to any legalization of mitochondrial donation. In the United States, mitochondrial donation is expressly prohibited for this very reason. U.S. law also makes clear that even if a clinical trial of mitochondrial donation were to be approved, it would only be permitted on male embryos, so as to avoid unknown consequences on future generations. There are also crucial questions uh, that have yet to be, uh, be examined, uh, and the Senate inquiry pointed to those. In the interest of time, I will not go through all of them. But I will flag that I am also alarmed that legalizing mitochondrial donation would overturn key safeguards in Australian law relating to the creation, use, and destruction of human embryos. These laws exist because the Parliament has previously determined that the appropriate ethical limits uh, that should exist on the use, use of human embryos. Yet, successive laws in 2002 and again in 2006 and now keep moving the goalposts, removing safeguards, and take us another step down a slippery slope. In asking the Parliament to legalize mitochondrial donation, Minister Hunt is asking the Parliament to overturn key aspects of the Cloning Act and other laws. For example, one of the techniques for mitochondrial donation involves the creation of a viable human embryo in order to harvest it for parts and then destroy it. 
Many Australians share the view that such action is morally objectionable and that it should remain unlawful in Australia. Even the cross-partisan Senate report acknowledged that the creation and deliberate destruction of viable human embryos for reproductive purposes was a new moral question that deserves significant community consultation and consideration. I do not see evidence that this consultation has happened. For me, creating embryos for the purpose of harvesting and destroying them is a moral rubicon I cannot cross. Some might argue that this is no different to creating embryos for IVF, some of which may end up being destroyed. I understand that response, and my response would be that the intention in their creation matters. Creating embryos for the purpose of creating new life is something I accept. Yes, some embryos through IVF may end up being destroyed, just as some embryos created through natural conception do not survive to birth. The key difference is the intention. In IVF, we are not creating an embryo, a new distinct human life, for the sole purpose of harvesting, experimenting, or destroying it. Another concern I have about mitochondrial donation is that it can require the development of a human embryo beyond 14 days outside a woman's body. Growing an embryo in a laboratory for more than two weeks has been outlawed in Australia and many countries for decades, recognizing that serious moral and scientific issues start to arise after that point in human development. In my view, this is an ethical line Australia crosses at our peril, and we could have serious repercussions in unexpected ways, including, I might observe, to, on a woman's right to choose options in pregnancy. I noted that, in forming my conscience, I sought to rely not only on my faith but on reason, on scientific evidence. It is significant to me that mitochondrial donation is a technique that has never been verifiably used anywhere in the world. The only jurisdiction that has legalized mitochondrial donation, the United Kingdom in 2015, admits, and I quote, we have limited evidence on risks and success rates. Just consider that we have limited evidence on risks and success rates. That is undeniably true. In over six years, no baby has been born in the United Kingdom using mitochondrial donation. There have been reports of donations in Mexico and the Ukraine, but there are no, where there are no specific regulations on mitochondrial donation. Those reports are somewhat unclear, and in these cases, the results have been unverified publicly by medical science. As I said earlier, the procedure is expressly banned in the United States. We do know that the United Kingdom has granted 21 licenses for mitochondrial donation since 2015, and as many as eight have been subsequently approved for treatment. However, there is no public reporting available of the outcome of those treatments. To put it simply, the science is not clearly available to answer the key questions, the foundational questions, as the Senate report said, of what happens if we alter human DNA in such a way to create a person with three people contributing to its genetic makeup. Now, I do not come to my position of opposing this bill lightly. I also note there are amendments that have been uh, circulated in the chamber, and I do take a view in general that those amendments seek to improve this bill. Nonetheless, I would like to be clear that even with the support, even if those amendments are successful, I will still vote against this bill. I do hope for those who are listening and reading today, along with this debate, that they can appreciate the moral, the ethical, and the scientific questions I have wrestled with during consideration of the committee inquiry and this bill. And I do come with empathy an empathy grounded in our shared human longing for genetically related children, an empathy grown from my own experience of losing a child to a genetic condition. There can be no doubt that some people with mitochondrial disease suffer greatly. And while some of us may have had analogous experiences, I acknowledge we cannot fully understand what it is to live with mitochondrial disease. Nonetheless, as parliamentarians, we are required to bring all of our considerations to this debate, our human empathy, our examination of the scientific evidence, and our moral and ethical convictions to this conscience vote. And no one pretends that this decision is easy for anyone. 
for those people who want the laws changed or for those parliamentarians who might be grappling with these issues for the first time. Some members of this chamber indeed will choose to support this legislation. I respect their views, but in my conscience, as I have laid out here, I cannot agree. And for that reason, I will be voting no. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. I just want to begin my contribution by conveying my condolences to Senator Keneally. I, I wasn't aware of her loss, and I just want to say um, I'm very, very sorry to hear your story. Severe mitochondrial disease can have a devastating effect on families, including the premature death of children, painful, debilitating and disabling suffering, long-term ill health and poor quality of life. Approximately one child each week is born in Australia with, with a severe form of mitochondrial disease and often with a life expectancy of less than five years. Mitochondrial diseases are difficult to diagnose and there is currently no known cure. Treatment options are limited and largely concern the management of symptoms. More severe forms of mitochondrial disease can have a devastating effect on families who prematurely lose children to the disease and children who survive often suffer from long-term ill health and poor quality of life. In Australia, approximately 56 children are born each year with a severe form of mitochondrial disease and most will die within their first five years. This bill will assist those families affected by severe mitochondrial disease to use technology, assuming of course the research and development stacks up, that will enable them to have biological children without passing on this debilitating illness. As we've heard in this debate, and this is the parliament at its very best, a respectful debate about an issue of conscience where all senators um, have the ability to express their deeply felt personal views. This is a very difficult issue. Mitochondrial um, donation is an assisted reproductive technology that, when combined with IVF, has the potential to allow women whose mitochondria would predispose their potential children to mitochondrial disease to have a biological child who does not inherit that predisposition. It involves a complex process to create an embryo which includes nuclear DNA from the man and the woman seeking to have a child, the prospective mother, and mitochondrial DNA from a different woman, the mitochondrial donor. Mitochondrial donation can therefore minimise the risk of transmission of the prospective mother's mitochondria and in doing so aims to prevent future generations from inheriting these severe and debilitating diseases. The government's laudably narrow proposal is that mitochondrial donation in Australia is implemented in a two-stage process, and this is very important, which will provide for a cautious introduction of the technology. The first stage involves legalising mitochondrial donation for use in research settings and for reproductive purposes through one carefully chosen organisation subject to an extensive monitoring regime by the Embryo Research Licensing Committee. The second stage involves permitting mitochondrial donation in clinical practice more broadly. This, I would say, conservative approach brings Australia into line with the approach undertaken by the UK where mitochondrial donation has already been legalised for the purpose of minimising the risk of transmitting serious mitochondrial disease from a mother to her child. The government has consulted extensively on this bill with experts, scientists, clinicians and researchers, as well as members of the community and advocacy groups. Notwithstanding its benefits, I recognise that mitochondrial donation raises vexed and very difficult ethical and moral questions about the modification of the human genome and the use of embryos purely for research and training 
and that is why, of course, the government has rightly allowed a conscience vote on this issue. I'm very conscious, and Senator Keneally referenced uh, IVF technology, and very conscious that without IVF technology and all of the research and development into that technology, thousands upon thousands of children would not have been born in this country, and of course that would probably run into millions around the world. Um, IVF technology involves the creation of embryos, but some of which are knowingly destroyed, and that obviously is an ethical dilemma that each and every one of us has to grapple with. Um, for me, I believe that IVF technology has been a game changer for this country and for thousands upon thousands of families. And investing in the research and development has changed the lives of so many Australians. For my part, I believe that the benefits of allowing mitochondrial donation outweigh the risks. Mitochondrial donation will not result in three-parent IVF as being contended. Children born using this technology still have only one father and one mother. The female donor only contributes healthy mitochondria and no more. No genetic material involved in the personality of the child. The characteristics of the child is inherited from the mitochondrial donor. Moreover, the bill expressly prohibits gene editing of either the nuclear or mitochondrial DNA of the child. Donor rights and responsibilities for Australian mitochondrial donation egg donors will be largely aligned to current assisted reproductive technology regulations, such that these donors will not be considered parents for the purposes of the Family Law Act, and children conceived with the assistance of mitochondrial donation will have the right to apply for identifying information about their donor when they turn 18 years old. I believe, in my conscience, the bill goes as far as is necessary to allow potentially life-saving technology to be used for the benefit of our children uh, without spilling into the very murky ethical territory of human gene editing. I do also want to note that Senator Canavan has just provided me with some more information in relation to amendments that he intends to move, and I will, in good faith, consider those amendments as part of this debate. Uh, but I will be voting for this bill, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, I rise in support of the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Amendment Bill. This is a matter of conscience for Labor senators, and I believe the first conscience vote that I have participated in in my time here. And my conscience tells me that we should allow this science to be investigated and developed here in Australia, and ultimately allow the opportunity to save the lives and prevent the suffering of thousands of Australians. Mitochondrial disease can have severe and profound impacts on sufferers, and I'd like to thank the Mito Foundation for taking me through the realities and the experiences and stories of this disease on its victims and to recognise the enormous amount of work that they do to support people and their families suffering with this disease. This disease affects around 1 in 20 Australians in some way, and around one baby a week is born with a severe form of it, and there is no cure. Some people who are affected by mitochondrial disease are fortunate enough to not experience many symptoms, while others are completely and utterly devastated by its impacts. Whether it's enormous fatigue, developmental delays, seizures, muscle pain, hearing loss, these symptoms can have a debilitating effect on a person's quality of life and a resultant impact on their family. Fundamentally, mitochondrial disorders impair the body's ability to produce energy. And so mitochondrial disease can affect every organ in the body, as every organ needs energy to function. This is most severe in the brain, 
which uses an enormous amount of energy and issues in the brain, in the brain can have a devastating impact on our lives. Mitochondrial donation gives us an opportunity to fix the problem before a person is born and before its lifelong effects begin. This treatment, as we've heard from many others, is fundamentally an assisted reproductive technology. It doesn't end the suffering of people who are suffering from mitochondrial disease today, but it might prevent the next generation from that pain. I acknowledge the respect and respect the concerns that have been raised by some in this chamber um, and by stakeholders and some members of the public. But we need to be very clear this is not a process to select the characteristics of your baby. It is a very specific cl clinical process to save lives. This is a relatively new set of procedures. The UK remains the only country to date uh, that has changed its law to allow for mitochondrial donation. And that was only in 2015. An update from one of the research organisations in the National Health Service in the UK um, has provided um, advice that their progress has been delayed due to COVID-19, but that their progress so far has been very positive. But we don't have the benefit of lifelong experiences of people born after mitochondrial donation procedures were performed. So we do need to be cautious. But we have no shortage of stories from people who spent their lives struggling with mitochondrial disease. We know the devastation it can bring on sufferers and their loved ones. And to their credit, the government has undertaken a thorough process to get us to this point. The Community Affairs and References Committee of this Senate considered the issue in 2018 taking public submissions and issuing a series of recommendations for further examination. The National Health and Medical Research Council explored the issues in 2019 and 2020 through its Mitochondrial Donation Expert Working Committee. And this bill was the result of a process of consultation undertaken by the Department of Health last year. So it's clear this process has not been rushed and nor has it been a tool for scoring any sort, of bipartisan, any sort of partisan or ideological points. By contrast, it has been thoughtful and considered. And the bill it has resulted in similarly reflects a considered and cautious approach. The bill would not immediately legalise mitochondrial donation. Instead, this bill provides for a two-stage process. Stage one is expected to last for some 10 years. Only limited numbers of licenses will be granted for mitochondrial donation for research and training. It will not be available for general clinical use and will, only, and will be closely monitored by the special committee of the National Health and Medical Research Council. Only at stage two, well into the 2030s, will mitochondrial donation become available for clinical purposes. And even then, the states and territories will need to opt into the scheme and likely needed to undertake their own legislative processes to do so. I know this will be cold comfort for those families currently suffering with mitochondrial disease. And it will be especially tough for those who want to start their own families, but know doing so will carry the risk of their children being affected by this disease. And it will be especially tough for those who want to start, um, who are looking at this situation and are dealing with the day-to-day -day effects on their current children. But on balance, I support this approach. It gives us certainty that we will understand the long-term effects of this incredible technology while also providing hope to affected families. There are quite detailed provisions uh, relating to records which will need to be kept and maintained right, relating to the children born through these processes. And I think that is very important, not only for the scientific study and the research purposes, but also for the rights of the children born through this process. In closing, I want to reiterate my support for this important piece of law reform. 
And I also want to pay my respects to the Australian science community and the truly amazing work that they do on so many issues. And they have the talent and the patience to bring the science behind mitochondrial donation to fruition and to turn hope into reality for a lot of Australian families. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Ayres. Uh, very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, this is, in fact, um, I think my first uh, opportunity to participate uh, in a conscience vote uh, in, uh, in this parliament. Um, it's, uh, it's got a long history uh, in this parliament, uh, the operation of the conscience vote. Um, it's covered <clears throat> uh, many matters. Uh, contemporarily, it's understood uh, to deal with uh, matters of uh, life and death, uh, matters of faith. Um, but it's, uh, it has historically been uh, used as a matter of convenience up until 1963. Questions about tariffs uh, were conscience votes uh, in this parliament. Um, hard, to imagine, hard to imagine that being the case now, matters of trade and tariffs and economic questions. Uh, it has, of course, a long history uh, in the Australian Labor Party and the Labor movement. Uh, it's critical for my view, the functioning of our democracy. Um, it is uh, a, an opportunity uh, for people to participate in this debate, as uh, my friend Senator Gallagher said uh, earlier, uh, without, um, without our party logos on, but applying uh, our reason and the sort of value set in our various faiths uh, to these questions. Um, and it has been critical uh, I have to say, uh, in terms of maintaining Labor unity and unity on the progressive side of Australian politics has allowed us to focus on our historical mission uh, to lift living standards, to deliver economic growth and to build a stronger, fairer economy, uh, but on these narrow questions of conscience to allow members and senators uh, to express their view. Uh, so in that vein, um, I've taken this matter very seriously. Uh, and that taking it seriously means taking the views of other senators seriously uh, in this debate, uh, respecting the very diverse uh, sets of views of other senators, uh, both across the chamber and within my own party. It also involves not taking the views of others for granted based upon their faith background uh, or their lack of faith background. You know, it is possible for people of deep faith uh, whose faith informs their views about the sanctity of life or the relationship between the dignity of individual lives and the collective interest. Uh, and state action in the national interest, in my view, to fall on either side uh, of this argument, to speak or vote for or against this legislation. And it's possible indeed for the caricature that some people draw of secular progressives who are also mobilised by deep ethical considerations. Uh, deep ethical concerns and frameworks who could legitimately appear in today's debate arguing the case for or against uh, the legislation. And it's dangerous, and there's been too much of it uh, over the last few decades, of identity politics on the left and on the right, of drawing caricatures of different people's position. Uh, they're there should be a lot less of it. Uh, and I think my friend Stephen Jones's speech, Mr. Mr. Jones's speech yesterday uh, in the House on the other matter that's before this parliament was an illustration that not only is Australia more complex, uh, more diverse, more of a patchwork 
than some of the people in our leading uh, newspapers and some of the people in our political firmament that it's convenient for them to describe, but Australians themselves as individuals hold quite diverse and thoughtful views uh, on these subjects. You know, most Australians fall cheerfully between these identity politics caricatures of what people's views uh, are supposed to be in relation to any issue. And I think, thirdly, the responsibility when there is a conscience vote is not to just assert a view based upon the values and the, background, the ethical background that you bring to this, but to bring some precision uh, to one's own thinking when one considers these issues. Uh, to be really clear, not just in terms of moral clarity, I think it would be a profound error to make a values-based decision about exercising one's vote if one is really ignorant of the precise details of what is being proposed uh, for senators uh, to consider. Uh, and I have to say that if I was confronted with a piece of legislation here that had had aspects of genetic modification or cloning, gene editing technologies, uh, th those practices I would find deeply problematic. Uh, I would have deep objections that would be uh, difficult to overcome uh, if those issues were engaged uh, by the legislation here. But I have come to the view that this piece of legislation, carefully developed, uh, does not engage uh, with those issues. Uh, the kind of processes uh, that are being uh, proposed to be made lawful here, both in terms of research and clinical practice, they don't alter the personal characteristics of uh, future babies and future humans in any way. They just resolve this narrow question uh, of whether or not a baby has functioning mitochondria, properly functioning mitochondria or not. Uh, and I think that's what this Senate should engage with. Not the anticipation of other debates uh, that might be occurring in terms of the future of gene technology uh, or shaped by views of past debates that have been won and lost in this place, but upon the precise question that this bill engages. I don't accept the slippery slope argument that's made by some opponents of this legislation. This parliament, as, uh, as we evolve uh, and as scientific research and clinical practice evolves, has to be able to make decisions about the right processes, uh, the direction of regulation, uh, and uh, I don't accept that making this decision here has any impact on future decisions that the parliament makes. It is put by opponents of this uh, legislation that there is some uncertainty in future research, and I accept that that's the case. Uh, there are some areas of uncertainty, and I don't have the scientific capability to, to describe those uh, here for you today. But that's why there is a two-stage process. That's why there are gates and proper evaluations. Um, there are some certainties, though, that if we don't adopt the approach that's outlined in this bill, uh, that there is no hope for the one in 5,000 babies you know, around, one, one, around one a week uh, who are born 
with this invariably fatal condition. And we can't, in my view, be remote from that fact. It, it is a good thing that the legislation is named after a little girl. It is a good thing. You can't have a cold heart uh, when you look into the eyes of little children. We do have to, in my view, consider that uh, and not turn away from the reality for those little kids uh, and for their families. Um, this is a signature piece of legislation for Minister Hunt. Uh, I know that the Prime Minister uh, has indicated uh, his support for the legislation too. It's a signature piece of legislation. and I know the Prime Minister may not want to have uh, a policy legacy, uh, and, and he's very unlikely to have one. But if this piece of legislation is achieved, Minister Hunt will have a policy legacy, and it will be uh, in uh, the happy lives uh, and the laughter uh, and the growth of little children who haven't been born yet. The scale of community consultation that has um, underpinned this legislation uh, is absolutely appropriate. Uh, the scale of, uh, uh, on the Labor Party's side, uh, caucus debate and consideration of this across all of the different views on this question, which, as I've said, I deeply respect, uh, has been uh, excellent. And I particularly want to highlight the role uh, that the member for MacArthur, Dr Freelander, in his previous life, a consulting paediatrician, has brought to um, uh, my colleagues' deliberations on this matter. His decades of experience of treating children with mitochondrial disease uh, has not only enriched our collective discussions on this question and the public discussions, but also in private, uh, Mike has been a source of great support uh, and somebody who's been able to answer questions, not just for me, I know, but for, but for others. Of course, there, there, are, there have been other complex questions that have been considered by previous parliaments uh, on these issues. The previous debates about reproductive technology uh, in this chamber, and this will, of course, not be the last. I just point uh, to, to one of those debates. The, the, the debates about whether or not in vitro fertilisation treatment would be uh, able to be researched and then enter into clinical practice in Australia, I think, is instructive. Um, under the direction of Carl Wood and Alan Trounson, those Monash University researchers achieved the world's first IVF pregnancy in 1973 and the birth of the third IVF baby in 1980. They are pioneering scientific achievements. Tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, Madam Acting Deputy President, of happy, healthy children have been born to parents who might not otherwise have been able to conceive. Uh, and Australian parliaments were amongst the first in the world to develop and pass legislation in a regulatory framework to govern IVF treatments. It was the Hawke government that established the National Bioethics Consultative Committee in 1988 to address, amongst other things, surrogacy, information in related to donated eggs and sperm and genetic counselling. One in 20 babies born in Australia today are, are, are a result of IVF treatment. Um, and that is, that is a good thing. It was controversial at the time. And I know it is controversial still for some members and senators in this place, uh, but it's been widely adopted. Uh, it is a good thing and it has enriched the lives of countless thousands of Australian families. 
And similarly, I think this Senate should view this piece of legislation in that vein. This is an opportunity and what is inevitably the squalid end uh, of this term of parliament uh, as the government creaks towards the calling of election to do some good that will enrich the lives of little children uh, and families all over Australia and give them some hope. Thank you, Senator Dez. Sen Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make just a brief contribution on this debate. I won't go into the bill in depth as other speakers have done. Its main components have been well canvassed by both sides of this debate. But I do want to put on the record for my constituents my reasons for supporting this bill. From the outset, I wish to be clear that I have not come to this position quickly. I have not come to it with perfect ease and I have not come to it without some reservations. And I'm grateful for all of those who have provided me with counsel as I've worked through the bill's merits and the challenges that it presents. And I absolutely respect the deeply held views on both sides of this debate. And I want to particularly state for the record my deep respect for the views of my colleagues who, for reasons of their faith or for other ethical reasoning, do not feel able to support this bill. I feel personally that I am able to reconcile my own deeply held faith with this bill, but I very much understand why others may not. These are complex questions, indeed some of the most complex questions in and of life that are asked and debated, not just in this chamber, but in our community as well. And of course, beyond these issues, there is still so much we don't know about mitochondrial transfer. And there are some risks that are impossible to quantify until research is allowed in a regulated, in a structured way. And I do understand and respect the, colleague, the concerns of my colleagues here too, I do. But, Acting Deputy President, on this vote of conscience, mine is telling me to stand with the mothers and fathers for whom this bill offers hope. Hope to replace fear, hope to alleviate pain, hope to provide some comfort to their grief. I am a mother blessed with two wonderful children that are a miraculous and wonderful blend of my husband and of myself. And whilst my pregnancies weren't without their serious challenges, we never faced the heartbreaking choices that I know have befallen so many families who haven't been able to conceive as they hoped that they would. Those who have had to turn to stressful and saddening rounds of IVF, sometimes which never resulted in a baby to love and to hold. And those friends of mine who have loved and lost children with a genetic disease they had no idea they were a carrier for, and no way to prepare or to respond to the world-shattering grief and pain that, that lay ahead for them, that lay ahead when they lost their child. If there was anything I could do to take that pain away, I would. And for the parents who carry the burden of possibly passing on the potential for this disease to befall their children, perhaps this is what this bill will ultimately achieve, hope, hope of taking that pain away. This is the hope that this bill offers. As a legislator, I can see the challenges and complexities that this bill presents to us for many different reasons and for very valid reasons for many people which go to very deeply held beliefs. But as a mother, as a sister, as a friend and in my good conscience, I choose to vote for the hope and I choose to vote for the progress that this bill has the power to bring. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak uh, to the Myochondrial Donation Law Reform Maves Law Bill 2021. Uh, I have um, Listen to colleagues across the benches and uh, heard much of the angst and pain that we know is associated with this um, 
particular uh, illness. And I've given this bill some deep consideration and I've read carefully the submissions of those who support it, those who have guarded reservations and those who have outright opposed it. And I am by no means an expert in any of the complexities uh, that arise in contemplation uh, of the uh, particular disease or of the methodologies or of the science that goes with this. And I have respect for all those of differing opinions and positions. That's why I suppose this is a conscience vote. And I have no right to examine the consciences of others or to interrogate their beliefs that are genuinely held. But in the end, I have decided I will vote for this bill and I am untroubled by that decision, but I feel I owe a short explanation as to why I arrived there. While I respect the views and conclusions of those who oppose the legislation, I must say from the outset that I do not support arguments that myochondrial donation would lead to dystopian scenarios like the development of designer babies. While I acknowledge their serious moral and ethical reservations, I can't accept the third party caution that opponents of this bill espouse. I prefer to accept the views of scientists as represented by the peak body, Science and Technology Australia, and their submission to the inquiry by the Community Affairs Legislation Committee they said that the concern that myochondrial donation would result in the three parent ch children is not founded in scientific fact. Placing the DNA of a mother's nucleus into a donor egg does not significantly change the genetic makeup of the child. But it does prevent myochondrial DNA defects from being inherited by the child, and that would have to be something wonderful. I am comforted by the extensive consultation and scientific reviews that have preceded this bill, and the proposal to stage its implementation by starting with clinical trials. I have canvassed the range of religious, philosophical, biotechnical or bioethical and forensic arguments about mitochondrial donation, and I've acknowledged the risk and uncertainties that attach to it. But I do have faith in the skill, integrity, and authenticity of the medical professions to manage those risks and uncertainties, not only in the best interest of their patients, but in the best interest of humanity. And I truly believe that any risk is ultimately outweighed by the benefits that myochondrial donations will deliver. In the end, my decision to support the bill is driven by very practical considerations and influenced by the practitioners who have treated and cared for those affected by the consequences of myochondrial diseases. And last night, as I wrestled with the pros and cons of some of these matters, a text from a very, very old friend who uh, dragged me away from being taken by the police as one of the stolen generations over 60 years ago, who, who had never bothered to contact me in politics, but asked for my support because of her dealings with this matter as a nurse and a health professional over many years. I'd already made my decision by that time, but I was supported in my own grapplings with this by the fact that someone I knew 
trusted and I knew had practical experience of these matters that I was in the in a right space. It is within the realms of medical science to, if it is in the realm of medical science to save a baby from disabling disease or death, which is a certain prognosis of this myochondrial disease, then I say it behoves us to embrace that science. But the practice of that science must be subject to strict regulatory oversight. I support the bill and I recommend it to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I apologise for being a little slow to arriving for my slot in the chamber. That's fine. Um, I rise to speak in support of this bill, which seeks to enable mitochondrial donation. And I don't intend to uh, detain the Senate for very long, but I did think it important to place the reasons for my support uh, briefly on the record. So more than once a week, a baby is born in our country with a truly debilitating form of this genetic disease. It robs the body's cells of energy, it causes multiple organ dysfunctional failure, and sometimes it causes death. Up to 30 children are born each week in Australia who are at risk of developing a mild or moderately disabling uh, version of this disease. It's very difficult to diagnose. There are currently very few effective treatments against mito. One of the features of the last few years in the pandemic is that so many of us in this place have had to confront illness and disease. Wherever individuals in this chamber have landed on this bill, I know that we all recognise the suffering endured by a parent who cares for a very sick child. Too many of us have had to have those conversations in recent years. Mitochondrial donation offers hope for a woman at risk of transmitting mitochondrial disease to her child, to her, and it also offers hope to her partner and to her broader family. It is unquestionably a remarkable moment in science. It's one which offers immense benefits to those amongst us who have suffered from this disease. As humans, we have been gifted with the capacity to build and extend our knowledge. And in our lifetimes, we have witnessed extraordinary developments in scientific capability. We have also been gifted with a capacity both for reflection and for foresight. Whilst I am not a person of faith, I am in the camp that often counsels caution about new technology. We should always consider the social and ethical consequences of adopting new technologies. And in this particular debate, I am grateful for the many people who have engaged deeply over many years in public discussion about the ethical characteristics of this technology and who have assisted in defining the regulatory safeguards and systems which are proposed in this bill. Because all new technologies present risks. And as humans, we have proven ourselves capable at times of using technology in the most disastrous of ways. Our only path, as I see it, though, is to avail ourselves of our immense capacity for ethical deliberation and for human empathy 
and to consider the ways that we might best use new technologies to serve our communities. My instinct is that this must be a profoundly democratic, deliberative process. In the end, as we have seen in example after example, it is rarely possible to shut the box on a new capability. Our only path is to work together to talk about how we might use a new capability and to make sure that we are collectively comfortable that it fits within our broader goals and our aspirations for ourselves as a community and as a people. One of the things that I think is the most, one of the, the strongest characteristics of the bill before us is its capacity to enable further discussion and debate about the application of this technology. It provides a legal framework to allow the continuation of research on mitochondrial donation and its application in a clinical environment. And it contains safeguards which define and constrain the application of the technology. As the EM explains, it introduces this technology in a staged and controlled manner with a two-stage implementation approach. This is intended to allow for the expansion of scientific evidence to ensure that the techniques are safe and effective and are undertaken in an ethically appropriate manner. And as I say, in its regulatory design, it specifically enables a continuing public conversation about the technology at hand. Ultimately, though, it is our technology that has the capacity to alleviate real suffering. It gives Australians with this disease the opportunity to raise a healthy family. It's on this basis that I will be supporting the bill. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak in support of the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform MAVES Bill 2021. A lot of what I will say I think has probably been said, but I did feel the need to put my voice to this um, because uh, I do support the bill and I do support um, the outcomes of what this bill will achieve for parents, for children. Um, and people in our community with mito mitochondrial um, disease. So today I don't speak on behalf of my whole party. I speak as an individual senator because this will be a matter debated and voted on as a conscience vote or a free vote, and we know that. We know our members of our part, the members of my party, will have a conscience vote on this matter. But I, again, as I said, I felt the need to put my voice on the record for this. It's a consistent way in which the Labor Party has treated issue issues around embryo research since 2002. So there are ma matters of conscience to do uh, around embryo research, around um, matters that uh, deal with um, abortion, which are free votes. Um, that decision is not made lightly, and I trust that I speak for my fellow Labor senators when I say I really appreciate the opportunity with which we are provided and the consistency of our party's approach on these matters. The bill is appropriately named Maeve's Law, after Maeve Hood, a young girl from Victoria with mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial disease is a debil debilitating genetic disorder that strips the body's cells of energy, causing multiple organ dysfunction or failure, and sometimes, quite often, death. It has no cure, with treatments currently available aiming to decrease the effects of the symptoms. At present, these treatments do not significantly change the course of the disease. And I think that's the reason why I support um, the passing of this bill, and I hope it does pass this parliament. 
Around one in 5,000 babies we know are born in Australia. That's more than one baby a week. Will develop a se severely disabling and likely terminal form of this disease. Most of these children will die within the first five years of their life. It's hard when you grapple with that. If you're a parent and you know that there may be an opportunity to save your baby, would you not put that forward? And I think that's the opportunity that we should make as legislators in giving that choice to those parents through the support of this bill going through the House here today. Mitochondrial disease is caused by a defect in the mitochondrial DNA of the baby, which is a type of DNA that is passed only through the mother. That is passed on through the egg cells rather than the sperm cells. Our mitochondria helps to translate the energy we consume to enable our bodies to operate effectively. Mitochondrial donation involves replacing the mother's mitochondria with mitochondria from a donor egg. Mitochondrial DNA does not influence a person's characteristics such as height, eye colour or their intelligence. All these characteristics are determined by the nuclear DNA which is not impacted at all by the donation process. We've heard today and through the many inquiries and reports that have brought us to this place, much about all of the technical and ethical issues that the bill raises. These issues are of concern for some members, and I appreciate those concerns, and I have considered them deeply. But I hope that today, in the vote that we will have in this place, that we will reach a point where we decide that this bill is about people. It is about people out there and, and attempting to save their children from a terrible disease. It is about babies. It's about very young children and their parents, grandparents and, of course, their wider families. It is about relieving suffering and giving children the opportunity to live a normal, healthy life and realise their full potential. My view is very much formed, informed by the knowledge that mitochondrial DNA is distinct from nuclear DNA, which makes up the overwhelming bulk, as much as 99.9 per cent of a person's DNA. It is this nuclear DNA which determines what we would understand to be a person's unique characteristics, their look, their personality. Mitochondrial DNA consists one, constitutes one thousandth of a person's DNA, and its basic function is to convert food and oxygen into energy. Sometimes some describe it as our battery pack whereas nuclear DNA goes to make up what we understand to be the unique characteristics of a human. I note that we as senators must grapple with the fact that this bill raises issues that must always be considered in relation to science and health care. These issues are as old as medical science itself, and we continually hear about looking at the science and the medical advice. How much should we intervene is a question. How far should we go? Is this a move towards designer babies? And I do understand that some members of my community hold ethical and faith-based beliefs which make consideration of this issue very difficult for them personally. Personally, I find comfort in the fact that this bill is consistent with the definition of embryo under the law in Australia. Both of the two main approaches to mitochondrial donation, pronuclear transfer and maternal spindle transfer, probably do not involve activity undertaken at the point of an embryo. I think everyone in this chamber recognises that this raises very sensitive issues. We are dealing with a disease that too often is fatal for very young members of our community 
causing enormous grief and real suffering to their families, their friends and their extended families. And we are dealing with some deeply held, serious ethical and faith-based beliefs. Mitochondrial disease is an incredibly serious genetic disorder, which, as I've stated, is often very is fat fatal for very, very young children. Energy demanding tissues such as brain and muscle are most commonly but not exclusively affected. In Australia, the incidence of mitochondrial DNA mutations is predicted to be at least one in 250 with several hundred families already diagnosed, although many carriers remain unidentified. Some families have multiple generations of affected individuals, often with devastating consequences. Their healthcare needs present enormous emotional, physical, social and financial burdens on families leading many couples to seek options to prevent disease transmission to their offspring. Currently, their choices include voluntary childlessness, adopt adoption, using eggs donated by unaffected women, or prenatal and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. I believe that this legislation, Maeve's bill, is well designed and well considered. Balancing the extraordinary potential emerging technologies, and we have a lot of them in this country and across the world, that we have to improve our medical practice and the quality of life for a number of Australian families, while recognising the ethical issues that are posed for many Australians and the need to tread carefully through this in a slow and staged process. It is clear that mitochondrial donation can significantly reduce the risk of maternally inherited mitochondrial disease transmission to children. For some families, it proves their only option is to have unaffected genetically related children. Here in Australia, we certainly have the clinical and the scientific expertise to introduce mitochondrial donation in a highly regulated environment. That is, if Maeve law, Maeve's law passes both houses of this parliament. And I know that there have been many contributions here over the last couple of days in this place that tell stories of some of our senators who have met with families, who have talked to families about what this means to them. I don't have any knowledge of those families, and I don't know the families. But what I know in my heart is that if my child was affected, or a child that I know, or in fact any child, I think that they have the right to make the decision, and therefore we should make the law that allows them to have that right to make the decision whether they go ahead with it or not. I believe that the cautious and staged approach overseen by a licensing committee is appropriate. It flows from deep consideration over several years. And I want to acknowledge here the work done by my fellow senators on the Community Affairs Legislation Committee for the inquiry and the report that they produced into the matter in August 2021. There is a long way to go in developing the protocols the techniques and the understanding of this research, but it does provide real hope to many families across Australia, those families that we know have these children with, these, with this disease. I've already indicated at the start that I will be voting in favour of this bill, recognising that these issues are not easy for many members of our community. I am convinced this legislation is worthy of our support and that ultimately it will lead through a careful and staged approach to a reduction in suffering and disease to children and families who have the freedom to realise their potential and make the fullest contribution to our society and the world. And that's something that I think we all want for not only our own children 
but to children in general. We want them to have the fullest potential that they can have. In my work as a senator and in my personal life, I know I've known and provided what support I could to many families dealing with the agony of witnessing the suffering and death of a child through various chronic or genetic illnesses. As I said, I don't know a family with mitochondrial, but I do know of other families that, that have um, children who have either died or are suffering through chronic and genetic illnesses. And I think the opportunity for us to be able to provide the mechanism for those families to make a choice about making that better for their children is something that we should not hold back on and we should allow this bill to pass. Witnessing that same suffering, the deep grief, the same gaping hole in the life of a family and the community when a life is lost. I firmly believe that it is our job as leaders in our community to do whatever that we can ethically do to reduce that pain and suffering and to limit that terrible loss that parents uh, and families have at the loss of a child. And I will definitely be supporting this bill. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator. Ring the bells. I'm going to take this some memo. Sorry, my face. Quorum has been achieved. Senator Farrell. Mr Acting uh, Deputy uh, President, and uh, I rise to uh, speak on this, uh, on this bill. Excuse my voice. I had COVID uh, over Christmas, and uh, while I've fully recovered, <coughs> um, for some reason my voice uh, hasn't got back to its usual uh, force, <coughs> and uh, I apologise if I'm Yes, well, look, I'm, 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 I'm sure you will, uh, Senator uh, Sir Georgia. And um, so, um, like all um, issues where we get a conscience vote in this chamber, um, they are extremely difficult issues. And uh, I very much appreciate the fact that uh, my party um, has a generous view. Um, when it comes to the issue of, of, uh, of conscience votes, and uh, we get an opportunity to, <coughs> where, where, particularly where there are issues of, of life and death, uh, but more generally, uh, that there are opportunities for people in the same political party to accept the proposition that um, there are people with different points of view, and you get a chance not only to express um, those, those different points of view, um, but you also get an opportunity to vote uh, in accordance with what your uh, conscience is, uh, is telling you on a particular issue. And uh, <clears throat> in the time uh, that I've been here, 
uh, there have been a number of these, uh, number of these issues. Um, <clears throat> there was the issue of uh, euthanasia uh, as it related to uh, the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory. Um, that was um, a very divisive uh, debate, I have to, uh, have to say. Uh, but again, it was an opportunity to um, express, uh, express a point of view based on uh, my, own, uh, my own personal beliefs. I've also had the issue of uh, same-sex marriage while I've been here. And again, <clears throat> um, those issues have been uh, issues of, uh, of great import. Uh, and again, I welcome the fact that my, my political party uh, has given me the opportunity to exercise my conscience when it comes to those, uh, those issues. <coughs> now, the issue of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, that relates to this uh, bill, respect of uh, the, um, the disease of uh, mitochondrial, um, again, raises uh, significant uh, and deep issues for our community to give consideration to. And I'm aware that uh, when this uh, bill was uh, debated in the, in the lower house, um, there was majority uh, support for it. And uh, it now comes to the, uh, the Senate for a, uh, a final uh, determination of, uh, of, of the issue. Um, I've tried to reach out to uh, both sides of the uh, debate and uh, talk to those, uh, those people in those communities um, uh, which have an interest uh, in, this, uh, in this issue to try and inform myself to the best uh, of my ability as to um, what the issues are, what the concerns of the people on each side of the, uh, of the debate um, to try and speak to them directly and to try and get a sense of, uh, of what it is that they are seeking to do by either um, supporting uh, this legislation and, uh, and passing it um, or um, opposing uh, the legislation. Um, and I have to say <coughs> um, you have great sympathy for um, parents of, uh, of children who um, have this uh, condition and uh, great empathy for the situation uh, in which they, uh, they find themselves um, uh, dealing with, uh, with children uh, with, this, uh, with this condition. Um, and uh, I guess from their point of view it's, it's very heartbreaking <coughs> um, to see the circumstances in which their children um, find themselves. Um, but um, there are other considerations, I think, uh, that uh, other people um, have raised um, where um, there are fundamental issues uh, of, life, um, of, of life and life and death uh, that, need to be, uh, that need to be taken into, uh, into account. Um, and uh, those people have, have raised issues um, <clears throat> about um, changing um, the DNA of, uh, of individuals and the, uh, the long-term effects and, <clears throat> in a sense, the unknown effects of um, changing that uh, uh, DNA uh, might have uh, on, the, on the community. And, uh, one of the points that has, has been influential in, in my thinking is um, discuss, discussing it with an ethicist in South Australia who's uh, familiar with these issues and has uh, spent a lifetime um, dealing with uh, serious, uh, these serious issues, um, <clears throat> is that we, in this process, um, not only do we change the DNA for one generation, we change the DNA for all future generations. So this is an issue not just about um, the effect on, on one individual, this is an issue about uh, what effect it's going to have on 
uh, future future generations. And so you've got this these two issues um, competing. You've got the issue, um, uh, you know, of, of what do you do, you know, with with parents who find themselves in in these very difficult uh, very difficult set of circumstances. But on the other hand, there are broader uh, issues for the community to consider about the long-term effects of, uh, of giving approval to uh, legislation uh, that um, uh, um, that can affect people not just for one generation but for all future generations. And uh, so I've tried to balance out these um, concerns. Um, noting obviously uh, that it's an extremely difficult uh, issue and I've, I've listened or tried to listen carefully to the contributions of, uh, of other people both in favour of the, uh, <coughs> of the issues uh, of the legislation and those who um, uh, are of a different, uh, different point of view. And um, um, I've finally come down uh, with the view that I um, I will oppose uh, this legislation, but um, obviously um, um, want to make it clear to those people who have a different point of view that I've tried to think as deeply as I can about the issues that um, arise uh, from voting for or against the legislation <coughs> and to make it clear to those uh, groups um, that I've put sort of deep thought into the way in which I'm going to exercise my my vote. Now, I am aware that uh, there are some amendments um, to this uh, legislation, and I've had uh, been fortunate enough to speak with uh, Senator Deb O'Neill, who's um, uh, done a lot of work on uh, on this issue and has been involved um, from the uh, the start with uh, discussions about it. And uh, I understand she has uh, three. Amendments which uh, she is uh, proposing. I'm not sure if Senator Stilljohn is referring to those. Um, um, and uh, I understand they may get some support from our colleagues in the uh, in the Greens, which uh, would be a very good good thing. They are issues which I think the uh, the government, but more particularly the minister, uh, should have taken into account before he uh, brought this bill. Um, uh, one of the issues uh, relates, I think, to an important uh, issue um, of, uh, of civil liability in respect of these cases. And it, it does seem remarkable to me that in respect of a, a medical procedure where questions are still up in the air about uh, how successful these, um, these medical treatments might be. and. Um, all of the medical issues associated around them, uh, that we find ourselves in a situation where the government is proposing to um, uh, remove civil liabilities for um, the scientists who are conducting this, um, this treatment. And I, I, I have to say, I, I do find that very remarkable that um, what is essentially a government bill, I appreciate it, it's, um, you know, it's a conscience vote, but it is a government bill that's coming uh, before us, and we find ourselves in a situation where um, the government is proposing that um, scientists in this area have no... Um, oh, <coughs> um, look, I appreciate we've reached the, uh, the time, and I ask that... Um, be in continuance. I, I be in continuance. Thank you. Uh, Thank uh, you, Senator Deputy. Farrell. Uh, I shall now proceed to Senator... Senator's statements. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. Mr Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President, I rise to make a statement about the forthcoming election uh, and the attempts by some to try and heavily influence, if not buy, their way into some sort of power arrangement here in Canberra. Now, there has been a long tradition in Australia, like in many other countries, of wealthy people seeking to influence elections for their own benefit or for the benefit of vested interests. And this was a key theme uh, in the establishment of the uh, United States and their constitution 
And it has been a, a feature and a problem in our society. And when I think about the predecessor party of the Liberal Party, the United Australia Party, which I think bizarrely has re-emerged in some form in recent times, um, the people who were associated with that particular party made the point at the time that the UAP was deeply flawed because the people that were writing its policies were its key donors. Um, and of course, the, the constitutional obligation of all the members and senators in this place is to uh, perform their duties in respect of their constituents, not in respect of their, their donors or their key supporters. Now, uh, sadly, the emergence of the so-called Voices of groups uh, and one of the, the key groups, the Climate 200 Fund, uh, which is proposing to spend $20 million uh, to try and buy a few seats uh, in this place, um, has started to channel this UAP from the yesteryear. And the reason I say that is because they are proposing to fund candidates and they are proposing to uh, engage in this election uh, without providing, in many cases, the true disclosure of who their donors are. And uh, given their very threadbare policy agenda, uh, we will have to assume that beyond uh, the very legitimate issue of climate change, uh, that it is pretty much a blank canvas to be populated by their donors after the election if they are successful. Now, of course, the the Climate 200 and their associates are focusing only on a few type uh, of few uh, people, uh, predominantly uh, classical liberals in inner city areas, uh, and they are proposing to uh, tell people in these areas that there's only you know one or two issues uh, that face the federal government and the nation. Uh, and one of those, of course, is, is climate change which is a very legitimate and important issue and is something that we should do more on and we are doing more on. But the point is, uh, will the Voices Of group uh, be like the Labor Party in that the Labor Party is principally funded by the unions and by the super funds and as a result of that funding they get to write the policies of the Labor Party. The Labor Party's policies on industrial relations and superannuation are not written by people in this place they are written by the vested interests uh, down at Trades Hall or down at the super funds uh, billionaires building down in Melbourne. Uh, that is the reality, and uh, you only need to look at the evidence of their advocacy on super in the last few years to see that the, the Labor Party would rather deny workers of Australia uh, a pay increase uh, in order to give them a higher super contribution, uh, which is uh, rather remarkable. Now, um, that is where I think we're heading with this Climate 200. We're going to find these people, these invisible people, uh, that are going to be pulling the, the strings. Now, if you want to come into public life, you've got to be prepared to take a few hits. Uh, that's, that's how it goes. And uh, we, are, we all are prepared, I think, to take the hits uh, when we stand up in this place. Now, there are people, uh, like Mr Holmes of Court, uh, that want to you know, fund candidates, they want to get involved in all sorts of murky court cases, uh, and uh, that's not how the system can work. Because uh, these people, uh, Mr Holmes of Court and Mr Stendhal and Mr Poulton and Mr Yates, have been involved in a disgraceful attempt, which I first addressed back in the, uh, September of 2019 in this place in their attempt to uh, bring about uh, a citizenship challenge against the Treasurer. Uh, now, probably one of the most disgraceful things that's happened in public life in my lifetime to suggest that um, a family that had their citizenship cancelled by Nazi Germany um, should, should be dragged through the courts effectively to prove um, that their citizenship wasn't cancelled by Nazi Germany. Um, and Mr Holmes Court and Mr Poulton and Mr Steindl and Mr Yates, uh, I mean, of course a number of whom are actually um, Holocaust deniers, um, have been involved in this disgraceful 
performance that we've recently, recently seen conclude. Now, um, you know, Mr Stendhal, he's been asked to cough up 400 grand and he says he doesn't want to pay it. He doesn't want to pay it, so that's good. Um, and he said that he undertook this dual citizenship challenge because I felt betrayed by my representative. He felt betrayed by his representative whose family escaped from Nazi Germany. And he goes on to say that he would like to see the government look upon this and assume pay for it, uh, just as any other dual citizenship challenge. I mean, as if this was just any other dual citizenship challenge. This was about an anti-Semitic case brought forward against a family that has escaped Nazi Germany um, and has gone on to produce Australia's first Jewish treasurer. An absolute outrage, and so, I mean, this this is not just my assessment. I mean, the the full bench of the uh, the federal court, uh, sitting as a court of disputed returns, was unanimous, and they made pointed reference to the backdrop of the catastrophe, the anti-Jewish violence and terror, and noted that the niceties of proof of the production or issue of documents can be put aside when one recognises the realities of 1949. Now, the big risk for all of us is that we forget things like the Holocaust, and that is why the work that has been done to ensure that these things aren't forgotten is some of the most important work. Um, and so I think it is very regrettable that someone who is wanting to pull the strings uh, in the next parliament at some level Mr Holmes at court, uh, has been involved with this outrage. Uh, and it says in the Fin Review back on the 20th of Feb 2020 that um, who was sitting in the court of disputed returns when this disgraceful challenge by Mr Stainer was brought against the Treasurer's ability or eligibility to sit in the parliament? Mr Simon Holmes at court, the founder of Climate 200. So, uh, you know, you've got to ask yourself, um, why would he be doing this? I mean, why would he be playing games uh, with Holocaust deniers and weirdos? Uh, and if he's prepared to do that, uh, then what sort of uh, weird and disgraceful behaviour uh, might we see in the next parliament uh, if people like this uh, are allowed to uh, purchase uh, or endeavour to purchase seats in the next parliament with threadbare agendas uh, and uh, wads of cash. So it is, it is part of the game. If you want to be in public life uh, and you want to try and influence the direction of the country, uh, then people will uh, rightly look at your record. Uh, and this person's record is disgraceful. Anyone who's been involved with this challenge which is based on anti-Semitism. The people that are involved with this challenge are not run-of-the-mill average citizens. They, they have been engaged in Holocaust denials. They have been writing books about it. These are disgraceful people. Uh, and uh, Mr Holmes at court wants to associate with them. So uh, you know, I hope that fair-minded people consider all these facts and consider the people that are standing behind these murky bodies uh, when they cast their ballot later this year in the election. Thank you very much. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. South Australians are emerging from what has been a really tough, a really tough summer. For many, the change in the environment in South Australia when borders opened and COVID entered our state has been either personally catastrophic or caused tremendous challenges for themselves, for their work, for their families, for their businesses. It has been a really difficult summer. And it's been made worse by a Prime Minister who once again has failed South Australians in the way he's responded to the pandemic, in the way he's responded to the changes before us 
like the changes in this variant, and whether it's been his failure to secure enough rapid antigen tests for Australian workers so they can get back to work for families, whether it's failure to get jabs in the arms of kids returning to the classroom for teachers who weren't yet eligible for boosters but needed them to get back to work, to do their work safely, or is government's shocking failure to respond adequately to the crisis in our aged care homes across the country? South Australians, on all of these fronts, feel deeply let down by the Prime Minister. They feel deeply let down by his government. And I don't blame them. It's been a really tough few years, a really tough few years compounded by a really tough summer. And every time they're looking to their Prime Minister to lead, he's not there. He's not holding a hose. He's not getting on with the job of the vaccine rollout. He's not building quarantine. He's not securing the rats. He's not supporting the early childhood workforce who are on the front line of this pandemic, but seemingly invisible to the government for so long. Not taking the steps required to fix a crisis of aged care. In fact, his government getting caught up in word games whilst people are dying. South Australians feel failed. They feel let down by this Prime Minister. They're questioning his character. They're questioning his ability to stand up for them when they need him. They're questioning his relationship with the truth. They're questioning whether when they need their government to step in, whether they'll be there. Because on every measure this summer and the years before, they haven't. But beyond these issues, beyond these acute issues, these issues of urgency, there are further failures less seen, less talked about, less spoken about. And I want to use my time today to talk about the impact of the Morrison government's failures on the higher education and further education sector in my home state of South Australia, a sector which feels abandoned by the Morrison government. Now, my state is home to three world-class universities and eight TAFE campuses. There are hundreds of thousands of South Australian men and women, young and old, with talent and potential to develop, but who are being let down by a government which is meant to stand for them, meant to stand for their opportunity, for their aspiration. Now, our universities in South Australia educate around 90,000 students, and when it comes to TAFE, more than one million students have learned valuable skills and experience at TAFEs in South Australia since these facilities were established in 1971. And we know in South Australia that higher education is vital to our economic future. We know this because it has been crucial to our success economically as a state. And we know, according to Universities Australia, that university research has added $10 billion to Australia's GDP each year for the last 30 years—$10 billion. And it's not just big universities in our cities we are talking about. It's our regional economies too. And we know universities contribute $2 billion a year to these economies. So they support over 14,000 regional jobs and, before COVID, 120,000 direct full-time jobs nationwide, while supporting a broader 40,000 in the wider economy. Our higher education institutions in South Australia, before COVID, brought in an estimated 10,000 international students each year, with an economic value of $2 billion in 2019. Students who were fundamentally and horrifically let down by the government when the pandemic struck. Students who lined up for food students who relied on our charity sector to support them. Now, we also have university research to thank, of course, for the speedy development of what we know are truly life-saving vaccines that we have come to rely on during this pandemic. We have them to thank for crucial social and cultural ties that bind international students with local students, that build relationships and connections, which have meaning not just to the individuals involved, but to whole communities, whole cities, to our nation. 
Of course, higher education is more than university. I've spoken about that in this chamber several times before. As important as universities are, it's not the be-all and end-all aspiration for all South Australians. Further education presents incredible opportunities. Further education, like TAFE, like vocational training. But on these fronts, the government has let young South Australians down too. TAFE has a critical role to play in advancing the aspirations of many young people in my state. Indeed, any older pe many older people in my state looking to retrain, to reskill, to be ready to adapt flexibly to the jobs of the future as the labour market changes, as opportunity changes. But this government has allowed the pandemic to wreak havoc on our education sector. Rather than supporting them throughout this pandemic, they have been systematically trashing it, as they have done for years. They let their ideology about higher education drive their policy response. It's an ideology they should have left at the door many years ago, but especially during this pandemic, when this sector has been crying out for help. When our economy in South Australia, which has so much to gain from a strong higher education sector, has been crying out for help. The Prime Minister has turned his back on higher education. And when you turn your back on higher education, you don't just turn your back on the researchers within it, on the breakthroughs they could make, on the staff working with it, but you turn your back on the future aspiration of a generation of people for whom that's their ticket to something different, for whom that's their ticket to what they aspire to. How many breakthroughs lost, how many careers lost when you stop our young people furthering their dreams, furthering their education, be it in a university or be it in a TAFE. The government has trashed this sector. They left them high and dry when it came to the wage subsidies. Indeed, in my time in this place, I introduced legislation which had the effect of increasing the cost of university for students, of taking away that opportunity. And these failures of the university sector and of the, of the people who seek this opportunity and this expansion of their own potential come at a time when, for young Australians particularly, opportunities are looking pretty bleak. Young people have been hit by this pandemic disproportionately to other groups in our community, whether it's being forced to drain their super to get by, whether it's their disproportionate involvement in casual and insecure work which has left them incredibly vulnerable during this pandemic. Whether it's other aspects of their dreams or their coming of age which has been affected, their year 12 studies, their opportunities, opportunities that we had. And then when you compound an ideological attack on the institutions which offer them that next opportunity, that next step to deliver on their aspiration, well, what an incredible failure of a whole generation of people. And what an incredible failure of all of those people in our community who want to be ready for a changing economy, for the opportunities of a renewable energy revolution, for, for opportunities like micro-credentialing of the skill sets they need to upgrade or adapt, of nurses wanting to change their qualifications so they can get on the front line of this pandemic to up their skills, to re-enter the workforce, to come back from retirement. These are the institutions which help deliver it. They help deliver the research which keeps us safe from things like global pandemics. They provide an incredible economic opportunity in my state especially. They forge these cultural ties. They are the ticket to better aspiration for so many people. And this government, this Prime Minister, has failed them. And in doing so, he's failed my state. He's failed our opportunities in South Australia. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Morrison government fails at everything it does. And protecting the human rights of imprisoned or detained people is another thing to add to their long list of failures. This country is not complying with our international obligations with the optional protocol on the Convention Against Torture, or OPCAT for short. On 21st of December 2017, the Liberal government ratified OPCAT because of the Royal Commission into the Don Dale Children's Prison in the Northern Territory. By ratifying OPCAT, we gave a commitment to the world 
that we would be bound by the treaty to prevent torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. 20th of January 2022 was the deadline for this country to fully implement its OPCAT commitments and incorporate the terms of the treaty into the laws, policies and practice of this country. And of course, again, the Morrison government failed. They had four years to act and failed. The core obligation this country has in ratifying OPCAT is to establish what's called a national preventive, preventative mechanism, or an NPM. The NPM is a system of regular visits to places of detention by an independent body that investigates any breaches of the human rights of imprisoned people. Ratification also requires this country to allow the United Nations Committee for the Prevention Against Torture to also visit places of detention and inspect them to prevent abuses. When we ratified OPCAT, this government invoked Article 24 of the Convention which allowed them to postpone their obligations to establish an NPM until January 2022. They argued that postponing the implementation of OPCAT to January 2022 was needed to negotiate with the states and territories. This government never gave a clear public indication of how it was going to meet the January 2022 deadline, and it wasn't because we didn't try to get answers. I've raised these issues in estimates. The Australian OPCAT network has also been on the case. The Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service and a number of academics have also been trying to get an answer from this government about how OPCAT was going to be implemented. And all we got were slogans and nonsense. The Australian Human Rights Commission, the United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture and particularly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services have made it clear that the Commonwealth Government needs to fully implement OPCAT through federal legislation and more public funding. Every state and territory has the responsibility to enact an MPM to oversee police and prison cells, police cars and other closed institutions within their state and territory. To do this, they need national leadership and public funding. It's as simple as that. But of course, this government has done nothing. Both Victoria and New South Wales have said that the reason why they haven't acted faster on OPCAT is because the Commonwealth hasn't provided any leadership or any money. The Attorney General's own department has acknowledged publicly that the full, culturally safe implementation of OPCAT would achieve justice targets 10 and 11 of the Closing the Gap agreement. Closing the gap, remember? Wave the closing the gap flag, but uh, let's forget about any torture or, or getting rid of any torturous behaviours within closing the gap targets. We wouldn't want to stop the torture. These targets in closing the gap are meant to reduce how many First Nations people are held in adult and children's jails. But of course, you've done nothing. And you know there's over 500 Aboriginal deaths in custody since the Royal Commission. We still have no answers from this government. We still have no one accountable. 
and we still don't have a system to prevent torture and abuse in prisons. We allow it. <sighs> in 2017, both the National Children's Commissioner and the Attorney General acknowledged that if a fully implemented OPCAT system had been in place, the horrific treatment uncovered at Dondale would likely not have ever happened. In 2018, the Prime Minister announced the Aged Care Royal Commission. He reflected on the, clo on the closing of the Oakden facility in South Australia as the catalyst for the inquiry. He continued, adding that chief psychiatrist Dr Aaron Grove said OPCAT inspections could have prevented Oakden mistreatment. What do you know? And we all know how much this government prioritises aged care. It is absolutely unbelievable that I'm standing here today asking, in fact, I'm begging for this government to do the right thing and end torture. Just end torture in this country. End the mistreatment that goes on in these prisons and other places of detention. How is it that we have to beg the government to stamp out torture? Please, please stop torturing people in this country. Please. This government doesn't care about us. It does not care about you. That's why they have to go. Implementing OPCAT, OPCAT is about protecting people, all people. OPCAT is about protecting people whose equal worth, rights and dignity are being challenged or denied. Implementing OPCAT is also about giving people who see these injustices the tools to get together and fight them. The full implementation of OPCAT would provide all of us, young and old, rich and poor, the tools to demand we are treated as equals in our society, particularly in closed settings like prisons, where abuse and torture flourishes when there is no oversight. And while this country signed on to the international agreement to prevent torture in 2009, it wasn't until the disgrace of Dondale that this country ratified it in December 2017. Fast forward to 2022 and this government is still denying imprisoned and detained people their full dignity, respect and justice. That is why they have to go. The Greens, in balance of power, would make sure that a future Labor government would live up to our international obligations under OPCAT. The Greens would make sure that public funding is secured for the full, culturally safe implementation of OPCAT. We would also establish a countrywide police ombudsman system. The police ombudsman would be a fully independent and impartial body to handle complaints about the conduct of police officers and take appropriate action. Now, is that not too much to ask? Please end torture, please. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, over the past year, there's been a lot of significant discussion and debate around women, how women are treated, how they're paid, educated, how we better equip them when it comes to consent, accepting appropriate behaviour and rejecting what's not. There's been recent discussions about love bombing and the dangers that come with that, how to see red flags, how to be confident in dealing with them and how to walk away from destructive and dangerous situations. However, when you think about all the work that's been done and the discussion, for far too long this discussion has been accompanied by an intellectually bereft and insulting discussion that somehow 
Labour good, Liberal bad. That Liberal women are somehow just here to make up the numbers. Or as I've recently been told, I'm just making the sandwiches for the Morrison boys. And my Conservative colleagues, in particular Senator Hume and Senator Henderson, we are nothing but crumb maidens, a term that I actually had to look up and is deeply misogynistic, and it is used by both men and women of the left to attack conservative women. So today I thought it was an important day to set the record straight. So I'm going to let you know who has actually invested in women's health, safety and security, and who talks a big game but has never, ever walked the walk. So for those of you interested in facts, not smears, not political point scoring, not self-promotion, I would urge you to watch this speech today and not ones that are soaking in personal animosity. So I'll start by acknowledging that Labor did put in place the first action plan of the current national plan with an investment of $86 million. And whilst those on the left will cheer this investment and claim that Labor is committed to this issue, in reality, this paltry amount pales in comparison, pales to the $3.4 billion in the Women's Budget Statement 2021-22. That's right, $86 million from Labor to $3.4 billion from the Coalition. But the Morrison government's not only putting real money where its mouth is. For the first time in parliamentary history, this government is demonstrating leadership and action in our commitment to improving the lives of Australian women, with four ministers now in this space. We acknowledge that a minister for women is simply just not enough. So the Prime Minister has appointed additional ministers, a minister for women's safety, a minister for women's economic security and an assistant minister for women. And we acknowledge that too many people, and particularly women in this country, experience domestic violence. And we lose too many women each and every week at the hands of their partner. And whilst those opposite like to talk a big game, what we do know is they've got absolutely no policy ideas and have committed no funding whatsoever to prevention in this area. So on this side of the chamber, we know that providing support to women and their children who experience domestic violence, and I'm going to go through some of these things later on, but we know what's actually more important is changing the culture, changing the conversation. So domestic violence and violence against women doesn't occur in the first place. The success of our Stop It At The Start campaign is changing not only attitudes but lives. More than $50 million has been spent on changing attitudes around respect, a campaign that is recognised by three in five adults, encouraging more respectful relationships. These campaigns are working, and in anyone's mind, three out of five adults, 60 per cent recognition of a campaign is success. And we know <coughs> excuse me, that by changing attitudes, we change lives and we change the violence towards women before it even begins. But we know that there's lots more to do, and that's why we're determined to continue to deliver, deliver for Australian women and their families. So I want to go through a couple of programs, and I may have to actually come back for adjournment, because I think once you start to go through them, you'll see how many programs we have actually put together and funded and initiated to support women across a vast range of areas. So we have the next national plan to end violence against women, and as I said, $3.4 billion in the last budget statement. We have a new national partnership agreement, which is up to $260 million to bolster frontline family and domestic and sexual violence services. We have an escaping violence payment of almost $165 million to help women who need to leave a violent relationship. We have funded a 24-7 hotline in 1800 Respect. We've provided 780 safe places for women and children to seek safety when they're leaving a domestic violence service, uh, situation. We have frontline services with $130 million to provide that urgent assistance to state and territories when they need assistance in stepping up. 
We have over $400 million allocated to legal services to help women get out of these relationships. The roadmap for respect, obviously stop it at the start, but there is more than $64 additional million dollars going into the government's roadmap, which is about preventing sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. We want the Respect at Work report and the recommendations in there to how we create safer workplaces for everybody. We have another action plan with $340 million that will help to reduce violence against women and children. But we're also focused on the economic security because we know a lot of women can't leave because of the economic constraints that are put on them by a partner and that form of abuse. And that statement around economic security is $1.9 billion. This is real money. Again, $86 million the Labor Party put in, $86 million. For economic security, $1.9 billion, something that no one opposite has ever considered to be an issue. But I guess when you're just getting paid by the unions, you don't have to think about how real women need funding and support to get out of destructive relationships. So we have childcare subsidies that we've boosted to assure women can look after their children when they have to get out of these relationships. We have boosting female founders, which ensures women that have an entrepreneurial spirit are able to access that and get support. We have National Careers Institute partnership with over $12 million. We have an early stage social enterprise foundation, $13.9 million. We have a career revive program because we know women take career breaks when they have children. Sometimes they need a bit of assistance to re-enter the workforce. We've also assisted with mediation so that they can help get help when it needs to come to distributing property between divorcing or separating partners. We have a superannuation guarantee threshold. We've removed the $400 per month threshold so that employees don't have to pay the superannuation guarantee. We have a family home guarantee, and I, this is actually one of my favourite initiatives, that allows single mothers to purchase a home with just 2 per cent deposit. The government will guarantee the rest. We know home ownership is one of the safest ways to ensure that this increasing rate of homelessness in women over 50 doesn't continue. And so we are committed to ensuring as many women as possible, and particularly single mothers, get that support to get back into the housing market. We have economic security statements and reporting frameworks, all based around supporting women. We have leadership and development programs. We have academies for enterprising girls, National Women's Alliance, to help create policy that supports women into the future. There's also Indigenous Girls Academies, and we're boosting the next generation of women by supporting them into STEM. Girls are continuing to exceed and excel in the, industry, in the environment of STEM, and we are providing up to 500 industry-based co-funded university scholarships, but not only for girls that are finishing school, for women who are looking to retrain and re-enter the workforce. We've got women in sport. We've put $12 million to Football Australia for women in sport. We're significantly working on lowering the gender pay gap. We've addressed gender balance on Australian boards. And Coalition of Women in Parliament, we have eight women hold, cabinet, uh, eight women hold 33 per cent of cabinet positions. This is actually the highest number of women in cabinet ever. So ever. So all of this that we hear, somehow the Morrison government, bad for women, you guys just don't get it. And I'm a little bit over it because on top of that, we are investing in so much on health. And again, I said, I'm going to have to probably come back at adjournment because I cannot possibly go through every initiative that Minister Hunt has funded. But I do want to give him a particular shout out today for the $2 million that's now gone to ovarian cancer today as we acknowledge Ovarian Cancer Month, a cancer that is insidious, that takes far too many women and is almost impossible to detect until it's too late. This is real money, real investment, real support for women. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, it's stating the obvious to note that COVID-19 has upended our lives in ways that we never, ever dreamed possible. The wearing of masks, lockdowns and border closures have ensured that lives have been saved, but um, they have fundamentally changed the way we act, and we struggle with that. It's a containment of the way we've come to know how we live. But when we think of the struggles we have as adults here with considerable agency senators in a parliament, no one 
has been more impacted, if you think about the comparison, than the changes that have happened for school-age children. The United Nations Secretary-General observed that around 1.6 billion students have had their studies interrupted by the pandemic, and that over 100 million additional children will fall below the minimum proficiency level in reading. And we could have a conference to discuss what the social and economic impacts of that will be. We could be here for days talking about that and planning a response to it. But let, let's just for a moment allow the scale of that interruption to 100 million children and 1.6 billion who've been interrupted in their learning. Let's just let that sink in. It's an enormous number of young people with a profound and compounding impact on the future for those individuals and our shared socio-economic future on this planet we call home. The World Economic Forum has warned that today's students risk losing $17 trillion in earnings because of these disruptions. Inequalities in access to remote learning and at-home support are driving these diminishing outcomes. The continuing onslaught of new variants of COVID-19 are disrupting the forward planning capacity of schools, local governments and parents who are desperate for some stability to plan ahead for their children. UNESCO figures show that schools in countries such as Brazil, India, Bolivia and here in the Asia-Pacific region with our neighbour Indonesia, these, community, these countries in the context in which they're existing and, and managing COVID has seen them uh, being forced to close for over 75 weeks, 75 weeks in total since the pandemic began with kids not going to schools. Learning poverty, the World Bank reports, has risen 20 per cent in low to middle income countries to a staggering 70 per cent. And that means that over two thirds of 10 year olds in these countries are unable to read a basic text. Now these stark figures are only getting worse as the COVID crisis continues. COVID is also exacerbating already existing fault lines in global education. Girls, those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, those in rural and remote areas are falling further and further behind, erasing hard-fought success that took decades. In just a few years, we've lost so much. Fears exist, and sadly they are being realised that those who have fallen out of school will not return. They have left school never to return, not by choice, not to their advantage, but because of COVID and the crisis that it has engendered. Remote learning is an option for some. Zoom is impossible, though, for millions of children who live without access to internet or electricity. Many parents would be reticent to send their children into crowded schools where vaccination rates in some countries remain below 15 per cent. The figures we are talking about here are truly alarming. To that end, Australia must take our place as an international citizen and participant. We need to support health efforts to ensure that students are able to access education in a safe and accessible manner. Greater support for remote learning must be provided, rapid antigen tests, provision of masks, vaccinations. All these things will help children access the education that they so desperately need without which uh, poses considerable risk to their lives. Governments, especially those with more wealth and more resources and less of a COVID burden, must do more than attend to their own nation. And as an Australian, 
I know that we have a vital role to play in our region to support the health, the well-being and the education of young people in schools in this part of the world. Certainly we have our own concerns about our own families, our businesses, our jobs, the way we are perceived and considered, our community, our health. Sometimes they overwhelm us, these everyday concerns and these immediate concerns that sit with us. And it's essential to address these challenges, but it's not enough. Governments must not stop there. We have international responsibilities. Australia can step up to help other countries, and we do. We have and we will continue to do so under governments of every colour. Most recently, the Global Partnership for Education Replenishment is one important way that Australia has stepped up to the plate. But other multilateral aid efforts must also be undertaken to ensure that the global divides are not widened by the pandemic. My fellow senators and members of the House of Parliament who have become members with me uh, as the Australian parliamentary chapter of the International Partnership and Network for Education uh, have done fantastic work already, lobbying Maurice Payne, our foreign minister, to make a commitment to the Global Education Fund on behalf of the Australian nation. And with the efforts of senators from the La Liberal National Party who are in government, my fellow Labor senators, senators of the Greens Party that you represent, uh, Acting Deputy President, and independents, we have helped make the government firm in its commitment. But the problem is of such a scale that we cannot look away. We cannot resile from further action. Preparation for future waves and the strengthening of existing health education infrastructure has to be put in place. Vaccine discrimination must end. And we must start sharing the technology that works with our neighbours and friends across the world so that no child is left behind. Wave after wave of the COVID virus threat is likely if we do not acknowledge the simple reality that the virus knows no sovereign boundaries. We've got to sort this out together at a global level. Every country has a stake in this. And all adults are responsible for the lives of the young. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 4 is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Despite disruptions, despite waves of disease and disenchantment, we must always be focused on the future embodied by our children. All of our children, everywhere. It takes political will to give kids a chance so that we might all benefit. International day of education was on the 24th of January. It was a chance at that time, and that's why I'm taking this opportunity today, Deputy President, to put it on the record. The examination of our own policies and how our aid, how our investment in other countries in our region might have the best possible impact. There's currently a clash of ideas globally regarding whether liberty or freedom of expression is the best model for human development and whether we need to go down a path of more repression, less expression and more autocracy. But if we don't allow all those young boys and girls who need education to reach their full potential, to enable them to open their minds through the wonder of learning and explore the universe in their own terms, humanity will never enter a new age, a better age. It does take the right teacher, the right classroom, the right tools. Teachers transform lives. That's why we invest in public education. It is a national asset and it is a right for children. I thank my colleagues in the International Parliamentary Network for Education here and around the world. Everywhere, we must work together to get closer to the Senator SDG 4 to improve the life of billions. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I speak as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia. It's now seven months since I delivered a speech reminding senators and people listening at home of the significance of our flag, a flag that flies proudly above our parliament on a strong support that stands equally above the Senate and the House of Representatives, reminding all of us in both chambers we serve the people.
We do not serve large banking corporations, globalist banking corporations. We do not serve trade union bosses, who are often a business of their own these days, devoid of relevance to union members. And we certainly do not serve large multinational foreign pharmaceutical companies. For seven months, I've been ending my speeches with the reminder that we have one flag, we are one community, and we are one nation. In this time now of great division in our beautiful country, it's becoming harder and harder to live up to the principle that we are one nation. We must, must put aside division and accept competing viewpoints. On Monday, I went outside to address a group of everyday Australians who've come to Canberra to protest the policies of this parliament. They quite rightly expected to be able to speak to their elected representatives to share their concerns. And so I did my job and I spoke with them. The results were, to be honest, mixed. I heard many different opinions and I saw many different flags. It's obvious to me that there are some, a very, very small minority, who are misleading and inflaming opinion to gain power for themselves. One Nation will continue to take positions that are based on facts and data, not fabricated, false internet myths. If those of us who oppose tyranny are unable to unite among ourselves, how can we win public opinion? And win we must. Mr. Pres Madam Acting Deputy President, 200 years ago, a judge by the name of Lord Woodhouse Lee made an astute observation. I'll quote, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the majority discovers it can vote large, itself largesse out of the public treasury. After that, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits with the result that democracy collapses because loose fiscal policy is always followed by dictatorship. For many years, that's the end of the quote, for many years I considered human nature acts out of self-interest, not just for oneself, but for those we love, our family and community, our species. Willingly imposing a dictatorship on those we love seemed contrary to human nature. Surely, I thought, there would be a point where the public would realise we are on a path to dictatorship and change direction. We're already being controlled. To change our direction, we must be unified. We must be tolerant and forgiving. Our future is not one for retribution, anger and hate. Our future must be unity, forgiveness, and I mean true forgiveness, love and strength. These are the qualities that create a community. Those assembled outside today have reached their point of awareness. The millions who've attended freedom rallies around Australia have reached their point of awareness. Sadly, this parliament has not. I've never been more nervous for the future of its beautiful country than I am right now. It's clear that we may be approaching the end days of democracy as predicted 200 years ago. Not from the peaceful, respectful, loving protesters, from this parliament and from state parliaments. We're witnessing the controlled demolition of not just our treasury and our democracy, but our community. We're on a path to a soft dictatorship for our own good. Nothing about this is for our own good. Our grandparents enjoyed abundance, freedom and personal sovereignty. These things do not feature in the conversation being advanced by this parliament. Husband has been turned against wife, parent against child, sibling against another. Our young are being seduced into a world of selfish hedonism that begets apathy towards family and, and community. Women are being erased, replaced with offensive language such as uterus owner and birthing parent, forced to compete against biological men to make clear their new debased status afforded them by the brave new world of globalist groupthink. This is evil. Government dependence is treated as a, as a right as though it was somehow noble to live off the hard work of others. We're being led into a world where the middle class no longer exists, only a financial elite and their nomenclatura, a pampered and privileged administrative class tasked with carrying out the instructions of the globalists, the elites. High-paid corporate and diplomatic thank-you jobs are clearly on offer to politicians who've expended their political capital to implement globalism. Meanwhile, Everyday Australians have no such escape. Life for so many, including those I met on Monday out front, means working harder and going backwards. During COVID, the world's richest billionaires have seen their wealth increase by $3 trillion, while the wealth of citizens has gone backward by that same amount. Robbery, 
stolen. COVID has represented the largest transfer of wealth in human history, nakedly. Everyday Australians have less, while billionaires have plenty more. This parliament is responsible for destroying the Australian economy, destroying small business, destroying lives and destroying hope. The media, major global pharmaceutical companies, globalist banks, political donors and health bureaucrats have the same owners. BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street Capital, amongst others. These funds invest the wealth of the world's richest crony capitalists and now control wealth equal to one-third of the world's gross domestic product—25 trillion United States dollars. In Australia, this wealth has been invested to create controlling interests in Australia's largest companies—retailers, banks, media and pharmaceutical companies. As a result, crony capitalists now control our country, and parliament and government serves their interests, doesn't serve the people. Under this parliament, a future awaits everyday Australians that's nothing more than 18th century feudalism with a public relations budget. What never gets mentioned is that democracy is not part of this so-called Great Reset. What awaits is something the UN calls stakeholder governance. Unelected, unrepresentative corporations and then nomenclature will decide how we live our lives. Parliament will be reduced to debating and passing resolutions that have no legal standing. And this is exactly how the European Parliament works right now. The EU Parliament is analogous to putting a plastic steering wheel on the back of the driver's seat of the family car so your children think they're driving. This is our future under the globalist philosophy that now dictates the actions of the Liberals, the Nationals, the Greens and Labor. We the people are not in control. We are deluded into feeling we're in control. When it comes to COVID, there's no sitting this one out. Recent events have made it clear everyday Australians do not have to be interested in politics for politics to be interested in them. During COVID, small businesses who carried on running their business the way they always have, serving their communities, not discriminating on the basis of race, religion or medical status, are, under COVID restrictions, COVID measures, being sent broke and their owners fined or worse, arrested. Politics came for them. Shortly, Australians must decide. Do you remain prisoners in your cities, states and now in quarantine camps? Do you remain prisoners of media-driven fear? Or do we forge a path of freedom born of personal responsibility and inclusion? Inclusion. It's ironic how that word has been reinvented to mean the majority accepting the viewpoint of a small and noisy minority as a device to move society further and further and further towards a single worldview. Senator Chisholm from the Labor Party moved a motion in support of doing exactly that only yesterday. With his matter of urgency, Senator Chisholm was kind enough to show us where Labor, the once proud ALP, would take Australia. For public order, the senator said, dissent must be suppressed. The worldview which our parliament now advances has the fundamental assumption that people cannot be trusted to behave in the best interest of their community and so must be treated as convicts, not as citizens. Robbed of free choice, and implicit in that, robbed of freedom itself. Freedom is now written in, every, in inverted commas by our media, who are promoting an agenda of hatred and division on behalf of their billionaire owners. The ABC are compliant because totalitarianism excites the political left. Tyranny and socialism go together like the words rare and side effects. Inseparable, relentless, evil. Christmas and Easter, Australia Day and Anzac Day, and let's not forget Father's Day, had to be extinguished because they offer a chance to renew the bonds that unite us as a family, as a community and as a nation. The time for people to trust the government is over. It's now time for the government to trust the people. This, the People's House of Parliament, must stand in defence of values that forge this country. The war on family, on community and Christianity must end in this sitting, for we will be convicts no more. We have one flag, we are one community and we are one nation. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on a matter that is of urgent geopolitical concern to Australia and should be to all Australians. The current build-up of over 100,000 troops along the Ukrainian border is the biggest concentration of firepower in Eastern Europe since the Cold War. This inherently threatens to destabilise 
not only the regional security of that part of the world, but also the global geostrategic balance. This is of utmost concern to Australia. Australian commentary in recent weeks about the, recent, about the increased risk of war between Russia and Ukraine misses the simple fact that the two countries are already at war. Understanding just how big Russia's appetite is to endure any cost of further invasion is a key priority for right now. And yet there are substantial divergences amongst NATO members as to what that cost should be. And this matters enormously. Since Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, Moscow has consistently undermined Ukrainian sovereignty. Russian actions in the Donbass region, including backing separatist rebels, has created immense instability. Likewise, a multitude of cyber attacks can be linked to Russia, including a cyber strike against Ukraine's electrical grid in 2015, which disrupted power for, uh, for millions of people, through to a cyber attack earlier this year, which brought down multiple government websites. And these are just two such examples. The current build-up of Russian troops along the Ukrainian border is just another act of aggression unleashed by Vladimir Putin's Russia. Europe can no longer pass the buck when it comes to assisting Ukraine. They must stand together. Russian actions and designs for Ukraine are clearly an attempt, um, attempt to in intimidate Europe into acquiescing to Moscow's desired regional security environment, a security environment where might is right and the weak suffer is not in Europe's or Australia's interest. The United States should not be doing all the heavy, heavy lifting when it comes to standing up to Russia. All allies and partners who have an interest in global peace and stability must be prepared to do what is necessary to ensure conflict is averted. However, this means that NATO states, but particularly the European members, must materially step up to the threats facing Ukraine. The United Kingdom is leading the European pact on laying down red lines for Russia, and their leadership should be commended. Spain, Denmark, the Netherlands, the Baltic states have sent Ukraine weapons. France and Germany, however, arguably the two European nations who should be taking the lead on the Ukraine crisis, are unfortunately letting Europe down. While France has been doing some of the diplomatic heavy lifting, Germany's stance is increasingly looking much more like appeasement. While the ideal solution is a diplomatic one, the reality is deterrence must be demonstrably credible. Germany's insistence on not providing lethal weapons and sending instead 5,000 helmets and medical equipment exposes an evident weakness in European unity on Ukraine. Of course, we know Berlin is constrained by its weakness and reliance on Russian gas, and I applaud recent Australian announcements that we are ready to fill that gap should that occur. And I also acknowledge that via the White House we are hearing that Germany is prepared to look at wide-ranging sanctions. It would be better to be hearing that from Berlin. However, if Germany won't stand up for its neighbours and the ideals of liberal democracy, sovereignty and regional security, then Australia should think twice about rewarding it with future defence contracts. If Europe lets Putin get away with further aggression against Ukraine, a precedent will be set for other authoritarian leaders around the globe. This precedent should worry Australians, especially those standing in this House today. A United States bogged down in Europe will have serious implications for our own backyard the Indo-Pacific, in what is already a dangerous and highly contested security environment. It means that the United States will have less bandwidth and capability to operate and deter malicious actors in the Indo-Pacific. This opportunity could very much allow China's Xi Jinping to place further pressure on the region's shared vision as being free, open and stable. However, should the, however this should come as no surprise. We have watched China over the past decade become increasingly more assertive and increasingly more willing 
to use their weight against states who dare to disagree. If Europe does not stand up to Russia and Ukraine, a clear message will be delivered to China on the question of strategic ambiguity over Taiwan, the message being that the West does not have the strength or the will to defend smaller liberal democracies and that if you push hard enough, the West will capitulate. This is a message that we simply cannot endorse. President Xi has made it clear that in his lifetime, Taiwan will be incorporated into mainland China, and he will therefore be watching with a close eye as to how the West responds to Putin's latest acts of aggression. If European states do not step up in the Ukrainian crisis, and the United States does become drawn into a protracted conflict in Ukraine, those nations with national interests in the Indo-Pacific must be ready to step up in the region with increased phys physical presence. This includes our allies and partners, such as Japan, UK, Korea and India, and others, to ensure our region and backyard remain stable regardless of the situation in Europe. In fact, if France and Germany are not going to defend Ukraine, they should at least be prepared to defend their interests in this region, which they talk so much about. Russia has watched China apply a dangerous strategy of incrementalism with accumulated gains in the region over the last decade, particularly in the South China Sea. As an international community, we must recognise that this strategy will not just disappear. The question isn't if Russia will make a further move on Ukraine, but when. All countries who believe in peace must be prepared to back Ukraine in any way they can. But Europe ought to step up most. If not, they need to be prepared to answer to their children and grandchildren as to why not. Here in Australia, we have experienced firsthand the pressures of an overbearing authoritarian government who have attempted to coerce us and force their will upon our people. This government has rightly stood up to these coercive acts in the name of protecting the ideals that we value most. All countries who believe in peace must be prepared to back Ukraine in any way they can, but particularly through economic sanctions. However, all NATO countries must show the greatest of resolve and provide military support. If they don't, they need to be prepared to answer to history as to why they appeased Putin. As chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Ukraine, I have a deep appreciation for the Ukrainian people and I admire the strength and resolve they have displayed as a nation in recent times. This is not the first time that liberal democracies have been challenged to stand up for their values, and it will not be the last. But how we act today and how we respond to the threat that we currently face can and will have repercussions for the future. Madam Acting Deputy President, Russia must immediately de-escalate. However, if Putin proves unwilling to do so, the free world support for Ukraine's sovereign integrity must be unwavering. Now is the time for all nations who profess a love for the democratic institutions that we hold so dearly to our hearts to stand with Ukraine for what is not only a just cause, but also one that can and will shape our geostrategic environment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. I call Senator Sheldon. I can thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, two years ago, the Prime Minister said slavery never happened in Australia. Apparently, he's never heard of blackbirding in the 19th century. Because the truth is that blackbirding did happen and it is still happening today. Last week, five courageous men from Vanuatu and Samoa, who were working on Australian farms on temporary visas, gave evidence to the Senate Job Security Inquiry. The conditions of work they described are barely any better than in the 19th century. Sergio came to Mildura from Vanuatu to pick grapes under the government's specific labour scheme. He was told he would be paid $2.50 for each box of grapes he picks. Sergio picks about 110 boxes on a good day, 
So that's 275 per day. $275 per day should have been the payment. But at the end of the week, Sergio looks at his pay slip. And he has been paid $100 for a week of back breaking labour. $100. Aleki came to Warburton from Samoa under the government's Pacific Labor Scheme. He came here to earn enough money to support his parents, his wife, and his eight children back in Samoa. He was told he would earn $25.41 an hour and work Monday to Friday so that he could attend church on Sunday. Aleki and his colleagues worked just one day for that $25.41 per hour rate. And then their employer told them that the contract was changing. Instead, Aleki would be getting paid $7 per tray of berries. And then that rate was reduced again and again and again. Now, this is nothing he could do about it. There was just nothing. Aleki told us, and I quote, we are being threatened. We are being told not to speak up. Talipope also came to Warburton from Samoa. He is in the same situation as Aleki. He and three others share one small hot room. This is the only place they can go after work. And last year, some of them tested positive for COVID-19. They had to isolate in their room for 10 days together in a small cramped space. All they were given to survive on was four packets of instant noodles, six potatoes, one loaf of bread, one bottle of juice and a few bits of fruit. Well, this is what four grown men with COVID-19 were told to survive on in 10 days. I've also seen Tally Pope's pay slips and timesheets. They show that some weeks Tally Pope worked 64 hours over seven days. No days off, not even for Sunday church. And for those 64 hours, he was paid just $100. Because Tally Pope, like the other workers we heard from, are having hundreds of dollars of deductions taken from their pay every week. They have been charged hundreds of dollars to stay in slum accommodation with four or six people to a room. They are being overcharged to ride in their employer's van to get to the farm. The labour hire company skims 80 per cent of their pay slip for all sorts of expenses—80 per cent. And thousands of people like Sergio, Alecki and Tally Pope are left with almost nothing. They can barely support themselves financially, let alone send any money home for their families. It is a national disgrace. The, gov the government knows about it. We had enough inquiries and task forces and reports. The company I've spoken about today is an approved employer, and they have a big tick from DFAT. And all of this is happening in plain sight. Rather than fix it, the government has introduced a new ag visa, a new visa that Minister Littleproud has said will even less regulated than the Pacific Labor Scheme that I've talked about today. The message from the government is that anything goes on Australian farms. Well, here's what Sergio told us. I came here to work for money. I did not come here as a slave. The government has to act. It has a responsibility to act, and it's about time it acted. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Mayor of Alice Springs recently wrote an impassioned letter to myself and others in this place asking for assistance dealing with high levels of crime and antisocial behaviour. At the same time, youth services in the region are calling for a clear plan and proper funding to address high levels of youth incarceration and crime. The two issues are clearly and directly linked. On February 1, a group of youth services uh, providers wrote to the Minister for Indigenous Australians highlighting their concerns about the lack of support 
and investment in remote community youth services in the southern part of the Territory. It's not the first time they've tried to get this government to listen and act. Since the IAS in 2015, when Commonwealth Government cost savings measures cancelled indexation of funding, the remote NT youth programs delivered by their agencies have effectively taken an annual cut in funding. They estimate this cut at more than $8 million. That's a huge amount of money ripped out of a remote region. As anyone in remote communities will tell you, kids need access to reliable, safe and appropriate activities to keep them occupied and engaged. Yet facilities like recreation halls, sporting facilities and staff housing are crumbling. Many youth centres and town halls are not air-conditioned and don't have working toilets, hand-washing or basic food preparation facilities. Many of the mostly uncovered outdoor basketball courts have not been resurfaced in decades. We've seen interventions, raw commissions and regional deals come and go with tens of millions of dollars spent in the name of fixing things for remote kids, yet this government continues to pass the buck. It should not be easier to jail a child than give them a basketball court to play on. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Henderson. Just hold for a moment, Senator Henderson. We've got the microphone for Senator Henderson, please. Yes. Thank you. And we might reset the clock for two minutes. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. I rise to raise serious concerns about the so-called voices of independent movement funded by the big end of town, including Simon Holmes Accords Climate 200 Group, which is nothing more than a front for Labor and the Greens. When I dared to challenge Mr Holmes Accord over his disgraceful and offensive support of the failed Section 44 challenge against the Treasurer founded on anti-Semitism, suggesting he may wish to pay the legal costs in Michael Standall's failed court challenge, I was met with claims that I was some sort of crumb maiden, that I was only here to pick up the crumbs of power, which apparently is what it means. This is sexist, denigrating and a clear case of misogyny. Climate 200's website says it wants to raise at least 15 to 20 million dollars for its independent independent candidates. The website also refers to community groups which have formed to support pro-climate, pro-integrity and pro-gender equality independence. There's nothing pro-anything, particularly pro-gender equality, about Mr Holmes at court. He has a history of making offensive and dis disrespectful comments towards uh, conservative women. He said of Senator Hume, uh, accusing her of bitchiness and not having a soul. I wrote to a number of independent candidates in Kooyong, Wentworth, McKellar, Goldstein, Curtin and North Sydney, asking that in light of these offensive comments, would they condemn Mr Holmes' court, confirm that they support the treatment, the respectful treatment of all women, and confirm whether they will take any money from Mr Holmes' court's Climate 200 group. Regrettably, from all of these independent candidates, so-called independent candidates, there was absolutely no response, which says everything that electors need to know about their commitment to respect for all women. Thank you. I call Senator Wishwalson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Something significant happened in this nation on the 16th of December last year. Uh, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, visited Newcastle and formally declared opposition to a fossil fuel project called Petroleum Exploration Permit 11, PEP 11, which uh, was going to explore for oil and gas off the coast uh, of Newcastle all the way down to the northern Sydney beaches. Now, of course, the community was absolutely stoked about this, Acting Deputy President. They've been camping, campaigning against this madness for years. But it's unclear uh, whether this is actually the case. And I just wanted to put it on record that uh, we've received some advice that while the Prime Minister came out and made this statement that this project would no longer proceed and he would be directing this, um, and we have confirmed that NOPTA, the regulator, did in fact let Asset Energy, the company that will be exploring for oil and gas, know that it would not be renewing their permit. Uh, Asset Energy is now appealing this decision, and the decision uh, is on the desk of the Resources Minister, Keith Pitt. Now, our advice is it's unclear uh, when that new advice will be provided to Asset Energy or whether its appeal or uh, the reasons for this decision will be made. Uh, and I would like to put on record today also the community's concern 
uh, that the Prime Minister has come out and made such a big statement, but there's no clarity on whether we actually have a final decision and whether indeed PEP 11, Petroleum Exploration Permit 11, is dead in the water. And may I say while I'm here today that while it's great because of a number of marginal seats on the New South Wales coast that we've banned the insanity of exploring for oil and gas off that coast, let's do it in the Otway Basin off the Twelve Apostles. Let's do it off King Island, a valuable fishing community. Let's do it around the entire country. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson, I call Senator Brown. Oh, sorry, Senator Billick. <laughs> thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Two great Tasmanian women. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. I understand that ministers are busy and that they've got to juggle com competing pressures. It's part of the job. It's what they're paid for, in fact. But many Australian workers face the pressures of a busy and demanding jobs, particularly those in the aged care sector, especially during the COVID. Um, 19 outbreak, and thank you to all of them. When the Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck, was asked to appear before the 14th of January, January hearing of the Senate COVID Committee, he declined, citing urgent and critical work combating Omicron. I was horrified to learn that Minister Colbeck declared that he received, and I quote, sponsored travel or hospitality to attend three days of the cricket in Hobart. I'm sure he was fed probably watered, to be polite, um, which is a lot more than some of our aged care residents have been able to be um, recently. And it's completely unacceptable that a minister in this government who is overseeing an ongoing crisis in aged care where people are dying chose to go to the cricket for three days instead of fronting up to do his job, especially when the committee had only asked uh, for him for two hours and 45 minutes. He could have participated remotely. Our aged care workers are doing phenomenal work under extremely trying conditions, and we need to remember the aged care sector was in crisis before COVID even hit. There has been almost nine years of disgraceful neglect of some of our most vulnerable people. But Mr Morrison and Senator Colbeck have not learnt from the terrible mistakes that have happened in aged care because of their own incompetence and funding cuts. When Minister Colbeck finally fronted the committee, he still denied there was a crisis. We've had 22 reports concluding the sector was in crisis, as well as a two-year royal commission, Your which found that the average. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Greens, Labor, the Liberals and their sellout sidekicks, the Nationals, the Uni Party as I call them, like to talk about sustainability. As though it's the environment that needs to be sustained instead of human beings. The real lesson in applying sustainability can be found though in Australian family farms, providing food to feed the hungry and clothing to warm the cold. Australian farmers are heroes for the positive effect they've had on the sustainability of our entire human race. Their farms have been productive for, in many cases, 150 years. Their soil is most likely more healthy now than ever before. Our farmers ca care about their land. It's their livelihood, their future. The role of family farming became clear during the recent drought, which mercifully has now ended in most places. Irrigation canals lose water to seepage, which recharges groundwater. Native trees get roots down into that groundwater and survive the drought. Rural Australia was resplendent with ribbons of native habitat along thousands of kilometres of irrigation canals, home to a wonderful cornucopia of native flora and fauna, which would have perished without that irrigation water. The average Australian dairy farm supports 40 species of native creatures. Where there is as little as one hectare of native bush on a farm, this increases to over 100 species. Yet, where farms have been denied water, their families have been driven off their land and farms turn into wasteland a breeding ground for pests and imported weeds, devoid of the ecosystem that happy, clappy environments pretend will return. When the government pokes its bureaucratic, bloated nose where it does not belong in the name of so-called sustainability, disaster. Family farms cease to exist. Diversity in the rural economy shrinks. The environment is worse, not better. And still the Labor, the Greens, the Liberal Party and the National Party push ahead. This is not sustainability of the environment, it's sustainability of rank stupidity and callous indifference towards the masses of everyday Australians. This madness must end. Senator Roberts, thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On Australia Day, I was honoured to attend a citizenship ceremony hosted by Archerfield Rotary Club. 
It was followed by a wonderful Australia Day Family Fun Fair. At the ceremony, I said to the citizenship conferees that in terms of looking for examples as to how they can make a contribution to our beautiful country, they need look no further than member, members of the Archerfield Rotary Club. I've previously, previously spoken in this place about the work of the club, including drought relief and assisting our Pacific family in times of need. This week, one of those members, Mr Mark Ledwidge, passed away. Mark had become an Australian citizen at the first citizenship ceremony convened by the Archerfield Rotary Club in 2006. For 26 years and 10 months, he had been an outstanding contributor to the club, serving as president, secretary and treasurer. Mr Mark Ledwidge was a Paul Harris Fellow, a great honour amongst Rotarians. Mark was involved in all of the projects undertaken by Archerfield Rotary, not just in Australia, but also in Fiji, PNG, India and Africa. Members describe him thus. Mark was such a kind, gentle soul. He did many things to help improve the lives of those less fortunate. Such a dedicated man, the man with a smile and sense of humour always, the kind of soul who never spoke ill of anyone. I wish to provide my sincere condolences to Mark's wife Brenda and his three sons, other family and friends. I have no doubt that Archerfield Rotary will continue its great community work and that, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the best tribute that can be paid to Mr Mark Ledwidge, whose life of service provides an inspiring example to all Australians. Thank you, Senator Scar. Um, Senator Griff. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister recently announced more funding for industry-linked research, including hundreds of new industry PhDs and fellowships. And I must say, this is very much a welcome commitment. Australia is blessed with world-class universities. Their research is the great enabler of economic growth. It yields new ideas and technologies that improve our lives and offer the prospect of safer, higher paying and more satisfying jobs. And it has been frustrating through the term of this government to see research underrated and very much underfunded and to see the government's constant interference in research grants. I accept our funding processes are not perfect. For instance, we waste too much public money, but while the government sees waste in projects it thinks are pointless, I see waste in how much time researchers, our best and brightest, spend on grant applications. Some studies find up to 40 per cent of a researcher's time goes into applications. Instead of doing the research, we have trained them to do. 40 per cent. Two days a week wasted. The government could significantly increase our research ca capacity by reforming the application uh, uh, process and progress or even introducing a lottery. Another problem is that while public money is increasingly channelled into commercial and industry research, too little is spent on basic research and knowledge diffusion. Without basic research, there is nothing for industry research to draw on. And without making research outputs freely available, allowing new ideas to spread, the benefits are captured by one or two big corporates and don't flow through to workers and the broader economy. So I welcome the government's announcement, but it is piecemeal, stopgap solution instead of the broader reforms that are urgently needed. Thank you, Senator Griff. I call Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I wish to draw attention to an excellent paper by the Nolungu Research Institute based at the Broome campus of Notre Dame University. It shows that First Nations people in the Kimberley coped magnificently during the first wave of COVID and thousands mobilised by leaving places they deemed to be unsafe. The researchers had trouble finding good population and infrastructure data, which clearly hampered pandemic planning. I wrote in the foreword to the paper that a government that doesn't know its own backyard is a government that doesn't care. What's clear from the paper is that while the first wave of COVID didn't infect the Aboriginal communities in the Kimberley, it was a matter of good luck rather than good management. The paper concludes, unsurprisingly, that remote community infrastructure is in disrepair, communications with government and servant agencies is inadequate, and many families live below the poverty line. These conditions, ripe for COVID, 
are as bad today as they were two years ago when COVID first arrived. But knowing all this, governments have done not enough uh, to work with these communities and agencies to prepare for the next wave, which we know will come. I'm gravely concerned that even our mainstream services in the north are under-resourced. Finally, the concept of living with the virus is a poor option when our communities have serious health problems and known, and known shortfalls in housing and service delivery. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Call Senator Lambie. Thank you. Deputy Madam President, there's a motion coming up that I'm amending, and here's the only chance I'll get to explain why. It's a motion to set up a select committee inquiry into Australia's sovereign capability. It's a good issue to look at. I'm amending it anyway. Not to kill it dead, but to make it work. At the moment, it doesn't work. It's being asked to run a mile in 10 seconds. It is impossible. It will fail. I'm in favour of an inquiry into our sovereign capability. I like the idea so much that I think we should do it properly. We don't need a select committee for this. Most of the time, they are stitch up. Whoever sets it up, sets it up, because whoever sets it up makes the rules. Look who Senator Rennick wants on it. There are six spots for senators up for grabs. He wants the government to get half the spots on the committee, and he wants One Nation to get the fourth spot. And why wouldn't he? One Nation, one, one nation vote with the Liberals 75 per cent of the time, and right now One Nation are more likely to vote with the Liberals than half the Liberal Party themselves. That's where we're at. Senator Rennick Senator wants to give government senators and government mates the lion's share of spots for an inquiry and inquiry into what the government is doing. And he wants to do it in six weeks. He reckons that's all the time it will take. What a rip-off to the nation when it comes to talking about sovereign capability. You can do it quick or you can do it right. We've got a standing committee. It's called the FADT, Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. I am one of those people on it. We look into things like this all the time. That is our job. So that's why I don't support this inquiry, not because I don't think it's such an important issue and I think it's damn critical and we need it. I think it's up with the most important issues and we can be looking at it right now. That's why I want a real inquiry, not a stitch up done minutes to midnight, stacked to the gills with government cronies and conspiracy theories. That's what we're looking at and that's what the nation deserves. Thank you, Senator Lambie. I call Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting uh, Madam Deputy President. We can all agree that we need a safe future for our children, for our grandchildren and their children. As a mother and a proud First Nations woman, my birthright gives me the responsibility to protect, nurture country with love and care. Our Mother Earth. First Nations people have cared for country since time immemorial. Yet in just over a couple of hundred years, and in fact in the blink of an eye, the legacy of colonisation has pushed us further into a climate emergency. Right now, our country is hurting, crying out in pain, and the science is clear. Every tonne of coal and gas burnt increases the intensity and the speed that changes our climate. This means more floods, more intense droughts and heat waves, and more frequent bushfires like we're seeing in my home state of Western Australia. Yet the Labor Liberal Nationals continue to vote in favour of planet-destroying fossil fuel projects that we don't need. That's because every year they take millions of donations from the coal and gas corporations responsible for this destruction. Every day that passes, we fall further behind and the opportunities make it harder to make change. But it actually doesn't have to be this way. It is the responsibility of every single person in this place to provide a safe future for our children and the generations to come. The answers to the climate crisis are here, right in front of us, and we can protect country. We can and we must push the next government to go further and faster on climate action and to create hundreds of thousands of jobs to pivot into a cleaner and greener resources economy. We can turn this country into a renewable energy superpower that exports clean, cheap, renewable energy instead of coal. Thank you, Thank you. Senator Cox. And I call Senator Patrick. During World War II, six, uh, 60,000 Timorese died assisting Australian soldiers who were fighting in Timor. After they voted for independence in 1999, 
and after the great job done by Interfet supporting the transition, it was reasonable for them to think that we were their friends. But we weren't. The government of the day and those in DFAT at the time were busy in background trying to steal Timor's oil and gas, their only real source of money to bring their population out of poverty. Here's some of the things we did. The Australian government withdrew itself from the maritime boundary jurisdictions of the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal on the Laws of the Sea, forcing the issue to be resolved without an independent umpire. During purportedly good faith negotiations, Australia spied on Timor-Leste to gain advantage in the negotiations. And when Timor-Leste found out uh, about the spying, they sought to have the, the treaty declared invalid on the basis of fraud. The Australian government responded by raiding the offices of Timor-Leste's lawyer Bernard Kaliri. After Timor launched compulsory conciliation under Article uh, 289 of the Laws of the Sea Convention, Australia lodged six objections with the Commissioner, Commission dismissing all of them. When a replacement treaty was finally agreed to by government, the, they immediately uh, brought, sought to prosecute whistleblowers Witness K and Bernard Kaliri the heroes that called out Australia's abhorrent conduct. This morning it was revealed, because of proceedings I initiated in the AAT, that we, we started the spying on the Timorals to steal their resources before they were even independent. We need to come clean. We need to be open and transparent to restore Timor's trust and international confidence in Australia. We need to stop the prosecutions. And with that, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to table a vote of confidence in Mr. Kaliri conducting, uh, in Mr. Kaliri Senator Patrick, your time has expired. I'm seeking, and is leave granted? Leave is not granted. There might be more appropriate moment. Leave is sorry. Hold on for a second. So, Senator Patrick, now that everyone you have everyone's attention, would you like to restate what it is that you are seeking leave from, so that the whips can be clear? Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I have given notice. I seek leave to table a vote of confidence in Mr Kaliri conducted recently in the Timor-Leste's parliament to show the Senate and the Australian people that his continued prosecution is, an, is a hindrance to the relationship healing process. Is leave granted? Chair, we accept the translation in good faith and have no objection uh, to accepting that the documents be tabled. Yep. So with leave, the table, the, you can table those documents, Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you to the Whips for their assistance then. I now call Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, in late January, many parts of remote and regional South Australia received unprecedented and record rainfall, causing widespread flooding across the Air Peninsula and throughout the outback. Some areas received up to 200 millimetres of rain, which is the annual rainfall in that region, and it caused severe problems, closing roads, washing away topsoil and damaging infrastructure. A 250-kilometre stretch of the Stewart Highway between Glendambo and Coober Pedy was severely damaged, and the rail from Adelaide to Darwin and to Western Australia was also severed. Homes were damaged and destroyed on the Air Peninsula, while motorists had to be rescued from uh, the area between Iron Knob and Kimber. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the South Australian Police, the CFS, the SES and other first responders for being there when the community needed you most. And also thanks to the men and women of the Australian Defence Force for the key role that they played in keeping our remote and regional communities safe and supplied while they were cut off. Unfortunately, climate science tells us that we're likely to experience more intense floods over the coming years and more intense fires. The government's own Productivity Commission has found that, fu that funding for reconstruction and recovery consumes 97 per cent of the disaster funding in Australia, and that compares with just 3 per cent for mitigation and community resilience measures. That's why an Albanese Labor government will invest up to $200 million each year on disaster prevention and resilience. We need to plan and protect our communities, not just mop up after disasters that we can plan for and we can predict. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Grogan. I call Senator Thorpe. Acting Deputy President, we all saw that 
powerful photo of sisters Kathy Freeman, Yvonne Goolagong and Ash Barty together. This country's greatest athletes and the definition of black excellence are such a great inspiration to all young women and girls. However, we can't just celebrate our elite women and gender diverse athletes. We need to pay them. It's a great time for sport in this country, and the AFL women's season is underway, and it is unbelievable that there is such a huge gap in the pay that AFLM players and AFLW players take home. How can the league call their elite athletes professional players if a whole lot of them don't even get paid properly? This season, most AFLW players will earn just over $20,000. Because AFLW players are paid so little, most have to juggle other work just to stay afloat. Not to mention they also are far more likely to develop ACL injuries than their male counterparts. AFLW is quickly becoming the number one female sport in this country. These incredible, incredible athletes must be paid at the highest rate and must be supported into becoming full-time professional athletes with the pay that they deserve. Go AFLW. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. On 1 February last year, Burma's pathway to democracy was abruptly interrupted by a military coup. Australia has always maintained publicly and privately its very, very serious concerns about the coup. We've done this directly to the regime itself. We've done it in ministerial meetings and embassy statements. We've done it at the East Asia Summit, the United Nations Human Rights Council. By the end of last year, there were 65 calls from our foreign minister to international leaders. We've suspended Australia's limited bilateral defence cooperation arrangements and redirected our development assistance away from regime entities. We've contributed $25 million to the ASEAN Centre for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management. We've provided COVID-19 support to the tune of $6 million, and we've provided a further $4.5 million to support other infection control initiatives. And Australia's funded humanitarian partners are working diligently to ease the pain that now is inflicting many, many Burmese people. If The Economist magazine is to be believed, there is room for optimism. In its most recent edition, it said, the National Union government has, by contrast, taken pains to show that it is listening to its critics. It is stuffed with young people and ethnic minorities, and it says it makes decisions by consensus. It has symbolically repealed the constitution, which was enacted by a previous junta in 2008, and promised to forge a federal state and to grant Rohingya citizenship, as well as approach these future matters in a conciliatory and inclusive tone. There is much to be optimistic about in regards to Burma. But but thus far the ASEAN process has not lived up to expectations. My strong view, having spoken to many Burmese people across our country, is that Australia must maintain its vigilance. Australia must maintain a strong voice in making sure that everything is done to free Burma of this military regime. This Sorry, Senator Smith, your time had expired. I'm not sure what happened to the clock there. Senator Gallagher, you do have 20 seconds if you want it. Uh, thank you. Well, I'll just give you a few uh, budget facts from this government. They've doubled the debt prior to the pandemic. They racked up a trillion dollars of debt without enough to show for it. They're the second highest taxing government in the last 30 years and is now collecting $4,500 more per person than Labor in 2013. They have no credibility on budget management. It being, it being 2 p.m., we will now move to questions. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. An aged care manager in Victoria who has been forced to work 80-hour weeks due to staff shortages has said, and I quote, 
During our recent outbreak, I requested isolation gowns and N95 masks from the national stockpile. Instead, we received latex gloves and hand sanitizer. I laughed, then I went into my office and cried. It's like a bad joke. More than two years into this pandemic, why is the Morrison-Joyce government still failing aged care workers? The Minister for Aged Care Services, Senator Colbert. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. And, and I don't accept the premise of Senator Keneally's questions. Um, and as I indicated to the Chamber yesterday, uh, we have acknowledged that there were some issues with supplies out of the national stockpile. Order. That's one of the things that we've been working on. Uh, Coles, Woolworths, a whole range of organisations indicated Order, that they had supply chain issues because they had workforce out of their no uh, logistics chains uh, and that impacted on their capacity to deliver. Mr President, I'm advised that in respect of this facility, this particular facility, uh, the um, sky, size and the scale of the delivery, uh, and this happened with a number of facilities, Mr President, uh, that the size and the scale of the delivery meant that the deliveries were split into a number of different packages, mm. into a number of different deliveries. So things different, so Order so so things would way. have arrived at different times because Senator of those issues Senator we Watt. had with the logistics chain, Mr. President. The Senator government has Watt. the government has acknowledged that we had issues uh, with deliveries out of the national stockpile. That's what we have spent all of January working on to fix because the logistics operators that were supplying and moving the products, Mr. President, had staff effects from COVID. That's why it happened, Mr. President, like so many other logistics chains uh, around the country. For the Labor Party to expect that one part of the economy, one part of the community won't be impacted by COVID when the rest is, is just completely naive, Mr. President, and it shows how much they're prepared to play politics with the pandemic rather than actually deal with the pandemic. They're not interested in finding solutions. They're not interested in actually dealing with the issues that are real, and they are real for that provider who's uh, made comment to the local media. Uh, we're interested in dealing with the problems, uh, and that's what we'll continue to do. Uh, Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. A nursing manager in New South Wales said, and I quote, I have never felt pressure like this. The reality is the government has made a huge amount of mistakes. My staff should not be on the pittance they are being paid. I don't think anyone in aged care is okay. Will the minister say sorry to this nursing manager for the mistakes he and his government have made? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The first thing we'll do is acknowledge again the magnificent work that uh, aged care providers and their workforce have done during COVID, Mr. President. Uh, we know that they've doubled up on shifts. We know that they've uh, worked really hard in the interests of the residents that they're caring for. Uh, we understand that, Mr. President, and we've supported the aged care sector with PPE, with rapid antigen tests, with surge workforce, um, Mr. President, with, with, with a program, Order. with a program to cover the costs, the additional costs of managing uh, a COVID-19 outbreak within a facility, uh, there have been a whole range of measures that have been in place right through the pandemic, Mr. President. And at certain points of time during the pandemic, there have been circumstances that have arisen that have impacted on the capacity to, to appropriately deliver uh, those services, Mr. President. And I've just been through the point of telling. Uh, telling uh, the chamber about the issues Minister, we've had with Minister, supply chains, Mr President. Your time has expired. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Aged care nurse Sue has asked, and I quote, Mr Morrison, do I go to Mr Smith, who is in pain, or Mrs Jones, who's on the floor, or John, who has behaviour problems and is intruding into other people's rooms? I have floor alarms going and buzzers going. What would you like me to do? What does the Minister for Aged Care Services think? Sue should do. Minister. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. I mean, the, the question is an example of how cheap the Labor Party are really trying to be in relation to uh, the delivery of aged care services, Mr. President. And, it, and it's impossible. It's impossible for me to understand. The, it, the, it is impossible Order. for me to try from the question 
and interpret the decisions that uh, Sue has had to make, Mr. President. And, but I acknowledge how difficult they are. Oh, but no. I acknowledge how difficult they are, Mr. President. And, and we have provided over 80,000 shifts of surge workforce around the country, Mr. President. And we have provided additional resources wherever we can. We have not spared any expense with respect Senator to supporting Kimberley. the sector with those workforces. I know, Mr. President, I know that the choices that Sue has had to make are going to be yeah. difficult. Uh, and they are the stresses that all Australians have felt through the health care system, through the aged care system, through NDIS, some very, very difficult Minister, through a whole range Minister, of workplaces in managing COVID-19. has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Liberal and National government's plan is delivering investment jobs and opportunities for regional Australia? The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Catanan, for your long advocacy for regional Australia. Well, our government has been just focusing on getting it done to ensure our regions are sustainable, prosperous and secure by investing and delivering thousands of projects on the ground and delivering local jobs. Projects that build on the natural competitive advantage of our regions and supporting them to be more resilient in the face of key challenges, whether it's drought, whether it's bushfire, or whether it's indeed COVID-19. And it is having a real impact. The Regional Australia Institute has just released a report today that says our unemployment rate out in the regions is at 3.8 per cent, the lowest in decades. And our job vacancies are skyrocketing. 70,000. We've got great long-term, well-paid careers right across the regions. Come and join us. Our key industries of agriculture oh, and mining nah. are booming, with the resource and energy export earnings forecast to hit a staggering $379 billion with hundreds of projects in the pipeline. Ag uh, has forecast to hit $73 billion, and it's well on the way to its target of $100 billion by 2030. We've invested over $100 billion in infrastructure projects, in roads and rail, to better connect our rural communities and shift our product, not just to capital cities, but to ports and international markets. We've spent $3.5 billion on dams, pipelines and weirs, Senator because we Watt. know that we create wealth Minister, by adding Minister. water. Minister, to our ingenuity. Minister, 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 please resume your seat. Senator Watt, the interjections are coming far too frequently. Interjections are always disorderly. Senator Mackenzie has a pretty powerful voice, and I could not hear parts of her answer. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President, for your protection. Um, we've put $5 billion back into community for drought resilience, and we're tapping into emergent industries such as the hydrogen industry and putting $1.3 billion on the table for that. I could go on and on. We're putting record investment into the regions. But I tell you what, I would love to hear someone over the other side of this chamber talking about regional Australia. Albo didn't even Minister, mention it in his National Press Club speech your last time week. Has expired. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Uh, th thank you, Mr President. That's great news, Minister. Can the Minister further advise how supporting regional and remote communities with, will strengthen Australia's future economic prosperity? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. We know that when the regions are strong, Australia is strong. A third of our population lives outside of capital cities, and a vast amount of our GDP is produced out there too. That's why we're investing in infrastructure, connectivity and resilience for the regions, not just building short-term impacts but for generations. Take the project like the inland rail. More than 400 Australian businesses have already shared in the billions of dollars we're investing in that project. The ARTC, for example, has over $140 million of contracts out there that are building jobs in places like Rockhampton and Wagga Wagga as they produce the concrete sleepers. Uh, we've expected to boost this project is going to uh, boost our GDP by more than $18 billion over the next half a century. We've got a long-term vision for this country and for the regions. And it's also going to reduce our emissions by 750,000 tonnes, which is great news as we uh, put more product 
on rail Minister, and off road. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Canavan, a <coughs> second supplementary. Now, thank you, Mr. Um, President. Uh, can the minister outline the risks to Australia's economic security if our regions are not supported? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, there are very real risks and challenges to Australia's economic security. If we don't back our farmers, our foresters, our miners, our fishers and our manufacturers. But the greatest risk is sitting opposite uh, me right now. We know, we know that Adam Bant, Adam Bant and Albo have done the sneaky deal and Adam just could not wait for the election Order. campaign to outline it. Order. He couldn't wait. Minister. What are they going to do? A moratorium. Minister. A moratorium on all, all new. Please resume your seat. I'm, I, I want to re-announce, Adam. I would remind you that we need to address members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, you have the call. I will be. I will be. I will be respectful. Um, Adam Bant, he's sealing the deal with Albo and demanding Labor a moratorium till COP27. That's four years. Four years on all new coal, gas and oil projects in support. In support. That is going to kill hundreds of projects, tens of thousands of local jobs in places like the Hunter, in places like Western New South Wales and Central Queensland. Minister, Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Does the minister think that $22 per hour is enough for aged care workers? Uh, the Minister for Senior Australians, uh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said in this chamber before, and I've said on a number of occasions uh, in front of your committee, uh, the determination of the salary for people across Australians is a matter for Fair Work Australia. Which, um, it is, it is, uh, which was actually legislated by, which was legislated by the Labor Party, Mr. President. It was legislated uh, by the. Um, and so, Mr. President, what I, what I, what I believe, Mr. President, what I believe is, is that all Australians in the workforce, but particularly those working in aged care, should be fairly compensated. There is a case open right now, being considered by Fair Work Australia, in relation to the wages of uh, Australians uh, working in the aged care sector, Mr. President. We have done, as we said we would do in response to the Royal Commission. Uh, provided support and advice to that case um, uh, as, it been, as, as, it, as it has progressed, Mr. President. But, Mr. Order. President, um, uh, Order. Mr. President, uh, Order. When, when Mr. Albanese was asked about this a week or so ago, do you say that aged care workers uh, to have a, uh, should have a 25%? Uh, pay rise. Do you agree Minister, with that, Mr. President? Minister, Minister, Senator, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Direct or relevance. This Senator was Keneally. a fairly. Just, sorry, I just I could not actually hear you. So please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, this was a fairly tightly worded question. It had no embroidery. It was very direct. It was literally, does the minister believe? the pay of $22 per hour is sufficient for aged care workers. It made no mention of anything about the industrial relations system or other parties in the parliament. It was a fairly tightly worded question. Uh, I, I, I ask I, you to bring I, the minister back to the lead. Senator Keneally, I've been listening to the minister answer the question. I believe that his first part of the answer was relevant to the question. Um, the minister was straying into other territory. Uh, so I have allowed you to bring the minister back to the question. I will listen carefully to his answer. Minister, you have 40 seconds remaining. You have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, and I have directly responded to the question, but it is pertinent that Mr. Albanese, when asked about this, said it's up to the Fair Work Con Commission to determine what minister, that figure will be. Minister, now they don't want to hear minister, that, Mr. President. Minister. Order. Senator Pratt, order. Senator Keneally. Thank you, and I thank you for your previous comments about the minister straying from the, the question. Uh, again, a point of order on direct relevance. He is straying again. Is Senator Birmingham. Oh. Yes, Mr. President. Mr. President, on the point of order. Now, the question was about wage rates. The minister is absolutely within his rights 
and to outline how wage rates are set and indeed to use direct quotes about the validity of the system that sets those wage rates. Now, the minister was not making a political point from what I heard at the time Senator Keneally took her point of order. He was using a direct quote about the system that sets wage rates, which was entirely relevant uh, to the context of the answer he was giving. Senator Gallagher, on the point of order. On the point of order, um, Mr President, and following on from Senator Birmingham's comments, the minister was making a political point. He was quoting from a transcript about the Leader of the Opposition. And he was making a political point. Order. It had no relevance at all, and it, it was it was ignoring Order. Order. it was ignoring the direction that you just provided to the minister. He completely ignored your direction. On the point of order, yes, on, on the point of order, Mr. President, can I um, point out here that that all uh, the minister is doing is confirming how our wage system works by referring to someone who has been a member of this parliament for many years, Mr. Albanese. The only implication you can take from the points by Senator Gallagher is she does not think that Mr Albanese is an authority about how our system works, that he does not know apparently Order. how our system works, because all Senator the minister Canavan. is doing Senator is Canavan. quoting someone who Senator probably Canavan. knows, probably knows how the system point. works. It's not Senator a political Canavan. point. Resume your seat. I, I, I think we've all heard enough. I allowed you to direct the minister back to the question, as I believe there was a risk that he was straying from the direct topic. I continue to listen to the minister's answer. I, uh, uh, I will continue to listen. I am not yet um, convinced that the minister is not being relevant, but I am listening very carefully. Minister, you have the call for 31 seconds. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I've said, I believe that all Australians in the workforce, particularly those in aged care, should be fairly remunerated. Um, the level of that remuneration should be determined by Fair Work Australia. That's what the government said, and that's exactly what Mr Albanese said. He agrees. So, Mr President, so I believe that they should be fairly remunerated. I know they work hard. I appreciate Minister. how hard they work. Your time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. The opposition isn't asking about the tribunal's view. We are asking the minister responsible for aged care services and an aged care workforce whether you believe, as the minister responsible, that pay rates of $22 an hour is sufficient for aged care workers. You should answer that question and not avoid it. Order. Order. Senator Abetz. I will not, I will not call the minister. I'm, I haven't got a mask on. Um, I will not call the minister in there until there is silence. Senator Abetz. Minister. Thank you, Mr President. I'll say it again. I think that all Australians in the workforce should be fairly remunerated. The balance of how that remuneration is established in relation to all other elements of the economy is rightly and properly determined by Fair Work Australia. That's why Fair Work Australia was set up. I presume that's why the Labor Party established Fair Work Australia. And, uh, whatever pay rise is granted to uh, workers in the aged care sector, Mr Albanese agrees with the government that it's up to Fair Work Australia to decide. That's the process, Mr. President. I believe they deserve Order. a fair, work's, fair day's work for a fair day's pay, and they work hard, Mr. President. They work extremely hard. I've acknowledged countless times in this chamber how hard they work. I've spoken to aged care workers, Mr. President, and Mr. President. So I believe that they should be fairly recom recompensed, and Mr. President, uh, I will continue to maintain that. Senator Order. Senator Gallagher, second supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Does the minister f uh, believe that aged care workers are fairly remunerated now? And have you personally asked Mr Morrison to make a submission to the Fair Work Commission work value case in support of a wage rise for aged care workers? 
and you referred earlier to help and support provided by the government. Please outline what that help and support is. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My understanding is that the advice that we've provided to Fair Work Australia uh, has been published by Fair Work Australia. So Fair Work Australia wrote to the government, asked us to make some submissions in relation to this case. We have done that and we will provide any information uh, that they seek, Mr. President. Uh, there, there's one, there's one, uh, one element that wasn't a matter for Fair Work Australia uh, to determine, and we've advised them of that, and that was in relation to future budgeting. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, and so we have and we will continue to provide the information that Fair Work Australia requires in the determinant of this case, Mr. President. Uh, the, the, the government has responded to the Royal Commission's recommendations, uh, and we have said in response to the Royal Commission's recommendations that Fair Work Australia is the appropriate Minister, place for the determination Minister, of wages. Please resume your seat. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Your direct relevance. Uh, the question also included, did, Ms. did the minister personally ask Mr Morrison to make a submission to the Fair Work Commission? With 13 seconds left, we'd appreciate if the minister could get to that part of the question. You, a minister can be directly relevant to any part of the question. You have brought the minister's attention to a particular part of the question. Senator Colbeck, you have the call for 13 seconds unless you have finished your answer. Thank you, Mr President. As Al Mr Albanese said, it's up to the Fair Work Commission what that figure should be. Fair Work Australia is the appropriate determinant, determinant of wages in this country. The government believes that's the, as well. Senator Hewitt, order, order. On my right and my left, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government is ensuring support is available to victims of domestic, family and sexual violence through 1800 Respect into the future? The Minister for Women's Safety, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question on this really important subject. 1800 Respect is the national gateway for all Australians who are seeking help or assistance. Uh, who are affected by family, domestic and sexual violence. And it is an absolute priority of this government to ensure that we have uh, this national telephone and online counselling service is of the absolute highest quality so that people who rely on it can rely on it. And that's why we conducted an open and uh, a competitive procurement process to secure uh, the next provider to deliver 1800 Respect into the future. So on the 24th of January this year, I was pleased to announce that Telstra Health had been the successful provider, um, and that was following a very extensive process that enabled us to come up with the strongest service solution uh, and with the capability to provide a really high quality response uh, that was trauma informed and fit for purpose. So Telstra Health will deliver 1800 Respect for the next five years with the possibility of an extension. This is the first time that we've put in place a five-year contract for the service so that we can make sure that we have continuity and stability uh, in the service that we provide because we know it is so important to so many Australians. Um, through this process, we've overhauled the funding model. Uh, it is no longer a cost per contact uh, model. It's one based on the time that's needed to help the person and to make sure that 1800 Respect is funded on the basis of the user need. Uh, as our understanding of trauma and the per pervasive nature of gender-based violence continues to evolve, we are also ensuring that this service evolves to meet the diverse and complex needs of the people that rely on it. A stage transition will occur to make sure that there is no impact on the delivery um, at when Telstra Health take up the service provision in July. And can I take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of Medibank Health Solutions and their subcontractors who have been delivering this important commitment since Minister. 2010? Senator Hughes, a Thank supplementary you, Mr. question. President, can the minister outline the further improvements that are being made to 1800 Respect? Minister. A number of enhancements will be available into the future um, to ensure that 1800 Respect meets the needs of the diverse and complex 
needs of the people who, who rely on the service. New technology is one of the key things that are going to be built into the new platform. Uh, so additional options for users so that they can use um, text messages or video calls. And most importantly, there is a new mechanism which means that they can transfer between devices and platforms without needing to disconnect. Follow-up on refer referrals is also very important, uh, which we will do when it is safe to do so, to ensure that the needs that the person has, has sought have been met in the appropriate way. The new service offering will also include um, supported referrals by councillors to other appropriate supports within the broader service system. Importantly, we're acting on the advice from the sector to make sure these technological enhancements support a tell-it-once model to minimise the need for users to continually repeat their story. Senator Hughes, a second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, how is the government continuing to respond to the recommendations of the Respect at Work report through the additional support being provided by 1800 Respect? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we all have a role to stopping sexual harassment and creating safe workplaces, and that's why we've ensured 1800 Respect expands its service offering uh, to provide psychological support and referrals to people affected by workplace uh, sexual harassment. Importantly, this particular uh, enhancement uh, responds to recommendation 54 of the Respect at Work report. Uh, our government has agreed or noted to all 55 recommendations in the report, and our response is about creating a new culture of respectful behaviour in workplaces across the whole of Australia. It's also our priority to ensure that 1800 Respect provides high quality and responsive support to people who need help and information, and it's important this includes victims of workplace sexual harassment. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to encourage anybody who has been impacted or knows someone who's been impacted by sexual assault uh, or family violence to call 1800 Respect on 1800 737 732 or go to our website. Senator Griff. Oh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Hume, representing the Minister for Communications. Two days ago, the government announced it would increase funding to the ABC, restore indexation and continue funding the enhanced news gathering program for an additional three years. That program, which sits outside of the ABC's base funding, allows the ABC to employ journalists in regional Australia, particularly in areas which would otherwise go without local news. More than 70 people are currently employed by this program, and the continued funding shows the government believes it provides value for money. Could the minister explain why the government decided to keep this funding, the enhanced news gathering funding, outside of ABC's base funding? The minister representing the Minister for Communications, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff very much for his question and his enduring commitment to a strong and independent ABC, one that is shared by the government, an ABC that provides quality broadcast services free of bias or political alignment and is reflective of our population and the values and expectations that, the, that all Australians have as they are the ones who fund the ABC. Certainly the government recognises the importance of the ABC and understands that Australians also value the services provided by our ABC. And we're committed to a strong and resilient ABC, operating efficiently and delivering the best possible outcomes with the substantial funding that it receives. And in fact, this ABC has more funding certainty than any other media organisation in Australia. At the moment, taxpayers fund the ABC with more than $1 billion every single year. And this is a substantial investment of public funds in our national broadcaster to enable it to provide television, radio and digital media services in line with its charter. Mr President, the budget for the next three years of ABC funding, commencing on 1 July 2022, was announced, as Senator Griff said, on 7 February this year. The ABC will receive $3.3 billion over the next three years to 30 June 2025. And as Senator Griff points out, this includes $45.8 million under the new enhanced news gathering program to strengthen local public interest journalism in regional communities. Mr President, this represents an increase in funding compared to both the 2016-19 triennium and the 2019-22 tri triennium. And the ABC will also receive indexation on that base operational funding, which does not include the $45.8 million 
under the Enhanced News Gathering Program. The ABC will also, however, include receive funding to continue Minister, and to expand audio Mi description Minister, services to blind and vision your time impaired. Time has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you didn't directly answer my question, which related to why enhanced news gathering is kept outside of the ABC's core budget. Now, some have claimed the government keeps it outside as a way of keeping the broadcaster dependent and compliant. Could you rebut this by explaining the other components, perhaps even on notice, of ABC funding which sit outside the base funding, if there are any? Minister. Uh, Senator Griff, I doubt that anyone in this chamber would call the ABC compliant or dependent. Uh, in fact, the ABC were delighted with the decision, government's decision to commit $3.3 billion over the next three years, and that was a direct quote from the chair of the ABC, Ida Buttrose. In fact, she said that that funding agreement will allow the national broadcaster continue to continue what it does best, to provide information and entertainment to Australians wherever they live. And in fact, David Anderson, the managing director of the ABC, welcomed the funding certainty that the announcement brings to the national broadcaster for the next three years. He said that the triennial funding announcement is an important recognition that the ABC is needed now more than ever, and that this funding is required so that it can continue to fulfil its vital role in our democratic society. He even reached out and thanked Minister Paul Fletcher and the government for recognising the enduring value of the ABC, particularly in this year, as they mark 90 years of servicing and serving all Australians. Senator Grip, a second supplementary. Minister, journalists employed under the Enhanced News Gathering Program cannot be offered contracts which run beyond the funding period. That is a fact. As their employment and financial circumstances are precarious, the ABC struggles to attract and retain quality journalists in regional areas. What would the minister say to these journalists to justify this policy of keeping it outside of the core budget? Minister. The ABC's funding is more certain than any other news gathering organisation in Australia, than any other Order. media organisation in Australia. And in fact, the News Media Bargaining Code, which of course passed the tr as, uh, this chamber on the 25th of February 2021, implemented that News Media and Digital Platforms Mandatory Bargaining Code, which has allowed the ABC to reach oh, an agreement. Sorry, Minister. Senator Griff, on a point of order. Uh, look, direct relevance. My question solely related to enhanced news gathering budget being, out, being outside of the core ABC budget. Uh, I'm listening to the minister's answer. I, I don't believe I can yet uh, bring her back to the question. You have uh, brought her back to part of the question, but minister, you have the call. You have 36 seconds remaining. Thank you, Mr President. And Senator Griff, what I wanted to say was that the, new, the enhanced man mandatory bargaining code, sorry, the media and digital platforms mandatory bargaining code and the commercial agreements that have been now uh, negotiated between Google and Meta and the ABC have now allowed the ABC, and they have publicly committed to this, to use any of those funds from those agreements to support regional journal journalism specifically. And on the 5th of November 2021, the ABC unveiled plans for major investment in regional and rural broadcasting, regional and rural journalism, using those proceeds from its agreement with Google Minister, News Showcase. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals in government are securing our energy future, including and especially in regional Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Industry. Order. Order. I will call the minister again, the minister representing the Minister for Industry, Senator Thank Seselja. You. Thank you very much, Mr President. And we're already getting the interjections, which I love from Senator Watt. But these are the facts. These are the facts. Electricity costs are now at their lowest level in eight years. In the last two years alone, energy costs for households are down 8 per cent and costs for small businesses are down 10 per cent. Our reforms to cap the price of the highest cost electricity deals mean that a typical household can be up to $768 a year better off and a typical small business up to $3,000 a year better off. Now, on top of this, an AEMC report released in November shows household electricity bills across the national electricity market 
will continue to fall by a further nearly 6 per cent on average over the next few years. Now, that's in stark contrast to when that lot were in government, where we saw 23 consecutive quarters of increases in electricity pr prices. And now, now what do we see from those opposite? Labor are flip-flopping on the Curry Curry project in the Hunter. This project will provide 600 direct construction jobs, 1,200 indirect jobs for the Hunter region. Order. And now, after nearly a year of talking down jobs and investment in the Hunter, after nine Order. of his front bench colleagues opposed the project, the weak leader of the opposition, each way Albo, has backflipped on support for a new gas fired Minister. power station Minister. in Curry Curry. Minister. What a conviction politician he is. Have someone on their feet on a point of order, I believe. I... I, I, I was going to bring the minister's attention to the fact we do need to refer to members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, you have the call. Conviction politician, the leader of the opposition is. Now, what do we think some senators over there think about this change of heart? Well, we know Senator Keneally and McAllister, they created Lean, the Labor Environmental Action Organisation, which said, we know increasing gas supply is not the solution. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for jobs and it's not good for the environment. So much support for Anthony Albanese and his new policy over there on the opposition benches. Senator McAllister, Senator Keneally and the entire front bench team. Minister, Nobody believes Minister, it. your time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you've mentioned the Curry Curry project in Hunter. Um, can you explain again for the benefit, particularly for the benefit of those opposite who may still be wavering despite <laughs> Labor's backflip, um, why that project, the Hunter Power project, is so important? Minister. Thank you, and, and yes, I can, because, because closing the Dell power plant without adequate replacement capacity risks prices rising by around 30 per cent over two years, which is what happened when they were last in government. That's why now, more than ever, it's important to see Curry Curry come online, a project that on this side we've consistently supported. But the Leader of the Opposition said the project doesn't stack, stack up. Senator McAllister said, if you're interested in driving down electricity prices, you'd be mad to use gas. Chris Bowen said we don't support new gas-fired power stations like Curry Curry. Pat Conroy said it's a massive white elephant. Order. Mark Butler said we know that coal and gas won't underpin continued prosperity. And Mark Dreyfus said it's a project that no Order. one wants. That's what they really believe. That is what the Labor Party really believe. Forget about what they're saying now, Order. just before an election, in a desperate bid to curry favour uh, with those in the Hunter and elsewhere. They can't be trusted. We've got them in their own words. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Davey, a second supplementary. Thank oh. you. Finally, Senator Minister. Davey, hold on. Let's just have some quiet before you start the question. Really good question. Okay, Senator really Davey, you have the call. Thank you. Can the minister outline what the risks are to the continued delivery of affordable and reliable energy? for all Australian families and all Australian small and to medium businesses? Minister. Well, well I can. Uh, and of course, it's, it's those opposite in potential coalition with the Greens. Uh, in coalition with the Greens. And here in the ACT, uh, we've had a bit of a look at what that looks like, a Labor-Greens coalition. And Anthony Albanese and Adam Vant want to take that project Order. national. That's what they want to do. They want to take it national. And what have we seen here? Well, electricity prices in the rest of the country, they're going down. What we're seeing in the ACT is they're projected to go up by 4 per cent on the back of a 12 per cent increase just last year. And of course, if Anthony Albanese is going to cave to the Greens on, uh, po oh, on energy no. policy, uh, on it, they really don't like me talking about their Labor-Greens alliance. All right. Yep. Minister, I've just seated the minister. Senator Billick. Once again, Mr President, I will draw your attention to the fact that um, the speaker is not referring to the gentleman he's referring to by the right title or name. I will ask all or everyone uh, to remember that we address members of the other place by their correct titles. Minister, 
You have the call. And so, if the leader of the opposition is going to cave to the Greens on energy, what else is he going to give the Greens? We ask. Is he going to cave to them and their policy to cut defence spending in half? Is he going to cave to their policies to decriminalise hard drugs like ice? He will cave to them on anything to get in government, and that's why he can't Minister, be trusted. Your time has expired, Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. In my home state of Victoria, people who sought the help of this country are being imprisoned in the Park Hotel. How can you justify locking these innocent people up for up to nine years, where the vast majority of them have been recognised as refugees. The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Thorpe for the question. Uh, Senator Thorpe, there is one thing that the Australian Greens and uh, the Morrison-Joyce government disagree about, and that is in relation to the fundamental policy of border protection. Uh, you joined last time with the Labor Party, and as a result, the people that you are referring to in the alternative places of detention, um, they came to this country and they came here in contravention of our strong border protection laws. I Order. reject any statement by you that in any way infers that they are locked up. We have made it very, very clear Order. as a government that the fundamental responsibility of a government is the protection of Australia and Australians. And Mr President, the question asked by Senator Thorpe is a very, very telling one. A very, very telling one, because what it says is this to the Australian people. If at the next election they were to cast a vote, as Senator Cecilia has said, for the Australian Labor Party, they will be going in, in concert, just like they did last time, with the Australian Greens. 50,000 people coming to this country illegally, the thousands of deaths, Senator Thorpe, of people at sea. We make no apologies on this side of the chamber, Mr President, for our tough border protection principles. A fundamental responsibility of any Commonwealth government must be, must be the protection of Australia and Australians, and on that regard, both the Australian Greens Order. and the Australian Labor Party, they fail every time. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Order. President. Uh, sorry, Senator Thorpe, that wasn't directed at you. That was directed at others. You Thank have the call for your supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Minister, for your response. The only people who came here illegally uh, were the people that came here 240 years on the boats. So, last month, the Prime Minister claimed that the people held in the Park Hotel are not refugees. Why did the Prime Minister lie about this? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And Senator Thorpe, I completely, totally and utterly reject the statement that you have made that the Prime Minister has lied. There is one thing that you can say about well, there are many things that you can say about the Prime Minister, but this is Order. a man who is responsible Order. for when the Minister for Immigration some of the strongest border protection policies this country will ever see. And Mr President, as we move towards the next election, which as we know is in but a few months, again this question highlights the fundamental difference, the fundamental difference for all Australians of the attitude of the Australian Greens in coalition with the Australian Labor Party and the attitude of the coalition Order. government. Again, we will never make excuses for protecting Australia and Australians. Senator Thorpe, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, response. Again, the only people who came here legally were the people who came here 240 years ago on boats. What is the plan to release the remaining people who are being locked up and tortured at the park? Hotel 
prison. Minister. Mr President, I don't think there is a lot more that I can actually add to my answers because, again, Senator Thorpe, you actually show your disrespect for border protection policy in Australia by those comments. Governments are not torturing people, and any allegation that they are, as you know, is completely, totally Order. and utterly untrue. Order. Senator Patrick. Don't agree with torture. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate. I first called on the Government to consider the establishment of a Royal Commission inquiry into Australia's COVID-19 pandemic response more than seven months ago. Would you agree, now agree that it's imperative that a fully independent national inquiry able to identify all lessons to be learned and able to deliver authoritative findings to, give, uh, to guide, guide future policy is required? Will the government, uh, before the uh, pre-election caretaker period, commit to establishing a wide-ranging Royal Commission inquiry, fully empowered under the Royal Commission Act, to inquire into federal, state and territory government responses to the pandemic so that investigations can get underway by the middle of the year. If the government is not prepared to do, uh, do that now, will you uh, commit to doing so after the election, if you get into power? The Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. And I thank, uh, thank Senator Patrick for his question and Senator Abetz for his interjection before. Um, uh, Mr, uh, Mr President, um, the government continues, as, uh, as we've acknowledged along the way, to manage uh, the complicated responses to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and those responses are complicated by the fact that it continues to be uh, an evolving and changing situation. Uh, had, uh, indeed, for uh, example, a Royal Commission of the nature that Senator Patrick proposes delivered interim reports and findings ahead of the Omicron variant uh, becoming established and becoming the dominant variant, um, it would probably have different recommendations at that stage to what it would have today, because that is the nature of the changing circumstance we face in handling uh, a pandemic. And there will probably be uh, other changes to come. Uh, we have certainly subjected ourselves to review and scrutiny throughout our responses to the pandemic, uh, the, chair, the committee that Senator Gallagher chairs uh, being an important vehicle of that, along with the fact that, uh, that all of the other mechanisms of scrutiny have continued to be in place. Uh, I have no doubt that, uh, that there will be um, reviews uh, when we are able to put uh, the pandemic more squarely in the rearview mirror uh, and, uh, and that those reviews will need to entail a cooperative approach between the Commonwealth states and territories uh, around how we best prepare ourselves for future uncertainty and future disasters. But I would underline, um, Senator Patrick, the word uncertainty uh, in that regard, that, uh, that the next major global disruption uh, we face um, will almost unquestionably not be like the current one, and that, uh, that whilst there are lessons that we should continue to learn from this, I don't think anybody should pretend that a Royal Commission or any other particular inquiry will be a panacea uh, to answer Minister, all questions for the future. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary thank, question. Thank you. I'll take that as a no. Um, would you agree that any future inquiries into the government's COVID-19 pandemic response, whether it be a Royal Commission or other forms of inquiry, will require full, unrestricted access to the records of the Commonwealth, of Commonwealth departments and agencies. Accordingly, will the government direct the Director General of Archives to immediately issue, under the Archives Act, a records retention notice to all departments and agencies prohibiting them fr uh, from de destroying Commonwealth records or hard copies of documents relating to the COVID-19 pandemic? Sorry, Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, whilst, uh, whilst I don't uh, pretend to be an expert on the legalities of the, uh, of the Archives Act and the obligations that exist across Commonwealth agencies. Uh, I am fairly confident to say uh, that they are not destroying uh, records or documents that, uh, that would be uh, appropriately considered under any uh, future review or other arrangements. If there's a need to uh, add to that in terms of the, uh, 
uh, request you have made or the suggestion you have made, Senator Patrick, about an explicit um, order uh, being made and, uh, and whether that would provide any uh, additional uh, protection in, uh, in that regard. I'll bring further information to the chamber if that is necessary. Um, uh, in, uh, in terms of cooperation, if, uh, if an inquiry uh, is established, and as I said, I expect there will be not only plenty of reviews, but uh, obviously there will be many academic studies focusing on particular areas, all different areas of response to, uh, to the pandemic over the years to come, and certainly where there are reviews of government, we will cooperate for. Minister. Thank you, Minister. Senator Patrick, a second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr President. After three years, the government has failed to deliver a promised anti uh, Federal Anti-Corruption Commission. What current guarantees can you give that, that if re-elected, that you won't continue to duck scrutiny and accountability for the failures of the government's COVID-19 response, for the failure of border control and quarantine, the vaccine stroll out, the rats test kit shambles and the continuing tragedy in our aged care homes? Aren't those failures the reason why you won't support a Royal Commission? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Pre Mr President. Well, I, I completely reject uh, the many assertions that Senator Patrick has uh, made in his question. Uh, if we were to have uh, the type of fair income independent inquiry that, uh, that Senator Patrick uh, wants to speak of and it were to do a global comparison, I am confident it would find that in Australia uh, the fatality rates are some of the lowest in the world. The vaccination rates are some of the highest in the world. The employment outcomes and business security and safety and survival rates are some of the best in the world. Now, Mr. Mr President, as I have acknowledged, the Prime Minister has acknowledged, as Senator Colbeck and Minister Hunt have acknowledged, have we got absolutely everything right in a period of enormous global Order. uncertainty? No, we don't pretend that we have. Uh, and those uh, those uh, rearview mirror experts opposite, who, uh, who are experts in hindsight, uh, who of course Order. pretend uh, that, uh, that they would have got everything right, there's no chance that, uh, that they would have, nor has any other government around the world, got everything right. But we have done Minister. very well in Australia relative Minister. to many other countries, and we continue Minister. to respond Your as comprehensively as we can to— Minister. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. In March last year, a report from this minister's own aged care regulator warned that the Jeddah Gardens nursing home was not prepared for a COVID-19 outbreak and, I quote, had not minimised infection-related risks as it had not effectively planned or prepared for a potential outbreak of COVID-19. What action did this minister take in response? Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and, uh, the government, through the regulator, uh, issued some, a number of notices to uh, the provider and continued to work with the provider and uh, a number of follow-up visits to ensure that the provider did bring its response up to an appropriate level of standard. It took regulatory action, Mr. President, uh, in, uh, in September. Um, it took, put a non-compliance in notice in, in, in October uh, and on the 29th of November put a uh, notice to remedy, Mr President. So the Quality and Safety Commission actually undertook its role, which is continue to provide oversight to the provider, Mr President, to, in, to, to, to bring it, the, the service back to compliance, Mr President. And it Order. continues to do that, Mr President. And it continues to do that. That is the role that the Quality and Safety Commission has, Mr President. It, it has that independent legislative responsibility that the Labor Party voted for uh, to provide that level Order. of oversight to a provider and take appropriate compliance action to bring a service back into compliance, Mr President. And of course, the government can, has provided significant additional resources to the Quality and Safety Order. Commission to ensure that they have the capacity to do that, Mr. President. And that's what we will continue to do. We'll continue to work to improve the structure of the system, the resources of the system, particularly the Quality and Safety Commission, so that they can provide the relevant and appropriate oversight to the sector to ensure that all providers, all providers, Mr. President, are in compliance. And Mr. President, I will say this to any provider out there. 
be prepared for the fact that even though there is a pandemic on, the, the Quality and Safety Commission will continue to be focused on its work as it appropriately should. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The minister claims that Jetta Gardens was brought back to compliance, but yesterday reports emerged that chronic staff shortages at Jetta Gardens have forced 90-year-old residents to care for each other, that families were lied to about vaccinations and not informed their loved ones had COVID until they were dying, and that staff were asked to only change masks if you need to due to mask shortages. How could the minister fail Jetta Gardens residents so badly when he was twice warned that their safety was at risk? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I've Thank you, Mr. Order. President, uh, and I too have seen those re those reports. And Mr. President, that's why uh, that is why, Mr. President, additional quality uh, regulatory action has been taken against the uh, the provider, including uh, a notice to agree, which has required additional capacity to be uh, employed by the facility to ensure that it is providing uh, services to the residents there in accordance with. The, Order. in accordance with the quality standards, Mr. President. That is the role of the system. That is the role of the Quality and Safety Commissioner, and that's what the Commission has Senator done, Watt. Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I have to say I, like so many others, Mr. President, uh, am extremely disappointed in Senator the non-compliance of this Keneally. service, Mr. President. They need to retake responsibility for their role as an approved provider, Order. Mr. President, and I will ensure I will ensure that the Quality Commission Minister, does its role Minister, as an oversight. Your time has expired. Senator Watt, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. With 15 Jetta Gardens residents now tragically dead from COVID-19, after this minister was twice warned their safety was at risk, and 182 residents and staff infected with COVID. Does the minister still seriously believe the aged care system is not in crisis? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said a number of times this week, the sector in the aged care sector in Australia, due to COVID-19, due to a global pandemic, is under severe stress. Order. Is under severe stress, and, and nobody, nobody, Mr. President, nobody, President, Mr. President, has tried to, to deny that, Mr. President, uh, and we have. We have provided Senator every Watt. single resource that we possibly can. And Mr. President, I know that different people, and I'm not here to play word bingo with the Labor Party. I'm here to work with, with uh, the aged care sector Order. to resolve the issues and to assist them to work their way through the pandemic. While we work on the pandemic, Mr. President, the Labor Party play politics with the pandemic. That's what Order. they do. They, they are playing politics with the pandemic, and we are actively in action. Uh, in working on assisting the sector to get it, to, to work its way through the pandemic, providing them with the resources, whether it's surge workforce, whether it's PPE, whether it's rapid antigen tests, all of those things, Mr. President, to support the sector to get through the pandemic. Minister. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government's plan is securing Australia's pipeline of skilled workers now and into the future? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan uh, for his question. I mean, in particular, I acknowledge all the work that he did prior to becoming a senator uh, in relation to ensuring that Australians are upskilled, and in particular in our home state of Western Australia. Uh, Mr President, the Morrison-Joyce government, without our doubt, is a job-creating government. Uh, since we were elected in 2013, Order. over 1.7 million jobs have now been created. For context, we actually have had a population the size of South Australia, the size of South Australia, move into work over the last nine years. That is a great thing for the Australian people. The unemployment level, as we know, now sits at 4.2 per cent. It is now lower than when Labor was last in office. And of course, getting Australians into jobs is the focus of our policies when it comes to recovering from COVID-19. And Senator O'Sullivan, as you know, one of those focuses is investing in vocational education and training. Mr. President, 
Our investment in skills and training commenced when we were elected to office in 2013. It is now at record levels in Australia. In the past two years, the coalition government has invested around $12 billion into the skills and training system, and this year alone we're expecting a record $7.1 billion investment. And as we know, Mr President, as we move towards the election, it's important to remind ourselves what Labor did to vocational education and training when they were last in office. Because if you recall, they totally destroyed the reputation Order. of the vet sector. Colleagues, who can forget Labor's disastrous vet fee help system? Signing up students to courses that didn't exist and now costing the Australian taxpayer $2 billion in recrediting. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Mr President, I thank the minister for that answer. How has the government's plan for schools helped businesses take on more apprentices and to keep them on? Minister. Mr President, a number of the policies that we have put in place throughout COVID-19 have well and truly assisted businesses not just to take on more apprentices but to keep those apprentices that they have taken on. In terms of our boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, it has been an overwhelming success. The wage subsidy has put almost 277,000 Australians into an apprenticeship or traineeship. And that's in over 82,000 businesses. Mr. President, for those 277,000 Australians, what a fantastic step up for them into their new job. And of course, for those 82,000 businesses, to have that government investment in those apprentices and trainees has well and truly been reflected in the fact that the 277,000 are now in apprenticeships or traineeships. And Mr President, during uh, the pandemic, about 38 per cent of businesses have increased the number of apprentices Minister, that they have. your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the government working with states and territories to address their unique challenges in skills demand? Minister. Mr President, throughout COVID-19, we have worked with the states and territories, and in particular in relation to the skilled workforce and delivering the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Uh, you will recall uh, that we set up the Job Trainer Fund. This was a joint uh, lift funded between the states and the territories and the Commonwealth Government. It was a $2 billion job trainer program supporting over 400,000 free or low-cost training places in areas of demand. And Mr President, the key here was working with the states and territories to ensure that the investment that we were making together properly reflected the demand in the workplace. So the courses that you see that are offered by the individual states and territories, when people sign up to those free or low-cost courses, they know that the Morrison-Joyce government is supporting them into being upskilled in an area in which the labour market is saying you will get a job. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. I'll give senators a moment to clear the room before we move to taking. No, oh, sorry, Senator Wish Wilson. and aged care for an explanation as to why an answer has not been provided to question on notice number 86 asked during the 2021-22 supplementary budget estimates hearings of the Community Affairs Committee, the question related to the health-based guidance for PFAS chemicals. Minister. Oh, just a moment, Minister. I don't believe your microphone's on. Just try again. Again, I don't think it's yeah. like Thank you, Deputy President. Um, Senator, I don't have any specific advice in relation to that, but I do commit to coming back to you as quickly as possible in relation to the answer. I'm aware that you were going to ask uh, this information. I had sought advice from the okay. minister's office. I'll go back and uh, see what I can resolve yeah, as quickly as possible quick. for you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Um, Thank you for that, Senator Colbeck. But yes, we did contact your office to give you a heads up that this was coming, and uh, we have tried to do so multiple times. Um, this issue is very important, uh, Deputy President. Um, 
PFAS chemicals are in getting increasing focus uh, around the world uh, for their impact on health, uh, on agriculture uh, and on soil contamination right across uh, airports and other sites in the country. And sadly, they're making their way into our rivers uh, and into our waterways. Um, and the PFAS group of chemicals represent over 4,000 chemicals. We've been using them historically in a wide range of applications, but unfortunately they have many harmful effects. And their use in products such as firefighting foam has led them to entering the water supply and our food stream. Um, they're a major environmental problem that's being recognised all around the world. Um, they don't break down naturally, and they can be potentially highly toxic to a range of animals uh, habitat and ecosystems. Uh, now, many countries uh, have discontinued their use. Um, and what interests me is that while Commonwealth advice states that PFAS have not been proven to cause specific illnesses in humans, uh, other nations now are increasingly disagreeing. Notably, the United States EPA has stated that there is evidence that the exposure to PFAS can lead to adverse health count outcomes in humans. Um, and that the US EPA uh, only last month uh, has started a mo water monitoring program testing for PFAS around the nation. Uh, they've also released an epi epidemiological study of 69,000 people related to PFAS contamination uh, that has shown uh, kidney disease and testicular cancer. Um, in Michigan, uh, PFAS was found in beef after cattle were fed crops grown with fertiliser made from contaminated wastewater uh, biosolids. Uh, farms in Maine and New Mexico, including dairy operations, were forced to close after high levels of PFAS. Now, we're not immune to this kind of contamination. Just in my home state of Launceston, and this is particularly why I am actually pursuing this line of questioning with the minister, uh, we have publicly acknowledge PFAS contamination from Launceston Airport uh, in farmlands and in rivers, uh, including rivers that go through the town that are used for fishing, that are used for recreation, uh, and we still haven't got any answers from the minister. We've also seen Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden have signalled their intention to ban their manufacture of PFAS, um, and they have provided guidance for uh, PFAS in drinking water. Um, which are very different to the Australian guidance, hence my questions to the minister. Um, I note that there was one thing that the Greens asked the minister to provide, um, and a new epidemiological study that has just been released by ANU, uh, which, is, which is a positive. Now, just very briefly, the questions that we, we put to the minister, how often is the health-based guidance values for PFAS fact sheets uh, as available on the pfas.gov.au website updated, and when was the last time it was updated? No answer. The last date update about PFAS in the Australian Water Drinking Guidelines was in 2018, four years ago. Yet we see continued evidence growing about the health impacts of PFAS. Not good enough. When is the next update on PFAS envisaged? No answer. Why has there been no update since 2018? No answer. What priority areas, priority areas have been identified for PFAS health research by the Australian government since 2018? No answer. How much money has the Australian government invested in PFAS health research since 2018? No answer. How has the Australian government adapted its health advice considering the recent changes to guidance in the EU and US? No answer. Um, now, of course, we have asked these questions previously at estimates. Uh, no answer on the night, so we put Thank questions on notice. You. And still, uh, way beyond uh, the due date, we've received no answers from the minister. Um, may I say, uh, Deputy President, to conclude, look, I understand Senator Colbeck's been under a lot of pressure lately. Um, yes, he, it's a very serious thing when this chamber, uh, when the opposition calls for the resignation of a minister. It's only something I've seen uh, less than a handful of times in my 10 years in this place. And I remember a day when it was actually an extremely serious thing for all of us to call for the resignation of a minister. But we have seen repeated failures by Senator Colbeck in his department. Um, and I was gobsmacked when I learnt that he didn't appear before the Senate committee to provide not only information to the committee at a crucial time, but information that could have been of comfort 
to senior Australians who were really doing it tough during COVID, many of them alone, many of them anxious, many of them suffering, and sadly, too many of them dying from this virus. And the minister goes to the cricket. Well, perhaps that's why he can't provide or hasn't been able to put a rocket under the department to get answers for us today, even after we have repeatedly reached out and asked for those answers today. It's simply not acceptable, uh, and I hope the minister can get a hurry on, because, as is plainly obvious, we have very limited parliamentary time this year to get the answers to these critical questions. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson uh, to take note of answers to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 2020 and to 2021 additional estimates, questions on notice numbers 135, 6501, and 519 to 531, inclusive, placed on the notice paper through the Finance and Public Administration Committee in the PM and C portfolio, remain unanswered. Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Gallagher, for uh, for her question. Um, as I've observed a few times in uh, in the life of uh, this Parliament over the last year, uh, there have been. Um, not dozens, not hundreds, not thousands, but tens of thousands of questions that have, questions that have filtered through um, and the parliamentary proceedings of, uh, of this chamber, the other chamber, uh, of estimates committees, of different uh, select and standing committees uh, that, uh, that the government has received uh, and overwhelmingly that the government has worked through uh, responses to. Um, uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that uh, with uh, what is a flow of questions um, that is, uh, is um, uh, more, not just more than was received in the last parliament, uh, but as I understand, more than was received in the previous couple of parliaments combined. Um, you know, there are challenges in working through all of them. Um, some questions uh, come with additional sensitivities, including in some cases legal sensitivities, uh, to uh, to be worked through, um, and sometimes that adds time to uh, to the responses there. So, uh, whilst I am sure, as is relatively predictable in these debates, that uh, that a raft of criticisms will follow about the timeliness of responses to questions and, uh, and so on. Deputy President, uh, I, would, uh, I would note and contend uh, that in terms of the government's responsiveness to the sheer volume of questions and accountability by responding uh, to such large numbers of questions, we've demonstrated uh, a very strong and significant effort uh, in, uh, in our accountability uh, through the, uh, the term of this parliament um, and will, of course, continue to make best endeavours in relation to the many questions that, uh, that we continue uh, to, uh, to receive on a regular basis. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Um, under Standing Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation from the Minister. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. And the Minister is absolutely right that there will be criticism of the government's failure to answer these questions. These are important questions, and it seems to be, and the defence from the Minister for Finance is the same defence that he used in December when I asked the, when I followed up the failure to answer these questions, which is essentially that a lot of questions have been asked, um, and therefore that's why a lot of questions remain unanswered. That is essentially the government's uh, defence. Well, on this day of all days, when Ms. Brittany Higgins has addressed the nation, um, again has, has spoken about her experience here. These questions relate to that. They, they date back to questions that I asked and are now 278 days overdue. It's not like I've been harassing the government to answer these. They were they were expected to be answered by the 7th of May, I think, in 2021. That was the due date. We've now 278 days overdue. We have had two estimates rounds in the intervening period. I have written to the Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet on the 13th of October last year, asking where the answers to these questions are and, and indeed whether they're giving him the opportunity to say whether there are 
specific reasons why these questions can't be answered, if, if that is an additional defence by the government. And Secretary Gaitchens has, hasn't even bothered to answer. I mean, who would have thought that the head of the Prime Minister's department, the central agency, refuses to even acknowledge, let alone reply, to a letter, a polite letter asking where the answers uh, to these questions might be. But that's the state of the level of accountability and transparency that exists in this government. I would argue the lowest level of accountability and transparency. They may have answered questions, they may have been asked lots of questions, but I can tell you if they were a little more open and transparent and provided a little bit more information and didn't fight and withhold so much information, maybe there would be fewer questions asked. And maybe if they answered questions and not used um, the opportunity to answer as merely a way to fob people off, I have so many questions where the answers provided by this government don't even bother to, to answer the question. Like, you know, can you provide this? Can you provide A? The answer will be, here's an orange. You know, like that is the quality that we get, and that is the disrespect that is shown uh, to this Senate. And when I look back, these are the questions that were asked. And, and Ms Higgins, I didn't get the opportunity to go to the press club today, of which I'm deeply um, sorry. Uh, I would have liked to have been there, but um, I, I caught a little bit on the TV, and I, I heard Ms Higgins say that she was still confronted by the fact uh, it's linked to the, the text message that we all know exists, where, where the Deputy Prime Minister messaged uh, through a third party, Ms Higgins, to basically say he thought the Prime Minister was a liar and a hypocrite, and she alluded to that to being about his state of knowledge of what had happened to her and how that had kind of been brushed over in the hoo-ha over the text message, that the substance of what was being hidden there or, or not acknowledged was that the Deputy Prime Minister seems to be agreeing that the Prime Minister knew more than he was letting on. And my questions, which are now 278 days overdue, go to that point. Remember the Gaitchens inquiry that got started up when the Prime Minister couldn't go and ask his staff who knew what and when? Uh, he had to create an inquiry, a specific inquiry, and then after the heat moved on, remember that inquiry just got suspended and then nobody talked about it anymore. Well, nobody's heard anything back from that. I have questions around what the Prime Minister knew about Brittany Higgins' alleged rape in this building and when. I had questions about the relocation of Ms Higgins to a different office after her disclosure. I had questions about the Gaitchen's inquiry into who knew what when in the Prime Minister's office. Whether, for example, Mr Gaitchens could tell us how many interviews he's done and how they were conducted. About media inquiries leading up to the breaking of Ms Higgins' story and who was involved with handling them and what were they told. Questions about whether or not the Prime Minister's staff backgrounded journalists against Ms Higgins' partner. About the contact between the Prime Minister's principal private secretary and Ms Higgins following the airing of the Four Corners inside the Canberra Bubble story. And there were also questions about correspondence with the Federal Police Commissioner, contact between Ms. Minister Dutton and the Prime Minister's office, the departure of the alleged perpetrator, and slurs ba made by Minister Reynolds about Ms Higgins. Now, I can see why the government doesn't want to answer these questions. I get that. But to just not provide any answer or any explanation is, is just not acceptable. It treats the Senate with contempt. It makes a mockery of the conventions of this place and the powers of the Senate to hold governments to account, to scrutinise 
the workings of government, and there is no consequence for this. Like it's easier for the government to not answer at all. It's easier for Secretary Gaitchens to ignore a letter from a senator pursuing his department about their failure to answer questions asked at estimates about a year ago now. It is easier and more beneficial to the government to act in this way than it is to answer them. And that's the sorry state of how this government treats this chamber. You know, the minister says there's plenty of avenues available for accountability and transparency. Yeah, but it does require the government to play their part, which is to provide information or, if they refuse to answer, to provide an explanation. And this, the issues that are raised in my questions go, go straight to the fundamentals of the standard of this government and the standard that the Prime Minister sets in leading it. Because I presume he's okay with these questions not being answered. You know, I presume Secretary Gaitjens isn't going to get a call from the PMO today and say, oh, I've just been listening into the, um, the chamber that deals with accountability and transparency, and they're saying that you, well, you haven't answered something for nearly a year now. You better get on to that. I doubt that's going to happen because that's, that is the culture of this government. It's to hide things. It's to sweep things under the carpet. It's to delay. It's to distract. It's to pretend. And at times, it's to not tell the truth. I mean, that's the reality. We've all been learning that over the past few months. When the Prime Minister's closest colleagues and world leaders bell the cat and tell, tell us all what he's really like, and here is it, just another example of it. You know, I get that governments don't, are busy. I completely accept that. And I accept they have a lot on their plate at times. At the moment, they've got more than they probably need, much of it self-inflicted. But that doesn't take away the responsibility a government has to protect and uphold the conventions of the parliament. And that is what's been let go here. And the Senate hasn't really shown its capability or capacity to stand up and push back against that. Oh, I think that's deeply regrettable, uh, but it's subject uh, for another day. But these questions are important. They're important for us to understand what happened in this place. We're all talking about how we want to make this place a better place. And in fact, yesterday the Prime Minister said, I want this building to be a place where young Australians and young women in particular can follow their dreams and live out their beliefs and not have them crushed by brutally, brutality and the misuse of power. That's the quote from yesterday. Well, part of living up to that, surely, is to fess up to what happened in this building when Ms Higgins' alleged rape occurred and the, t the period after that. And this time last year, when the government was on the back foot and was trying to deal with the fallout of Ms Higgins going public. That is what these questions are about. 18 questions that day after day, week after week, month after month and soon to be year, the government ignores and fails to answer. And As I said, we, know, we understand completely why it's the government's preference to do that, but it is disrespectful. It is disrespectful to Ms Higgins. It flies in the face of the work that we're all trying to do around the Jenkins inquiry, because what it says is it's easier not to answer these, to not front up to what happened, to not be honest about who knew what when and what was done and whether nothing was done. Ms Higgins certainly feels that her treatment following her disclosures to Ms. Uh, Minister Reynolds and others that she was treated poorly. Well, the government 
has the opportunity to answer these questions and put up their side of the story. Today's defence by the um, Minister for Finance, and you know, I know Minister Birmingham. He's a de fundamentally decent person, and I, you know, as you stand up and give your explanation, you know, there's a part of me that thinks it shouldn't be you doing this; it should be the Prime Minister answering for this. But it's it's insincere and disrespectful to say, well, there's a lot of questions and therefore we've answered some and not others, and for us to presume that the 18 questions asked about Ms Higgins and her experience here and what happened here at the heart of the government um, can just be ignored, hopefully for the duration of this term, and then they lapse. That's the sorry state that we're in. The government's failed to provide an adequate explanation. I hope that uh, Secretary Gaitchens is listening and perhaps he could be bothered, you know, considering the big bucks that are going on over there in PM and C, to actually respond to my letter of October and explain why those questions aren't being answered, or perhaps he has a resource issue, I don't know, he could tell me, or if they are going to be answered, answer them prior to PM&C appearing at estimates uh, next Monday, where we will be pursuing uh, this matter. I think, at a minimum, Secretary Gaitchens uh, could be bothered doing that. It would be appreciated, and any um, any mode or push that um, Minister Birmingham could provide to that department to do the job that they are resource to do uh, would be appreciated as well. But it is a really sorry state, I have to say, that we stand here uh, using the precious time of the Senate uh, to explain why questions that were asked 258 days ago still need to be followed up. It's, this place should be afforded more decency and respect by the government. Thank you. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to taking note. Senator Billett. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Senators Keneally and Gallagher earlier today. We know that aged care, the aged care sector, is in crisis. It is a word that we can't get the minister to, to say. Uh, in fact, in question time today, he said it was in severe stress. It's worse than severe stress. It is crisis. And I've got to say, I despair of the minister and his ability to be able to deal with the ongoing issues. He's completely mismanaged and shown his incompetence by his actions in regard to the aged care crisis that the sector is facing. In fact, he's completely stuffed it, to be honest. It's four key areas that, are, you know, that concern this side of the chamber. Obviously, boosters, the lack of PPE, people be get, be, being sent the wrong PPE um, when they've asked for PPE, PPEs, the rats, well, we know they couldn't give a rat, so you know, that's not new to anybody, and the surge workforce. And we've got the aged care workers who are so overworked and underpaid that, as we heard earlier today in question time, they're working 80 hours a week. A lot of them are working 80 hours a week. That's not sustainable. This industry, although I haven't worked in it, I know from my friends who actually work in it, is a very physical industry. It's also emotionally challenging for the workforce. You know, they're not just dealing with people that might pop along to a surgery and have a little sniffle. They've got to lift people. They've got to turn people. They have to deal with people with mental health issues, with dementia, with all sorts of issues. Some of those people have been basically locked up for weeks and weeks and weeks on end and not being able to see their families, people having to die without their families present. And what have we got? 
We've got lip service from the government that really, as I said, um, humour aside, could not give a rat's. They could not give a rat's. And these workers, they deserve our respect. And what else they deserve is a decent pay for what they do. A lot of them are only earning $22 an hour. Can earn more being a gardener. Can earn more being a cleaner in someone's home. It's atrocious that we are treating people that look, are looking after one of the most vulnerable people in our um, society, that they're underpaid, that they're being treated like rubbish by this government, no care whatsoever. And then we wonder, well, we don't on this side, we know why, wonder why it's hard to retain workers in the industry. As I said, even before you consider the pressures brought about by the industry. Our aged care workers, and I want to say this off the front, have been doing amazing work, amazing work under such difficult conditions. And they are the heroes of this pandemic. And just as they are the heroes, the villain is Minister Colbeck. Minister Colbeck, who decided that it was better to go to three days at the cricket than to deal with the issues facing the aged care crisis, than to attend a Senate inquiry or a joint inquiry into um, COVID. This is despite the fact that the committee had said to him, we will meet at a day and time at your convenience. And you know what? They only wanted two hours and 45 minutes of his time. But no, Senator Colbeck, Minister Colbeck could not give that two minutes and 45. Because why? Because <coughs> Minister Colbeck was at the cricket enjoying hospitality. I mean, seriously, they could have found him a room over there. I know what the cricket ground's like. I live in Hobart. I've been over there. They could have found him a nice, quiet little room he could have set up. He could have done it. But he didn't want to, and that's because he's embarrassed, as he should be. He should be hanging his head in shame about the treatment all through COVID of the aged care sector. I'll tell you, I'm surprised he even turns up because, truly, more front than my to turn up and say the, the, the um, sector is under severe stress. It's worse than severe stress. It's in crisis. And we've Thank got a you, minister. Senator Billick. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Deputy President, these questions go to aged care, and uh, I think it's uh, quite fair, actually, for me to say that Labor's record on this issue of aged care is actually patchy at best. Patchy at best. Their record on health overall is, in fact, very poor. We only need to look back at their history when they were in government to, to see that. Uh, so far be it from. Uh, from them to, to come into this place and, and lecture us, lecture this government, who have uh, done a remarkable job in particular in collaboration with the states over the last two years to uh, weather and deal with the uh, issues of health related to the pandemic. And of course, uh, I, even, you know, I could go on about the, the, uh, the way the economy is, is tracking in Australia right now compared to the rest of the world, but on health we are uh, we are arguably in the most enviable position of anywhere else on the planet uh, in regards to that. Now, a lot of uh, senior Australians uh, were impacted by the failures uh, of, of Labor to uh, continue to support uh, their, their lack of failure to continue to support the, the PBS, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. Well, we, on this side of government, have listed a record number of drugs on the PBS, supporting all Australians, and in particular, of course, we know that in particular older Australians have uh, a greater need for, for drugs that are listed on the PBS. And it's our management of the economy, keeping uh, the economy strong and have a, a balanced budget or a budget that's able to support the uh, listing of these medicines on there, that has meant that older Australians, in particular, have been very well supported. Uh, since 2013, the coalition has approved nearly 3,000 new or amended listings on the PBS. This represents an average of around 30 listings or amendments per month, or one each day, an overall investment by the government of $14 billion. 
dollars. Now we do acknowledge, we do acknowledge that there are issues in the aged care sector, and that's why, uh, in particular, right now we've provided uh, 80,000 shifts of surge workforce around Australia. Uh, we've not spared any expense to support the sector, and that's why we've recognised the sector with special payments, the $800 bonus payment. Now I just want to pay tribute to those that are working in the aged care sector. Now I've, uh, I've been surrounded by uh, family that have worked in this space. My grandmother, she's now retired, uh, one of the most special persons in my life. Uh, she worked in the aged care sector for pretty much her entire career. My sister uh, works in the aged care sector. She's a nurse, registered nurse there in a, in a wonderful uh, um, uh, facility in the south of Perth, and uh, you know I know that uh, aged care workers are some of the most dedicated uh, people. They do the job because they love the job. We acknowledge that uh, you know they're not the highest paid occupations, uh, and they turn up every day because they care about their job. They care about the people that they're serving, and they really do make a difference. And I know they're they're rewarded by. Uh, the fact that they're doing wonderful, wonderful work. But we recognise that they have been under-challenged uh, over this last uh, period, and uh, the government, in, in recognising that and, or importantly, helping those employers, uh, the service providers, to uh, retain staff, uh, having gone through the fatigue of dealing with uh, uh, particularly the pandemic, uh, it's important that they're able to retain as many staff members as they can. Uh, this $800 bonus payment uh, spread across a couple of payments is is uh, is aimed at, at really helping them to address that. Now uh, it's interesting. There were questions that went to uh, wages, and uh, uh, the, the Labor Party, at least here in the Senate, uh, they they probably need to just check their notes with what gets said in in the other place because uh, uh, Minister Albanese actually said. Uh, actually says that uh, he supports the process of going through the Fair Work Commission, because that's the commission that they set up, that Labor actually set up. It's under that framework that we now have this position where uh, it's an independent process. Now, Anthony Albanese, the, 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 the leader of the opposition, has not provided any, co any uh, amount that he'll go to in, uh, if he was leader of the government. Uh, he hasn't said what it would cost. He hasn't said what impact he would make. Why is that? Because he's just all about politics. He's all just about presenting a political narrative rather than actually addressing the issue. If he named a price, then he'd have to cost it. But he doesn't want to do that ahead of election Thank because you, his Senator cost things are Your always time unfunded. Has expired. Senator Smith. Deputy President, the aged care sector is in crisis. It is. That is clear for everyone to see. It's clear when you talk to aged care workers, as I have, as I know all my colleagues have, but even if you haven't been bothered to go talk to the workforce and understand what's happening on the ground in their workplaces at the moment, a quick scan of the news headlines will show you the state the sector's in. The number of people dying will show you that the sector is in crisis. The reports of workers under stress and under strain, the choices they are being forced to make every single day when they go into their workplace, about which of the residents in their care who need their urgent attention they tend to. These reports are not hard to find. In fact, you've heard them today in question time. You can look at the rollout of boosters, see the significant and critical shortages of jabs in arms, jabs which keep people safe. It is not hard to see that this is a sector in crisis. It is not hard. And indeed, if you are willing to spend the time playing the word games to prove that it is not, May I suggest you spend that time talking to a nurse, talking to a worker in aged care, because they are at breaking point. They go into work every day trying to care for the residents who have served our country, who have been part of our community, who deserve to spend this time in their life living in dignity. And these workers 
who want to provide that to those in their care do not have the support from the minister. They do not have the support from the government that they need to do their jobs, jobs which they are paid a pittance for, $22 an hour, and then a government who won't even stand up and make a submission on their behalf. A government who doesn't care. A minister who goes to the cricket and then comes in here and argues word games around whether or not this sector is in crisis. This sector is in crisis. People are dying. Workers are struggling. This is a crisis. And it deserves the full attention of the minister. It deserves a minister who shows up to work, who shows up to the committee which is there to hold him accountable, who shows up to this parliament and doesn't go into the ridiculous politics and word games which distract and run down the clock on his answers in question time. <coughs> These workers deserve so much more from this government. They deserve more than thanks. They deserve to be paid properly for the work that they do. They deserve to be supported by a broader workforce amongst them, by, by shifts being filled. They deserve to be supported by having the boosters that will protect them when they go into their workplace each day. And they shouldn't have to make the kind of choices that they have to make every single day. They shouldn't have to make choices about which resident in pain or in distress or in need to go to. But they have to make these choices because there aren't enough staff in this workforce. There isn't enough support from the government. Denying it's in crisis, it's an absurd thing to come in here and do. This sector has been struggling for long, long before this pandemic. The Royal Commission report was entitled Neglect. That was before the pandemic. And you overlay these issues on top of a sector which was struggling that much. And then you take a minister and a government more interested in the politics than supporting the workers caring for our elderly, caring for our age, making devastating choices every single day. Those workers deserve so much better, as does every single Australian in aged care. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. There's some uh, truth in, uh, at the end there of Senator Smith's contribution that I'd like to agree with. There is no doubt that the aged care centre uh, has been uh, under a lot of stress uh, uh, before uh, the pandemic. There is no doubt that uh, there needs to be more funding uh, for aged care in this country. Uh, and of course, uh, a pandemic, which uh, no one uh, could have predicted the timing of, uh, was always going to put uh, much stress on, on that system. Uh, the government, this government, though, uh, has uh, responded to, as uh, Senator Smith the long, said, the long years of neglect, the years of neglect going back. Uh, through previous governments uh, of both sides of politics. But it has been this government that commissioned uh, a royal commission uh, into look at the state of the aged care centre, centre, uh, sector, warts and all, warts and all. And it is this government that is responding to that commission with record amounts of additional funding over the years to come. Of course, not every problem or issue can be solved overnight. The problems have emerged over many decades uh, and therefore cannot uh, be solved in, in a year or two. Uh, that extra funding will have an impact over time, and I'll come to that later. But before I get to that detail, I did want to acknowledge uh, the commitment, uh, the hard work, and, and the stress uh, that uh, aged care workers must have gone through over the past two years. It was already uh, a strained and stressful environment for workers in that sector, um, but to have the extra uh, uh, obligations uh, of being COVID safe, to have the uh, extra staff pressures of isolation rules and COVID cases uh, has, of course, um, put those people on the front lines under great strain. I pay tribute uh, to the work they have done. And in, in, in tough times, I believe they've done, that sector as a whole, has done the best it could uh, to handle this once in a century 
pandemic. Uh, there does need to be more funding to improve aged care centres in this country. Uh, 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 there does need to be more money available to attract staff and uh, potentially increase wages over time to, to do that, uh, to keep up with the offers that exist now and through the NDIS. That's been another uh, care sector that has been well funded by this government. Uh, uh, that is putting competition there for these types of staff in aged care centres. And, and we have to respond by offering attractive employment options uh, to those that love and want to continue to work in the aged care sector as well. That's why the government is putting forward $18 billion of funding in response to the Royal Commission. Uh, uh, that this is going to make a difference over time. So it's not going to happen overnight, but we have, through the pandemic, put an additional $600 million into bonuses for staff in the sector to provide an immediate top-up. But the long, over, the longer term, over the longer term, what we need to do is grow incrementally the funding that exists in the aged care pool such that providers, uh, both public and private, can offer uh, a reasonable and competitive wage uh, to those who work in the sector. Now, there have been suggestions from the other side of this debate that somehow, somehow the government should, or Canberra bureaucrats here, uh, should, should impose these wages, should just automatically or or unilaterally increase wages across the sector. That's not how our industrial relations systems work, nor should it be how it works, because almost invariably we'll get it wrong here in Canberra. We'll stuff it up. We'll stuff it up. If we try and centrally plan every aged care sector in the country, there'll be enormous perverse outcomes. We'll have uh, uh, um, some wage rates inapplicable for some types of work or some centres in regional areas, and there'll be devastation across the land. What we need to do is respect the industrial relations framework we have through the Fair Work Commission and have, and have viable, well-funded aged care centres that can respond to that process. That's we saw during question time. We saw that the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, knows how that, that system works. That's what he said in response to it, that we need to let the Fair Work Commission work. But the Opposition didn't want to hear. They tried to silence. The opposition tried to silence the leader, their own leader, the leader of the opposition in question time. Every time the minister tried to express and say, hey, look, this is what Mr Albanese, the leader of the opposition, thinks, how the system works, this is what he believes, no the Labor Party would get up and say, oh, I don't the support of order, they're quoting our leader. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Why are you quoting Mr Albanese? They tried to shut it down. But I do agree with Mr Albanese on this point that what we need to do here is have a flexible uh, approach. Uh, to this industry, which provides well fund funding but allows individual aged care centres to work with their workforces and their customers and uh, the um, aged uh, members of the Australian community to get the best outcomes we can during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, Minister Colwack told us today in this chamber that he will hold others to account. He will hold to account the Quality and Safety Commission. He will hold to account aged care providers. He will hold to account the opposition. But what he didn't do and what he refused to do was to acknowledge his responsibilities, acknowledge the failures, acknowledge the lack of care and support over the pandemic by this government. The pandemic is not a surprise. We've been at this since 2019, early 2019. Yet we are seeing this crisis continue because, yes, aged care is in crisis. But this government is incapable of planning, incapable since 2019 of seeing what devastation can occur with vulnerable people. So they are incapable of protecting our vulnerable people. Where were the vaccines to minimise the impact? Where was the PPE to stop the spread? Where was the plan to protect our vulnerable older people? The aged care sector is in crisis, and the most crucial issue over time has been that of the workforce, to have sufficient trained people to look after our vulnerable older people. The current crisis and chronic shortages are a result of almost nine long, long years of neglect. This government in 2013 killed off a workforce compact that was negotiated by Labor to improve the wages of aged care staff. The work done by Labor while in government 
included a revamp of aged care, significant changes to protect older people, to provide choices for older people, to improve the wages of staff doing vitally important work in the aged care sector. And when this government came in in 2013, they scrapped some of the most critical aspects of that reform. And we are seeing the result of that right now. Chronic staff shortages. We have older people in residential air, air, aged care facilities right now living in unbearable conditions. Why? Because the pandemic has meant that the staff shortages have got situations where we have staff looking after up to 60 people. And we heard earlier, where do they go? There's someone fallen over. There's somebody soiled. There's somebody who needs to be fed. There's somebody having a, a medical situation. How do they appropriate their time when they are looking after 60 people at a time? It is an unconscionable situation. It is a situation that could have been planned for. It is a situation that, as Australians, we should all be embarrassed about. The standard of care for residents has plunged to alarming new lows, partly because there are staff shortages and partly because we are not looking appropriately at the running of the aged care sector. More than 500 people in aged care have died during COVID. This is a completely unacceptable situation. And all we have is Minister Colbeck standing in front of us today, not taking any responsibility, defending the fact that he spent three days at the cricket, defending the fact that he hasn't met with various people to deal with this crisis, that he has consistently not taken responsibility. The aged care minister says that the sector is not in crisis, but just about everyone living in it and working in it and looking at it says that it is. People deserve better. Our older people deserve better. When the AMA advised in September of 2021 that there was trouble coming, that there was going to be greater challenges with the new variant, Omicron particularly, um, came to bear on that, the government did nothing. They didn't plan. They didn't think about how they were going to protect vulnerable people in this country. They just went about their business, went to the cricket, paid no attention. This situation is a disgrace, and we should all be ashamed of the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you, Senator Grogan. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Bullock to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the minister representing the Minister of Home Affairs' response to my questions. Thank you. I asked about innocent people seeking refuge who are locked up at the Park Hotel prison. Now, let me make this very clear. They came not in contravention of border protection rules, as the minister uh, made out. And may I remind you that our international obligation is to grant protection to people seeking asylum and granted refugee status. The only disrespect that has occurred in question time today is by this government's inhumane treatment of people seeking refuge in this country. How can this government claim that this is not locking people up? Locked in one room for up to nine years. A young fella's been in there since he was 15. It's heartbreaking. He's locked up. He spent his adult life. He's still there. 
His whole adult life has been in a hotel room against his will, being tortured by the Australian government. Tortured. He peeks out the window with a sign saying, help me, please, let me out. I need fresh air. I want to talk to people. I want to see people. I need food, fresh food, not stale bread. And we've even heard about maggots in food. I just can't believe we live in a country that continues to deny people's human rights and continues to terrorise innocent young people and take away their dignity and their human rights. What kind of people are we as a country if we can do that to a 15-year-old who's still in a room for nine years locked away by the Australian government? I'm sure everyone knows how lockdown has been for us in our homes, with our families, with fresh food. You can go to the park with your dog sometimes. Can you just think for one moment what these people, these innocent people who came here seeking our help, think about them for one moment when you're in lockdown? Because they don't have the freedoms that you have. They certainly don't have the privilege that you have. Imagine nine years in your room, in your room, as, as privileged as it might be, still nine years in there, and you holding a sign to the window saying, please let me out. This government has no empathy. I don't know what empathy training was done, but maybe we need to improve the training because there's certainly no regard for human rights. There's certainly no regard for the decent treatment of innocent human beings. I've stood outside the Park Hotel as what you would say is an activist or a protester. But I stood outside that hotel with elders, non-Aboriginal elders, who were crying, who were in pain, seeing the pain in these, people, in, in these innocent people's eyes when they looked down to you from their window, begging to be free. This is not about activists. This is about freedom you, for innocent Senator people. Thorpe, um, your time has expired. So the question is that we take note of the um, motion moved by Senator Thorpe. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? President, Senator uh, Dunningham. Thanks, Madam, uh, Madam Deputy President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have those statements incorporated in Hansard. Um, do you want me to leave granted? I'm giving notice now. So uh, the minister's given notice and he's seeking leave. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. 
On behalf of Senator Rennick, I withdraw General Business Notice of Motion No. 1261, standing in his name for today, proposing the establishment of a select committee. Thank you. Senator Waters, are you seeking the call? Are you are perhaps withdrawing a disallowance? Uh, yes, I believe I am, but I don't have the appropriate shit for that. But I withdraw the disallowance, which I think is uh, number six, business of the Senate notice of motion. But I might stand corrected momentarily. Business of the Senate notice number five. Number five. I'll just double check that. Perhaps you could come back to me, President. Alrighty. Uh, there any, is there a desire? Uh, I now proceed to placing a business. Is there a desire to postpone or rearrange the business? Uh, Senator McGrath, are you seeking the call? Oh, no, I'm not. Um. Clark. Postponement notifications have been received in relation to business of a Senate notice of motion number three for today to the 29th of March 2022 and general business notice of motion 1303 in the name of Senator McKim to the 10th of February 2022. I remind senators the question you put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Senator Waters, were you seeking to proceed with your withdrawal now? Yes, thanks, President. I did give notice of an intention to withdraw one of the business of the Senate notices of motion yesterday, and that is the one that I wish to proceed with withdrawing today. Thank you very much. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on 1 January 2022 of the Honourable Sir Ransley Victor Vic Garland KBE, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Curtin, Western Australia from 1969 to 1981. I call on the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Sir Victor Garland. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Mr President, I move that the Senate expresses its sadness at the death on 1 January 2022 of the Honourable Sir Victor Garland KBE, former Minister for Supply, Minister for Post and Telecommunications, Minister for Veterans Affairs and Minister for Special Trade Representations and former member for Curtin, places on record its gratitude for his service to Parliament and Nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Mr President, we take the opportunity here today to remember the life of the former member for Curtin, Sir Ransley Victor Garland KBE, a man who served as a minister in the McMahon and Fraser governments and who would go on to become the Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Sir Victor Garland was first elected into the parliament as the member for Curtin in 1969, a seat he would represent until his resignation from the House of Representatives in 1981. During this time, he was re-elected at six different elections by the people of Curtin, a vote of confidence in his ability to effectively represent the beachside Perth electorate. Victor was a West Australian through and through. Born in 1934, he grew up in Perth, gaining his education at Hale School before completing a Bachelor of Arts at the University of Western Australia, majoring in economics. Following in his father's footsteps, Victor practised as a chartered accountant from 1958 until his election to parliament in 1969. During his professional life, Victor maintained an active involvement in the community he grew up in, serving on a number of charities and on the Claremont Town Council from 1963 until 1970. During this time, he also maintained an active involvement in the Liberal and Country League of Western Australia, later of course known as the WA Division of the Liberal Party of Australia, where he held the position of Senior Vice President. Following his election to the Parliament in 1969, in his first speech to the House of Representatives, Victor paid tribute to the sacrifices of his parents and the opportunities he had that he was fortunate enough to have by virtue of their hard work. He acknowledged former Prime Minister John Curtin, after whom his electorate was named, and his predecessor, as the member for Curtin, Sir Paul Hasluck, the 17th Governor-General of Australia. Sir Victor strongly admired the contributions these two sons of Western Australia made, perhaps foreshadowing a way of his own immense contributions to come. Sir Victor was a man that knew what he had come to Parliament to fight for, highlighting in his maiden speech that whilst he believed his electors 
wanted, to have, wanted him to have an eye to the interests not only of Curtin but of Western Australia when those interests are rightly involved in the national interest. He further added, I think my electors want me to act in the interests of Australia, in which each state is an integral part of the Federation, an Australian nation with rising strength, importance and responsibilities. So Victor Garland understood at core the meaningful impact of our shared liberal values in the economic and social prosperity of Australia. Those basic tenets of individual freedom and free enterprise, that businesses and individuals are the true creators of wealth and employment. He highlighted this in his maiden speech, stating that, and I quote, it is as important to the growth of the country that initiative, inventiveness and resourcefulness should be encouraged as it is to, as it is to have a fair sharing of the nation's wealth. For history shows that the best societies, the richest, the most efficient and the most satisfying in which to live are those in which individual initiative is allowed a wide scope of expression and where innovation, striving and ambition are not stifled. Sir Victor had a quick rise in his political journey, becoming the Minister for Supply in the McMahon government at the age of just 37, a position he would hold from 1971 until the 1972 election. In 1975, after the coalition's historic victory, Victor Garland was again appointed as the minister, this time for post and telecommunications and as the assistant treasurer. The latter position provided him with a primary role in forming economic policy at a critical time for the newly elected Fraser government. Under Malcolm Fraser's leadership, Victor would also serve as minister for veterans affairs, minister for special trade representations and minister for business and consumer affairs. As Minister for Special Trade Representations, Victor Garland undertook significant negotiations with the European community, something of which I can relate and understand the challenges that can equally be involved. This was work he also continued in his post-politics work upon his appointment as Australia's High Commissioner to Britain, a position he held from 1981 to 1983. A testament to his contributions and service at the highest level of public office, Victor Garland was knighted in 1982. Sir Victor Garland is remembered for the liberal values he not just believed in but lived out in his approach to public policy. In the same way that Sir Victor honoured those that came before him, the sacrifices of the men and women that built Australia, we honour Sir Victor for his contributions to our nation. He was a proud Western Australian, proud of where he came from, who believed in the infinite potential of Australia emphasised by his powerful words that no one will now dare say that any objective is not possible for Australia. Indeed, that is true, Mr President. Uh, any objective is possible for our nation, our nation with ambition, with so much pride in all that we seek to achieve. On behalf of the Australian Government and the Australian Senate, I extend our sincerest condolences uh, to Sir Victor Garland's family uh, and our thanks for his service uh, to our party uh, and to the nation. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I rise on behalf of the opposition to express our condolences following the passing of the Honourable Sir Ransley Victor Garland KBE, a former minister, and I note that he passed at the age of 87. And as I begin, I wish to convey the opposition's condolences to his family and to his friends. Sir Victor Garland, who I understand was widely known as Vic, lived a life that combined contributions to the private sector with public service. He went from local government to federal government, serving as a minister under Prime Ministers William McMahon and Malcolm Fraser. And from this platform, he would go on to represent the nation as High Commissioner in London, before contributing extensively as a member of private company boards in the United Kingdom and returning to Perth 15 years ago. He was not easily characterised as either a progressive or a conservative within his party. He instead took a pragmatic and constructive approach to politics and to policy, and he routinely sought to make the best of whatever opportunity he had. He was born in 1934 and he grew up in Perth. An alumnus 
of a state primary school, the prestigious Hale School and the University of Western Australia, from which he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts majoring in economics, he entered the accounting profession. And in doing so, he followed in the footsteps of his father, practising as a chartered accountant from 1958 until he entered the federal parliament. At the same time, he was also an active member of his community, particularly through his service in local government, eventually becoming deputy mayor of the town of Claremont. At the same time, he had been active in the Western Australian Division of the Liberal Party, holding offices, including senior vice president, as well as being a member of the Federal Council of the Liberal Party. And when Paul Hasluck resigned from the House of Representatives in 1969 to become Governor General of Australia, Sir Victor Garland succeeded him as the member for Curtin. I note that in his remarks uh, in his first speech, he was quite generous in acknowledging uh, the significance both of Mr John Curtin, uh, his namesake in the seat, but also his predecessor, Hasluck. And the seat, of course, is named for the great Labor Prime Minister, and it's situated in Perth's affluent beachside suburbs. It's been a comfortably Liberal seat over many decades. Uh, when he made his first speech, Sir Victor acknowledged John Curtin, as I said, and he said this. A man who, in times of great difficulty, drew credit to himself and indeed to his associates by his straightforwardness and fine qualities, which caused him to tread the highest path of duty. A magnanimous contribution about a person from the other side of politics. So Victor said he felt the awe and honour of being elected a member of the House of Representatives, and unusually for the time, he specifically acknowledged the women who were active in his electorate working, as he said, for the principles in which they believe. He was preoccupied by the international affairs of the time, remembering that Australia was fully engaged in the, in the Vietnam War. He spoke of his concerns about the increase of nuclear and non-nuclear aggression, as well as the role of China, which echoes some sentiments more recently expressed. Understandably, for someone of his political persuasion, he emphasised the need for the support of the growth and development of non-communist Asian states, but he also praised the creation of regional institutions such as the Asian Development Bank and the Asian and Pacific Council. He noted that the economic growth of Southeast Asian countries was dependent on their ability to provide social justice, recognising that this was something to which Australia could contribute, and he praised budget commitments to aid and assistance in education in the region. He supported increases in defence funding, but he believed this must also be accompanied by increases in the aid budget. His call for Australia's growing wealth to be shared with neighbours in our region, noting we needed to accept our responsibilities, but also that increasing Australian participation in the leadership would come with the benefit of stronger relationships with Southeast Asian countries. These were prescient comments, and indeed they are still relevant today. As Sir Victor said, security and economic development are two sides of the same coin. Perhaps fittingly for someone elected to a seat of such significance, Sir Victor Garland spent very little time on the back bench before he was called upon to serve as a minister. He first entered the ministry in the McMahon government in 1971 as Minister for Supply, a portfolio that encompassed a wide range of responsibilities that we would now largely associate with the Industry and Resources Minister. He added minister assisting the Treasurer to his duties before the defeat of that government at the end of 1972, when Gough Whitlam led Labor into power for the first time since 1949. That took Sir Victor into opposition, and in the ensuing three years he held shadow portfolios, including spokesperson on the Public Service and Australian Capital Territory, as well as being chief opposition whip in the House of Representatives. Now, this latter role was not one he especially sought, but it seems it did enable him to make use of his number counting skills behind the scenes. And I was intrigued to read this, I think, from the Adelaide Advertiser, that this involved something of a personal metamorphosis. He had developed it says, uh, Mr Garland developed a reputation for a certain aloofness when he became supply minister during the final 12 months of the McMahon government because of the fairly formal way that he ran his portfolio. The image changed quite dramatically during the three years of Labor government. Mr Garland made a point of getting to know press men and Parliament House workers and often attended the late-night round of parties that made Parliament House swing during the sitting weeks. <laughs> it's an intriguing metamorphosis. Um, but he was, of course, a conspicuous supporter of Malcolm Fraser when he successfully seized the leadership of the Liberal Party and the opposition from Billy Sneddon. And this led to a return to the front bench when Mr Fraser became Prime Minister at the end of 1975 uh, to the ministry. 
this was a personally challenging period. He resigned his new ministries early in 1976 after being the subject of electoral bribery charges, which were dismissed by a magistrate. His exile lasted 19 months. Between 1977 and 1980, he went on to hold portfolios including veterans' affairs, special trade representations, business and consumer affairs and assisting in industry and commerce. With his accounting background and previous experience in the Treasury portfolio, he was particularly well suited to these economic portfolios. In these roles, he represented Australia overseas on numerous occasions and pursued policy reforms ranging from tariff simplification and increased customs vigilance to competition regulation and consumer education. His tenure as a minister came to an end when he accepted appointment as Australia's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom in London at the end of 1980. He began his new role in 1981 and served until 1983. And his previous experience, particularly in the trade portfolio, meant he was well placed to take up the diplomatic position. In 1982, he was made Knight Commander in the Order of the British Empire. At the conclusion of his term, he remained in the United Kingdom, as it turned out, for quite an extended period of time. He took up positions on a number of corporate boards, making a substantial contribution in a range of areas. He returned to Perth in 2007. So Victor Garland was one of the last surviving ministers in the McMahon government. With his passing, Tom Hughes is the only remaining Liberal member of that ministry. And as we mark Sir Victor's death, we again pause to reflect, as we did yesterday in expressing condolences following the death of Don Grimes, on the diminishing number of living members of the governments that led Australia through the 1970s and the 1980s. And in doing so, we considered the impact of those governments in shaping the nation that we are today. Through his roles in both the McMahon and Fraser governments, Sir Victor made a contribution to building modern Australia. He would go on to represent our nation overseas, capping his public service career in this country first, with service to it in the United Kingdom, and then with service to that country as well. The opposition expresses our condolences following the passing of Sir Victor Garland, and we again convey our sympathies to his family and to his friends. Senator Dean Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of uh, my West Australian Senate colleagues, I'd just like to uh, associate ourselves with the remarks of the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Birmingham, and those of Senator McAllister. Unfortunately, I never met Vic Garland, as he was affectionately known across the West Australian Liberal Party, but he is a testimony to the strength of the West Australian Liberal Party. Over many, many years now, we have spent, sent people from those comfortable suburbs of Curtin uh, to our national parliament, and they've served us with distinction. Of course, um, Alan Rocher, who was a member of the Senate for a short time. Of course, Julie Bishop, Sir Paul Hasluck, and Celia Hammond now follows in those uh, very, very esteemed uh, steps. Uh, what is often overlooked is, for a brief period, um, Vic Garland uh, worked closely with another famous West Australian, but we don't often think of him as a West Australian, and that was uh, Sir Billy Sneddon, who was born in West Perth, uh, who was educated at the University of Western Australia and was the inaugural chairman of the Young Liberal Movement of Australia. So I think uh, in uh, listening to the contributions today from Senator Birmingham and Senator McAllister, uh, those of us from Western Australia have been reminded of the strength of the WA division uh, and the very, very, role, very, very, very strong role we have played in sending very credible, competent people to our national parliament and indeed uh, to the prize of all prizes, and that is to the High Commissioner Post uh, in London. So, um, Again, on behalf of the West Australian Senators, uh, but all members of the West Australian Liberal Party, I'd just like to associate ourselves with those remarks, and we also send our condolences, of course. Thank you. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment's silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank all senators. Senator Urquhart. Um, I seek leave to give notice of a general business notice of motion for tomorrow. I have spoken to the whip and it is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. All right. We will now move on to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? We'll we'll go in a in a manner that I guess best assists the chamber. So I may start with um, 
business of the Senate. Motion number six, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate, notice of motion number six, be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, it is taken as a formal motion. Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now go on to government business uh, motion number one. Senator, no. Oh, that was already being dealt with. Apologies. Uh, motion number two. Senator Dunning. Uh, thanks, Mr President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers two to four uh, be taken as formal. There being no objection, they're taken as formal. Senator Dunning. Thanks, Mr President. I move that the following bills be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections and referendums in respect of electoral communication, that expenditure of foreign campaigners and offences and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections, referendums and broadcasting in respect of authorising matter and for related purposes. And a bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections in respect of enfranchisement of persons in self-isolation or quarantine due to COVID-19 and for related purposes. The question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, Mr President, I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities and may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the bills will now be read a first time. Does that opinion say aye? Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Electoral Legislation Amendment Foreign Influences and Offences Bill 2022. Electoral Legislation Amendment Authorisations Bill 2022. Electoral Legislation Amendment, COVID and Franchisement Bill 2022. Minister. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 29 March 2022. All right, we will now move on to uh, number five, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that government business notice of motion number five be taken as formal. Is there no objections? It is taken as formal. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law in relation to parliamentary workplaces and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this mil uh, bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for a first time. Uh, I put the question the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to parliamentary workplaces and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 29 March 2022. So we will now go to uh, Senator Faruqi again, 1304. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion number 1304 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is, is, uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Um, Mr. President, I amend the motion in the terms of the revised amendment circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. There being no objection, it's taken as formal. I'll ask you to move the motion. Senator Faruqi. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Yes, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the government will not oppose this motion. The government will aim to meet the requested deadline, noting reports will first need to be centrally collated by the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. In addition, the reports will also require assessment and redaction to ensure that private information is not unreasonably disclosed and or that any disclosure does not impact on any ongoing regulatory consideration by either a state or territory agency or indeed the department. I will now put the motion. Those in favour of the motion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now go to 
Uh, Senator Rice, 1308. <laughs> Thanks, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1308 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. We will now go to 1309, Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1309 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator McGrath. Mr President, I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections and referendums in respect of voter identification and to provide for application of the amendments. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McGrath. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections and referendums in respect of voter identification and to provide for application of the amendments. Senator McGrath. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. If there is no objection, leave is granted. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objections, leave is granted. We will now move back to 1260 in the name of Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1260, proposing an order of continuing effect about the outsourcing of the public service, be taken as a formal motion. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? No. I ask you to move the motion. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator McAllister. Thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted for one minute? Thank you. Labor is deeply troubled by the explosion in the use of external labour under the Morrison government, including consultants. Driven by the government's arbitrary and damaging staffing cap, this expenditure is not only wasteful, it also undermines the capability of the Australian public service. We are also deeply concerned by the Morrison government's approach to transparency, including in procurement and its engagement of external labour. That is why we have already announced plans to improve the disclosure of contracts on Austender, along with reforms to better track spending and contract extensions. While we appreciate the intent behind this motion, Labor has a number of concerns, including the scope of the private commercial information being sought, the failure to address PII and the identification of private firms in a continuing order of the Senate. And we will not be supporting the motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted for one minute? Thank you, Mr. President. Order. The motion would represent an unreasonable diversion of resources, requiring reconfiguration of data that is already published on a more regular basis on Austender. It incorrectly assumes that the main consultancy firms are identical for all portfolios. The transparency.gov.au website already publishes data on the largest consultancy contracts for all agencies, with top ranked suppliers differing for many agencies. The last limb of the motion seeks documents that are usually protected by a diverse range of legitimate public interest immunities. It would be an unreasonable diversion of resources to perform immunity reviews, consultations and redactions on every such report when it's open to the Senate to seek only those documents of interest. Uh, this diversion of resources will subtract from, a fr uh, from front line public services. I will now put the question on general business notice of motion. 1260. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
got the bells. Uh, we are in general business. Notice of motion 1260. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair. Nose to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose. There being 10 ayes, 30 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Just allow people to resume their seats. And we'll move to uh, 1307 in the name of Senator Keneally. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1307 be taken as a formal motion. If there are no objections, it is taken as formal. Senator Urquhart. The motion. The question is that Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. For one minute. Thank Go you, ahead. Mr. President. Uh, the decisions and actions of government are on the public record, and the Morrison government will continue to ensure that those who cross our border comply with our laws and requirements, and we will remove those who don't. The government welcomed the federal court's decision to uphold the immigration minister's cancellation of Mr. Djokovic's visa on public interest grounds. Question is that motion. Mr. President. Mr. President. Oh, sorry, Senator Hanson, you are seeking leave. Seek leave to make a short statement, please. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Hanson, you have Thank the Thank you call. very much. The issue around Novak um, Djokovic was a sorry episode in the story of the pandemic. He met the entry requirements. The courts backed him when the government decided to shift the goalpost. Then they kicked Djokovic out anyway on the basis his views were a threat to public health and good order, not whether he actually had COVID. What rubbish. From the beginning of the pandemic to June last year, Scott Morrison let more than 1.67 million people into Australia and nearly all of them were unvaccinated. They brought Delta and Omicron with them. The government's hypocrisy over Djokovic was stunning. Pretending his views were a threat that justified his deportation showed the contempt this government has for the intelligence of the Australian people. And that's why back the Australian people outside the parliament protesting over these vaccine mandates. And Labor have a lot to answer for as well because they supported the government and how the handling of Senator Dr. Hanson, your time has expired. If there are no further contributions, I'll put the motion. Those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that motion number 1307 be agreed to. Eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint. Okay, we'll just give the whips a few moments, please. I'll put the question again. Uh, eyes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, tell her for the eyes. Senator McGrath, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. I'll ask all senators to remain in the chamber. I believe this is the final motion. Just give senators a chance to resume their seats. And this is motion 1310 in the name of Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1310 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question is Senator Dernium. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. Minister Colbeck has supported and always will support the important work of the aged care sector. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Australian government has provided more than $2.5 billion to support senior Australians in aged care. More than $1.5 billion of this investment has been made available to support the aged care workforce. The Australian government is determined to ensure a safe environment exists in aged care facilities and is continuing to work with aged care providers and state and territory public health authorities to support arrangements to manage infection control and COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care. I will put the question. Uh, those, um, those in favour of the motion say aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. Question is that motion 1310 be agreed to. Eyes are passed to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart. Tell her for the eyes. Senator McGrath, tell her for the nose. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 26. The question is resolved in the affirmative, and that concludes formal business. I'll give senators a moment to leave the chamber or resume their seats. We will now move to the, uh, the MPI. However, I do note that we will move to a first speech at 5 or just after 5 p.m. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 25 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Brown. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Mr Morrison's disastrous COVID summer resulting from his failure to listen to the warnings and take responsibility for ordering rapid antigen tests, his failure to learn from past mistakes, with Australians paying the price, spending hours in testing queues, days looking for rapid tests that were unavailable or overpriced, looking for basic supplies but finding only empty supermarket shelves and mourning the loss of loved ones as hundreds of aged care residents died as provided, rap, providers grappled with staff shortages. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall, I shall ask the clerks set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of utmost importance to Australians. We're all very privileged to be here in this place holding positions of leadership. And our communities have vested their trust in us to display the qualities of leadership they expect, especially in a time that is one of the most testing we face as Australians. But at a time when we most needed leadership to be guided with a sure hand through the many trials this pandemic has thrown at us, we have had an utter failure by this Prime Minister and his government to lead us. And nowhere is that failure of leadership being felt more than in remote Australia. The federal government has failed and ignored remote communities during the pandemic. The vaccination rollout, booster shots, aged care and supply of rats are federal responsibilities that have been bungled and mismanaged by Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Some territory communities still have double dose rates below 50 per cent and we have seen concerning outbreaks at aged care centres. Aged care is in crisis. Remote communities are running out of rats, and the health and aged care workforce out bush and in large centres is strained. In Alice Springs, there are cases being reported of elderly people being left without services under their home care packages. Elderly and vulnerable people left alone without a change of bed linen assistance in home cleaning and personal care for weeks. 
and I suspect this is the tip of a dreadful iceberg. How many vulnerable Territorians are there waiting in vain for their home care package services to be delivered who have no one to advocate for them, who have no family close by? I'm informed the services aren't being delivered because of a drastic workforce shortage and there are no plans in place from the federal government to assist. These cases of elderly people being left without services under their home care packages is a direct result of this government's failure to implement the findings of the Royal Commission into Aged Care. These are the consequences of not properly remunerating our aged care workforce, issues that were being felt long before COVID and have been exacerbated by this pandemic. And it's our elders who are paying the price. And if these are the failures we know about in the urban centres, where there is some scrutiny, what is the case in remote bush communities? Out of sight is so often out of mind at the best of times out there. From speaking with aged care services providers in some remote territory communities, I'm told that the federal government has not supplied one single rat to these providers, not one. Any that they have been able to get their hands on has been paid from, for their, up from them for the, from their own existing funding, putting pressures on other areas of service delivery to these centres. And the rats they have been able to get are prioritised for the vulnerable elderly. There is a shortage of rats and PPE for the aged care service workforce, adding extra strain to underpaid and under-resourced workers. And while the service provider workforce is out there on the ground caring for the elderly, Commonwealth agencies have been instructed to work from home. The federal government has completely abandoned the field in remote communities. Imagine how this leaves an exhausted and underpaid workforce feeling. They're out there doing the hard yards with zero support from the federal agencies. No sign of the National Indigenous Australians Agency in the bush. What a disgrace. The failure by the government to manage the Omicron outbreak is being felt dis disproportionately by women and children in remote Australia. Family and domestic violence services have been forced to expend their emergency relief funds on rats because, again, zero forthcoming from the federal government. So many have absolutely nothing left with five months to go until the end of financial year. There is a drastic shortage of alternative emergency accommodation and women and children are being left in dangerous, life-threatening situations because of this. We held a, an opportunity for a Teams meeting with a lot of these organisations, Madam Acting Deputy President, who spoke to us, uh, to myself uh, and certainly to our candidate for Lingiari, Marion Scrimger, to Warren Snowden, the current member for Lingiari, expressing these concerns directly about how Domestic and family violence has increased during the COVID pandemic, and they gave examples of their inability to be able to get women out of some of our communities. And again, they've had to rely, in particular, the Alice Springs uh, Women's Shelter has had to pay an extraordinary amount of money out of its own funds for the rapid antigen tests to be available. This should not be happening. Madam Acting Deputy President, and there has been certainly no response from the federal government to the crisis. There are now 26,612 active coronavirus cases, with the virus infiltrating every region and many remote Aboriginal communities. It's certainly 6, 000, over 6,000 active cases in the Northern Territory. As of this morning, 174 people with COVID were in Territory hospitals and on Sunday, tragically, the NT also recorded its fifth COVID-related death. Three people in the NT have died with coronavirus in the past week. And there are real worries, Mr President, about the impacts this is having on our health system right across the Northern Territory.
Thank you. It being almost 5 p.m., I think we will move on. Senator Mirabella, you're ready to go. Pursuant to order, I will now call Senator Mirabella to make his first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to him. I call Senator Mirabella. Thank you, Mr. President. I begin by acknowledging my predecessor and yours, the Honourable Scott Ryan. There's a broad acknowledgement on all sides that both the former presiding officer, Senator Ryan, and his colleague, the Honourable Tony Smith, deserve plaudits for their service. Exemplary presiding officers both, fine Victorians both, and Senator Ryan was only the second Victorian to hold your office um, after Sir Magnus Cormack from 1971 to 1974. I am honoured to have been chosen by the Victorian Division of the Liberal Party to represent Victoria in the Senate. I am privileged to stand here today preparing to do my small part, as we all seek to, in shaping a better future for our country and future generations. The perspective I bring to the task of shaping Australia's future is a consequence of the journey that I have taken to reach this chamber today. That journey has been a little longer and more circuitous than most. On the way, I've been a business manager, a teacher, a soldier, an engineer and a farmer. I've worked in offices, on fishing boats, in classrooms, and early in my life I experienced the struggles and challenges of small business. I've been fortunate to have first-hand experience in a broad range of areas that underpin how the world works—food production, infrastructure, technology and defence of the nation. And I've also come to know and believe in certain values, which I believe are critical both to an individual's pursuit of happiness and to the flourishing of our nation. A love of family, a commitment to service, self-reliance, endeavour and enterprise. I am imbued with these things and they are fundamental to the perspective I bring to the parliament. But on this journey, no one comes into this parliament alone. Each of us had a lot of help to get here. So a few acknowledgements, although I can't name you all. I'm grateful to all the Liberal volunteers who give their time and effort and passion, to our rural membership who do the miles, and those special people who select and serve on the party's decision-making bodies. Thank you for your trust. I will name the small dedicated team who played a critical role in getting me here today. Mike Pountney, Sean Armistead, Jack Cook, Ben Zerby, Amanda and Rowan Miller, and James Radford, and from further afield, John Pollock, Andrew Schuller, and the best federal director the Liberal Party never had, Jerry Wheeler. <laughs> My four children are here today, Emily, Maddie, Alexandra and Kitty, and my mother, Mary, are here today. Sadly, my father, Tim, passed away two weeks before my selection for this position, and he would be most annoyed with himself for not being here today. <laughs> of course, I want to acknowledge and praise my wife, Sophie. She was a member of the House of Representatives for 12 years. Her maiden speech was almost 20 years ago to the day. We are the fourth couple to have both served in the federal parliament, but I am the first husband to follow in the footsteps of his wife. And I am beyond proud to be doing so. Sophie was an extraordinary representative of the electorate of Indi. Energetic, passionate, incomparably hardworking. The fruits of her efforts are still fully evident today, although perhaps not sufficiently recognised. The residents of the Albury Wodonga region drive on the roads and the freeway that she fought to get built. The people of North East Victoria attend medical facilities that she fought to get funded. And they use sporting and community facilities that she was instrumental in building. And even before she entered parliament, she was able to work with then Prime Minister John Howard to secure hundreds of defence industry jobs in Benalla and across the river 
in Mawela. And after she left the parliament, she was instrumental in securing entitlements to hundreds of workers from Bruck Textiles. In office and out of office, she helped a lot of people. She still has my total admiration for both her work ethic and her commitment to the people of Indi. For Sophie, the 2013 election was bittersweet with the coalition's return to power, coinciding with the loss of her seat. As shadow industry minister prior to that election, Sophie did much to set the direction for the incoming government's approach to industry policy. There's been much written and said about the challenges that women face here in Canberra. Like many strong and vocal women in public life, Sophie has had to endure an unfair share of prejudice and discrimination that men do not. Her political opponents confected public vilification and then exploited it without shame. And some of these were other women. Mm. Sophie never got to deliver a valedictory, and I'm sure these remarks are hardly a good substitute. But the circumstance of her departure from the parliament was absolutely the catalyst for my decision to step into an active role in politics. If in my time here I can achieve a fraction of what she materially achieved, particularly for the people of regional Victoria, I will have done well. I've said I've had a few careers. Looking back now on all the things I've been and done, I was most shaped as a soldier, an army engineer to be precise, a sapper. And I can tell you very specifically how I came to be a sapper. When I joined the Army Reserve during university, I trained as an infantryman, but it was during that time that I was fortunate enough to attend a few lectures by our Honorary Colonel Commandant at that time, Sir Edward Dunlop. During these lectures, Weary would talk about his time as a prisoner of war in Singapore and Thailand. He painted a vivid picture of how he and others struggled to run makeshift hospitals to save the lives of their starving and diseased fellow prisoners. He showed us pencil drawings and watercolours made by prisoners at the time, and I recall them clearly. He showed us some of the expedient surgical instruments they devised from bamboo and bone in the jungle in Thailand. And during that particular presentation, an officer cadet asked him how many lives he thought he'd saved with those instruments. And I remember a portion of his, his response very well. He said, our medical staff didn't save anywhere near as many lives as the engineers. The engineers did the most amazing things to keep us supplied with fresh water and deal with our waste and build roofs and beds for us. Without the engineers, we'd probably all have died of disease and privation. I was the officer cadet who asked that question, and so he was answering me. And these were evocative words, and they made me want to do something useful with my time in the military. So I decided to become an army engineer. I wasn't studying engineering at the time, but I applied to join the Royal Australian Engineers and so started on a, a parallel career path. I studied and served part-time and full-time for two decades as a sapper officer. One of the mottos of the engineers is facimus et frangimus. We make and we break. <laughs> I was fortunate that most of my time as an active sapper was making rather than breaking. I learned how to build structures, roads, bridges. I learned how to purify water, how to prevent disease, the very same things Weary Dunlop talked about. In other words, I learned about all the basic things that a community of people need to live and survive. Clean water, shelter, roads. And I've enjoyed my time helping to build that infrastructure for communities here and abroad. But I'm not just a soldier. I think of myself a citizen soldier. For more than half my working life, I've worn the flag of my country on my sleeve, but the other half has been in civilian clothes. 
More recently, I've been a farmer. I am a senator for Victoria. But I've given myself the additional task of being a champion for regional Victoria. There are more than 21,000 farm businesses in the state, and Victoria has the largest agricultural output of all the states and territories. When I became part of a farming community, I discovered that generally farmers are just too busy to advocate for themselves, but I know from experience how hard it is to get farmers to stand up in front of a committee or an inquiry or write a submission. And yet farmers in Victoria are subject to endless new regulations developed by an army of well-paid public servants who assume farmers have plenty of capacity to devote their unpaid time to reviewing and arguing against more and more regulation, regulation and spending more and more time on compliance. It is for this reason I intend to focus my time in the Senate on championing their issues by working to, to continue to increase access to health services in rural areas, especially mental health, by fighting for increased investment in rural infrastructure, both road and rail, and unceasing vigilance on water management. We are coming to the end of this, the 46th parliament, which is an odd time to be delivering a first speech to this chamber. But it's also an historic moment to be delivering a first speech as we approach the end of a difficult but defining two years in the history of our nation. The COVID pandemic has tested many of our institutions, not least the Federation itself. It has forced us to consider the extent of our resilience and some say even our very sovereignty. Recent events have reminded us that Australia's strategic situation hasn't changed for 200 years. We are an island nation at the end of a very long maritime supply line. This has critical implications for self-sufficiency, especially in manufacturing and, of course, security. During this last two years, we've faced shortages of imported goods. This has put our local manufacturing capabilities under the microscope. Although empty supermarket shelves are not as critical as shortages of machine or electronic components, to a farmer waiting for a crucial part for a tractor, toilet paper shortages are a mild inconvenience. <laughs> Our exports too have been challenged. China punished our beef and wine trade because of a diplomatic slight. Well, with some difficulty, we've lived with that and found new markets. And it remains unclear whether our mutual trade interests with China will prevail over the long term. These imposed interruptions to our trade, incoming and outbound, have exposed the fragility of our supply chains. Now, I'd like to tell a parable which illustrates the vulnerabilities we must address. We've just had the AdBlue crisis, which threatened to put our trucking fleets off the road. AdBlue is a simple commodity. Most people have never heard of it. It helps reduce harmful emissions from diesel engine exhausts. But what is it? Well, it's just a urea and water solution. Urea is not hard to make, but it's one of the many thousands of things that we used to produce but for which there is almost no business case to manufacture locally anymore, until we can't import it, of course. Fortunately, there's a plant in Brisbane that's been able to ramp up its operations to produce urea, but I note that plant was due to close this year. The AdBlue incident throws up a number of issues we need to address at a national level. Firstly, the capabilities of our domestic petrochemical industry is a matter of concern, both production and storage. But we need to look more broadly than that. We need to examine what disruption to globalised supply chains really means for us, whatever the cause. Now, urea is made from coal or gas, commodities which were in short supply during this northern hemisphere winter. A situation probably exacerbated by all those ships full of Australian coal sitting at anchor in Chinese ports for months. 
But this incident demonstrates the world's reliance on hydrocarbons and coal and how shortages of these commodities still affect most nations at a national level. Consider the European winter energy markets right now. Energy generation is struggling and the price of Russian gas into Western Europe has tripled. And by the way, it's hardly worth asking whether Russia is likely to separate its strategic leverage of military force supply of gas to Germany. So to start drawing some threads together, here in Australia we need to be examining our national self-reliance. What's the balance between allowing global markets to deliver cheap goods versus critical shortages when supply chains are disrupted? I'd love to see more manufacturing in this country, smart manufacturing. And to be able to achieve that, we need smart people, great education and training, and capital applied where it's best used. But manufacturing also needs energy, electric energy, cheap and clean energy. It used to be one of our national competitive advantages. Electricity is the single greatest enabler of our modern civilisation to our standard of living. For more than a century, we've been burning fossil fuels to generate that energy. And we know we can't keep doing that. And globally, we are grappling with the conundrum, the social demand for an accelerated shutdown of coal power and a lack of viable alternatives. With my farmer's hat on and my engineer's prism, I look at the energy issues and the manufacturing issues and the sovereignty issues, and it's easy to conflate them. Everything connects to everything else. As an engineer, what I've focused on in recent years is how we improve the fundamentals of how we make the world work, how we improve the management of our resources and ecosystems efficiently and cleanly. I'm a farmer. I care for the land and my environment. I look at all the problematic issues—water, clean water, water for agriculture. And, by the way, even water is becoming a strategic commodity in and between some countries. Waste, municipal waste, it's a critical problem everywhere. Agriculture, green waste, livestock methane emissions, fertilisers for agriculture and emissions from industrial processes such as steel production. All these issues are connected. They are connected by the king of elements carbon, organic biomass, it's basic chemistry. Reducing atmospheric CO2 is what we want to achieve, but the term decarbonising doesn't actually make sense to a chemist. The solutions to all our challenges start with energy. The first consideration is that there is a limit to how much intermittent energy we should be putting into our grid. And Germany is a salutary lesson here. High level of intermittent generation, the most unstable grid with the most expensive electricity in Europe, mainly because of expensive Russian gas for peaking plants. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that households only consume about 20 per cent of all the electricity we generate. The rest goes to commercial and industrial use. For all the rooftop solar we've installed, we still need a lot of spinning baseload. The Prime Minister has said that the path to, to cleaner energy is in technology, not taxes. I agree. I am a proponent of hydrogen and ammonia as the fuels of the future. We need to be able to produce hydrogen in large quantities cleanly. And to make ammonia, you've actually got to make hydrogen first. I believe we will still be relying on biomass, including coal, for some time. But I also believe the future 
is not burning it. We will be chemically reforming biomass and methane into hydrogen and to ammonia, as already happens. But when we work out how to do it while capturing the CO2, we'll be producing clean hydrogen at such a scale that we can put it straight into turbines and make electricity, lots of it, cheaply. A new gas industry. And it will use only a fraction of the biomass we currently burn and will save a lot, solve a lot of our waste problems at the same time. Is this a fantasy? I don't believe so. Current waste to energy systems are already evolving down this path. Time does not permit me to say as much as I'd like here, particularly to the sceptics, but I will say this. Whichever country wins the race of large-scale clean hydrogen production will win an economic bonanza and will lead the world to a better future. And I intend that it is Australia. I want to make a comment about the Voices candidate set to contest the federal election. Why do I mention this here? Because these Voices candidates cite their major platform as lack of action on climate change. They say they're independents, who aren't really a political party, really. They look and sound like one. They even have a Senate candidate preaching the need for transparency in politics while denying scrutiny of themselves. I share the concern of many of a hung federal election result. Now, these voices candidates are very well schooled in avoiding answering the question as to who they would support to form government, but there is, of course, no doubt. They are all contesting only against coalition members. The notion that any of them would support the coalition is absurd. They are, therefore, the voices for Labor. I am gravely concerned at how a Labor Greens Voices Coalition would accelerate climate, change, uh, climate action, ban coal, shut down more baseload generation. This country is already at the point where we do not need more intermittent generation. I have already referred to Germany. Is that the nirvana where these Voices people might take us? A fragile grid, unaffordable energy, blackouts. Australians most definitely don't want that. Australia has the resources to become a leader in hydrogen energy, and in so doing, we will at once be enabling cheaper energy, more manufacturing, and greater self reliance. If we can reap this harvest, we will improve our ability to better fund education, health, and aged care. But to achieve this, we really need to knock down a few silos and recast some of the business of government. Trade, energy, industry, security, they are interdependent in this context. It is a first order challenge for the future. Better applying policy and public funds to address our sovereign self-sufficiency in ways which actually contribute to prosperity. On my final theme of security, defence and foreign policy, I will confine my comments. First, the manner in which we equip the ADF. I know firsthand how lengthy and convoluted our acquisition processes are, and we must improve them. Changes in technology are occurring at 21st century speed, but our decision processes still seem stuck in the last century. Several months ago, the government announced the purchase of, or the choice, actually, of uh, new artillery equipment, and that's great. But I recollect that project, Land 17, was entered into the Defence Capability Program during my time working in force development in 2005. That's nearly 17 years ago. The Defence Minister is rightly taking a more rigorous approach to this problem, and I applaud him. Uh, he was right to recognise a bad decision on our new submarines. He's also right to project an increased defence budget for coming years. We cannot provide credible protection to our maritime supply lines and our region if we don't. And uh, an additional note, 
about the role of the ADF. In recent times, we've seen the ADF employed on civil defence tasks. The recent horror summer, bushfires, and support to covert operations being cases in point. As a citizen soldier, I support this. There's been discussion in recent days about whether the ADF is a standby workforce. No, it isn't. The mission of the ADF is to protect Australia and its interests. And to me personally, that mission absolutely includes civil defence operations. As a soldier, I've commanded army support to bushfire operations under the Defence Aid to the Civil Community System. I once watched people in a town, not far from where I live now, surrounded by fires for weeks, come out into the street and cheer and cry when the big green trucks roll through, towing bulldozers, carrying a hundred sappers with chainsaws. I have never felt so proud of wearing my uniform as I did that day. When these people told me that they knew that now everything was going to be all right, the Prime Minister knew of their plight and he sent them. We weren't a backup workforce. We were soldiers and we were there to protect them, to protect them and their homes, and we did. I support any measures to equip and prepare elements of the ADF to provide this kind of support for the future as a matter of course. And as a final note on defence matters, and certainly not least, I intend to do what I can to better support veterans. We need to do a lot better than we've done in recent years. To draw to a conclusion, I've already laboured the point that events of the last two years have shone the spotlight on a range of issues that go to the heart of Australia's wellbeing. I've drawn the thread. Self-reliance, energy, manufacturing, security. One of the most important lessons that I have learned in my various careers is that lessons are too often not well learned, especially at a bureaucratic and political level. Bushfire inquiries are an outstanding example. Defence equipment acquisitions are another. Pandemic lessons need to be not just learned but embedded and protected. The health lessons and the economic and social lessons. This is a time when we need to be striving to make sure that we do not forget the lessons of today. This is a time when we need to be making considered and informed decisions about Australia's ability to prosper as a free and self-determining nation. I want my four beautiful daughters to inherit a nation and a world which is in better shape than my generation found it. I hope to bring my particular perspectives to bear on policy and public debate to help achieve this. It's the farmer's job to feed the nation and it's the engineer's job to build all that makes it work. And it's the soldier's job to protect the people. And it does not occur to me for a moment that these do not remain my tasks, even as I serve from this place. Thank you, Mr President.
Uh, just before we move back to the MPI, I believe you're seeking the call, Minister Ruskin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation. Uh, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. I move that today the hours of meeting be 9:30 a.m. to an adjournment. The routine of business from 7:20 p.m. be consideration of the mitochondrial donation law reform, Maves Law Bill 2021 only. Divisions may take place after 7.20 for the purposes of the bill only, and the question for the adjournment be proposed after consideration of the bill concludes or at 9 p.m., whichever is the earlier. I will put that motion. Those in uh, favour say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We will now return to the MPI, and I am calling Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. What a stark contrast it was to hear such an excellent first speech of Senator Mirabella. Full of her positivity, it was uplifting, it was sincere, it was about service to the nation. The sort of senator and public servant we actually want and need in this place. And that speech was such a juxtaposition to that which we had heard earlier from the Labor Party in this so-called MPI. They want to blame Mr Morrison for everything. In fact, the motion starts, Mr Morrison's disastrous summer. Well, I suppose we blame him that it was a bit of a colder summer than usual, that the barbecue gas ran out or the kids got sunburnt. Yet, really, what is the Labor Party on about when they come into this place day after day with their relentless negativity and their commentary on everything that is wrong without pausing to consider that they might actually be presenting themselves as an alternative government, not a whisper as to what they would be doing differently. What we hear is just this tirade of negativity including, might I add, Mr Acting Deputy President, what I find amazing, because we heard it in question time today and again in the contribution from the Labor Speaker just before the first speech by Senator Mirabella. And it was about the underpaid workers in aged care. There is no doubt that aged care workers do a fantastic job. There is no doubt that they are low-paid workers. But who sets their wage rates? It is not the government. It is not the Prime Minister. It is an independent tribunal known as, the, as Fair Work Australia. And I wonder who set that up and then stacked it out with their people. It was the Australian Labor Party. It is the Australian Labor Party's mechanism for wage fixation in this country. And so when the Labor Party comes into this place day after day complaining about the low wages for aged care workers, what it is is a double whammy criticism, one, of the trade union movement that is allegedly looking after these people but also the independent umpire who determines the wages. Now, the Australian Labor Party, like with so many other things, seeks to have it both ways. They say day after day, the Liberal National Party cannot change the fair work legislation. And we haven't in this regard. It is the legislation as put down by Ms Gillard, Prime Minister Rudd, remember him, and Mr Shorten, well, that mechanism remains in place. So each and every day when the Australian Labor Party complains about somebody's wages and or conditions, they are complaining about the decision-making process of the organisation that they themselves established. It therefore begs the question, what would Labor do if they were in government? Would they sack the Fair Work Commission for not providing sufficient wages to aged care people? Or would they somehow legislate wages and start having this parliament determining who gets paid what, when, how and why? Surely not. 
So this is a vacuous criticism that they offer day after day in a vain attempt to con the Australian people into believing that somehow they might be able to do a better job. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, we know that the Labor Party is devoid of any future policy positioning. If they had good future policies, instead of putting up these motions as they do day after day, full of relentless negativity, they'd be saying that we call on the government to adopt Labor policy in this particular area. And the Labor policy is, and they would set it out seriatim, A, B, C, D, etc., and tell the Australian people exactly what they want, what their aspiration is for the Australian people. But they have no aspiration for the Australian people. They only have an aspiration for themselves and somehow cheat their way into government by offering continual criticism of a government that has been in exceptionally difficult circumstances delivering for the people of Australia. And let's be clear. In the three years of this government, we have had, we've seen 1.1 million jobs created since the pandemic hit. And do you know what? Labor's shadow treasurer said that the one test the Morrison government has to pass is the unemployment rate. Will it hit a certain level or not? Well, it is well below expectations, that's the unemployment rate, is well below expectations. So by Labor's standard, the standard, the one standard by which Labor said the Morrison government should be judged, the Liberal National Party government should be judged, namely on the employment level, it has passed with flying colours. It is not me, a Liberal senator, asserting this. It is, by implication, the Australian Labor Party asserting this, because they set the test and the test the Labor Party set for the Liberal National Party government has been passed with flying colours, whether the Labor Party likes it or not. So, having set us a benchmark, which we have surpassed as a government, what else is Labor to offer other than to pick up any little rock that is available and throw it at us as a government? There's no positivity. There is no vision for the future. There's no policy platform on which to see the nation come out of this COVID pandemic. We are doing, as a nation, relatively well. Can we do better? Of course we can do better, and that is what the government continually strives for day after day, Mr Acting Deputy President. But what this nation does not need is a group of individuals who have only one vision, and that is <coughs> for them to be elected to government. Now, for Labor to be elected to government, the Australian people need the full policy platform, what they would actually do, what they would do differently and how. It's no use saying we would have done better in this area or that area. Tell us how that would have been achieved with all the constrictions and restraints that COVID have placed upon us. And so, Mr Acting Deputy President, 1.1 million jobs created, surpassing Labor's test. And I'm sure that the hapless shadow treasurer thought in setting us this task on unemployment that we would fail it. And he put it up there in lights for everybody to see, only to find us not only match it, but overwhelmingly surpass that benchmark. And so humiliated, the Labor Party retreats to that which it is, I must say, exceptionally good at, and that is throwing rocks and offering criticism, but they are incapable of providing that positive agenda. And the record of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer speaks for itself. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, I've concentrated on that which uh, the Labor Party sent, set us as a benchmark. But look, Let's have a look. 1,400 additional nurse placements for the regions. 
um, one billion dollars to help with closing the gap. Ninety-three per cent of Indigenous children enrolled in preschool, which is up from 77 per cent in 2016. You go through policy parameter after policy parameter, and you see achievement by this government in the most difficult of circumstances. And so the ministry has performed exceptionally well, and the benchmarks set by the Australian Labor Party have been met, achieved, and indeed overachieved. And so all that Labor does is come in here provide their relentless negativity, no real alternative for the people of Australia. And that is why motions such as this, put forward by the Labor Party day after day, should be rejected. And if I was in the opposition, I'd be putting forward a positive platform. But devoid of that, all they do is throw rocks. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts you have Deputy call. President, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that the federal and state governments have had a disastrous two years of COVID mismanagement. Not just one summer. Go out the front and have a listen. Go anywhere in Australia and have a listen. Australia has seen a repeated failure to learn and do better from one year to the next, and it's now counting in New Year's. The failure of this government to modify COVID response as more information has emerged about the science of this virus is criminal incompetence. Our competitive federalism model has been mocked and abused and buried in some perverse game of pass the parcel so that everyday Australians can have no clear idea of who is to blame for this mess. I know who is to blame. It's all of you. All of you have waved through ill-prescribed and illogical measures for more than two years, one after the other. From one state to another, the same science and data on COVID has been translated into wildly different responses depending upon the ideology and personality flaws of the premiers and chief ministers of the day and the federal ministers. Yet on each occasion, with each different policy, the phrase was the same, trust the science, but don't show us the science. The last two years has seen a litany of nonsense and lies, lie after lie, dressed up as medicine and science. Here are just some of them. The unresolved definition of a hotspot, inability to agree on sensible measures for border communities, Seemingly arbitrary closing of borders and locking down of communities for minor outbreaks, while then being allowed to open up during major outbreaks. I mean, this is, this is incredible to, to see. Marginalising the unvaccinated in some states, but not in others. The changing definition of fully vaccinated. Making commitments to people and then contradicting them. As a nation, we have been held captive to measures that have divided our communities, coerced people into a medical procedure in order to keep our jobs, denied freedom of choice over our bodies, when we can open our businesses, where we can travel, whether we can see our family and friends, whether we can attend a funeral or a wedding, and kept any dissent suppressed by media accomplices. The media have crafted the narrative into a singular government-sanctioned message, essentially propaganda and lies. Disasters and calamities can have a powerful galvanising effect for communities, like we see during bushfires and floods. Yet during COVID, our governments have successfully eroded our cohesiveness as an Australian nation, fractured it. This is the first time I've seen a national emergency responded to by dividing Australians instead of uniting against the common threat. Instead of helping one another, we find ourselves treating others like, peer, like lepers and retreating from anyone who coughs or sniffles. We've been brainwashed into division, disrespect and telling lies and telling tales on anyone we believe isn't being compliant. The federal government have squandered the opportunity to bring Australia together as a nation by letting the states and territories run wild with stupidity and deceit. Liberal, Labor, Nationals and Greens, governments all. Historically, our ADF are brought in to help domestically in catastrophic and emergency situations. So it says a lot about how the state and federal governments have mishandled their response to COVID when, after two years of COVID experience, we need 1,700 ADF personnel to go into our aged care sector because the staff have left because they've had to because they've been threatened with, with a forced vaccination. Debacle after debacle has left our aged care sector completely under-resourced. Staffing has been ravaged by vaccine mandates and unreasonable close contact rules. It makes no sense to me that Labor would try to pin on the Morrison-Joyce government alone when the Labor Party, when this parliament, state and federal parliaments, waved these measures through for two years. To steal a line from driving Miss Daisy, Senator Brown, 
You took that turn with the government. It's too late now to dodge the blame. You're all to blame. The unnecessary deaths within aged care from government incompetence are heartbreaking and shameful, immoral and inhuman. So too are the continual lockdowns of elderly residents, who have prevented the elderly, you have, which have prevented the elderly from seeing their families, leading some to believe they've been abandoned. It's not their families who have abandoned them. It's this parliament. It's all of you. The disrespect shown to our elderly is breathtaking. While there are ethical questions about balance between opening up and our most vulnerable being exposed on COVID, there's absolutely no acceptable excuse for the state and federal government's logistical failures during this entire atrocious mess. How can we do this to our families and communities? We're still stumbling as a nation two years later. The federal and state leaders have gutted the dignity and rights of everyday Australians through their ineptness and an unprecedented thirst for power and control. At a time when Australians needed hope, reassurance, leadership and confidence in their leaders. Is it any wonder this incompetence, this arrogance and hubris, hubris has brought thank protesters you, onto Roberts. the streets in their millions? Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Good. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise, I rise to make a contribution on this matter of public importance. According to the Minister for Aged Care, the aged care system has been coping with the Omicron variant extremely well. That is a direct quote. Extremely well. That is an opinion that the minister might have formed from his VIP seats at the fifth test of the Ashes. Of course, if the minister fronted up to the committee on COVID-19, the Senate committee, the minister had, and if the minister had done his job and shown up for that committee instead of fobbing us off to go to the cricket, then the minister would know that actually the aged care system is not coping extremely well. Usually, if a system is coping extremely well, you don't have to call the military in to provide emergency support. If the minister, instead of going to the cricket, had done his job and talked to aged care residents and families or just simply read the paper, he would have known things are not going extremely well. He would know that more than 500 Australians in aged care died from COVID-19 in January alone. But the government says, don't worry about that. The Minister for Health said 60 per cent of those who had died in aged care, and I quote, in the absolute last days of their lives. How is that for a message from the Morrison government? In the absolute last days of their lives. That's how they describe that, those people that lost their, lost their life due to COVID. What a reassurance to the from the government to those people that lost loved ones and those ones, those that fear of losing their loved ones. I doubt that provides any support to the families of those who have tragically passed away. Is this really the point we've gotten to in the government's handling of the pandemic? That we are now just brushing away hundreds of preventable deaths as being insignificant? It is an unprecedented in Australian history what's going on in our aged care sector. The fact is the vaccine rollout had not started months, had started months and months behind. If the booster rollout had not, start, not started months behind, we might have been in a better position. Then we would not have seen hundreds of unboosted aged care residents tragically passing away in January. But that is the aged care system the government insists is performing extremely well. If the minister had spoken to aged care providers instead of going to the cricket, he would have known that this isn't the case. Mike Baird, the former Liberal Premier of New South Wales and current CEO of aged care provider Hammond Care, has been calling for the Australian Defence Force to be called in to the aged care sector since mid-January. It took more than three weeks for the government to heed that call. And as always, with this government, it's too little, too late. And if the minister had spoken to aged care workers instead of going to the cricket, he would know things are not going extremely well. Aged care workers are under unbelievable stress. They can't access rapid antigen tests. They can't access enough PPE. They can't access enough N95 masks. 
It has been a year since the Aged Care Royal Commission handed down its final report. And we just remind ourselves what the report said, and I quote, Australia's aged care system is understaffed and the workforce underpaid and undertrained. The bulk of the aged care workforce does not receive wages and enjoy terms and conditions of employment that adequately reflect the important caring role they play. Inadequate staffing levels, skill mix and training are principal causes of substandard care in the current system. That's what the Aged Care Commission made very clear. And it couldn't have been clearer to anyone reading those words. There's a link between the conditions of aged care workforce and the quality of care. And a year on, the government hasn't learnt a single thing. Unlike the minister, aged care workers aren't blowing off work for VIP tickets to the ashes. Aged care workers, most of them who are in insecure and precarious jobs, are being pushed to the limit. Nine in ten aged care workers are either casual or part-time. They are in danger of their shifts being swapped or cut at the drop of a hat. Many have expected to remain on call all day, every day. Last year, Sherry Clark, a casual aged care nurse, told the Job Security Inquiry uh, Committee, I quote, you can't plan anything because you don't know what your roster is going to be from one fortnight to the next. When my mother went through cancer, I couldn't tell her that I would support her to, for her cancer appointments because if they're not available to pick up a shift, they don't offer you that shift the next time. Now, for all this, they are woefully underpaid. These are people tasked with looking after our parents and our grandparents. These are workers sometimes responsible for every facet of senior Australians' day-to-day -day lives. And they're receiving pay barely above the minimum wage. Another casual aged care worker, Anu Singh, told the Job Security Committee the last year that at her workplace, place, there were just two carers for 20 residents. They would have 20 minutes with each resident, and I quote, in those 20 minutes, we used to wake up our residents, who were about 90 years old, and do showering, toileting, dressing and undressing, tidy up their rooms, make their beds, and then take them slowly to their dinner. Can you imagine doing all that in just 20 minutes while making barely above the minimum wage? Even before the pandemic, that sounds like an, and this is of course even before the pandemic. The aged care system is doing extremely well. And then putting a complete botched COVID-19 response on top of that. So I support in the strongest terms the health services union's comments, who have called on the government to back the HSU's application for a decent aged care wage rise. And is the absolute least this government can do for those workers. The other point I want to cover is the stress the pandemic is having on, as a result of the government responses to problems within the supply chains. We have seen workers like at those at Tees Meatworks in Narra Court forced to work while COVID positive. We have seen truck drivers and supply chain workers continue to work tirelessly to keep shelves stocked. Even as the government stands by and allows their jobs to be undermined by companies like Uber and Amazon, the race to the bottom. We have seen retail and logistics workers forced to continue working even without fair access to rapid antigen tests. And this week, the Retail Supply Chain Alliance came to Canberra to call for government backing for the new supply chain safety principles. The three principles are very simple but very important. The first is that we need COVID safety supply chains. That means free and accessible rapid antigen tests for transport, logistic and retail workers. Not just for their own personal safety, but to keep all Australians safe and to keep supply chains running. The second principle is that we need to secure working conditions in supply chains. That means immediate government action 
to stop the race to the bottom on worker conditions being driven by companies like Amazon. And the third is that we need a supply chain committee. Throughout this pandemic, the government has failed to listen to advice from medical experts and from the industry. Instead of sensible planning and thoughtful solutions, we had ideas like children driving forklifts. Just absurd. We need a committee that brings together government, industry, unions and workers to find real solutions to supply, to supply chain issues and to ensure that we don't have any more stupid and deadly ideas like kids on forklifts. Supply chain workers, aged care workers, health workers and workers across Australia deserve better than insecure work, wages failing up to keep up with the cost of living and a shortage of rapid antigen tests. This government needs to act and it needs to act now. It's not a job well done. Senator Davey. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to remind the chamber of, of the motion we're actually debating here tonight because um, it hasn't been clear when you listen to the contributions from those on the other side. Uh, this motion, which was put forward by Labor, uh, talks about the disastrous COVID summer, um, accuses the government of failing to listen to warnings, failing to take responsibility for ordering rapid antigen tests and failing to learn from past mistakes. Um, now, I wonder how Labor would have done anything differently when you actually look at the timelines, when you actually look at what was happening right around the world and when you consider the scientific and expert advice that we are always told we've got to listen to. Listen to the experts, listen to the scientists, take on board what they're saying and act according to that advice. Well, let me remind people that even as late as August last year, the advice from the AHPPC was discouraging the use of rapid antigen tests when the prevalence of COVID was low. They said rats in August last year should only be used as a precautionary, precautionary surveillance measure and they recommended their use only for health care settings. But according to Labor, somehow we should have ignored that advice and preempted things even before the Therapeutic Goods Authority had even approved the use of rats at, for home use. We were actually ahead of the game because as soon as the TGA approved point of care use of rats, we entered into agreements with suppliers, we secured 4.45 million rat tests and we commenced a trial for point of care rat testing in aged care settings. But Labor would like to ignore that fact and pretend that it all only occurred over summer. Over summer. Our summer, which was the European winter, at which time the whole world was struggling to source enough rats. But somehow we should have miraculously been able to access them when countries like the United States, Europe, the UK, Canada all could not fulfil their own demand for rats. We should have been immune to a global supply shortage during a global pandemic, according to Labor. Well, that's just living in fairyland, really. Don't forget as well that even after the TGA had approved use for rats in home settings, even after 
the government had started a procurement program. The states had still not approved their use. Let's not forget that when Omicron raised its ugly head in Australia in late November, and when the states responded by shutting their borders, it was the states who insisted that they would take nothing short of a PCR test as proof of COVID negativity. Queensland kept that up all the way until January, such that the demand for PCR tests in New South Wales did go through the roof, not from people showing symptoms of COVID, not from people who were close contacts, but from people who wanted to go on holiday, from people who wanted to visit their family. And Senator Sheldon talks about the squeeze on our freight and supply chains. Well, the squeeze was exacerbated by these state-based policy principles that required all truckies to have PCR tests because rat tests weren't good enough. This was state labour demanding PCR tests so that their trucks carrying their groceries could get over the border to deliver to their supermarket shelves. Labor somehow thinks that we had a crystal ball. Somehow, according to Labor, we should have been able to foresee Omicron. Who only declared, as in the World Health Organization, only declared Omicron a variant of concern on the 26th of November? by which stage we had already entered into these rat trials at aged care settings. We had already commenced a procurement program, but we still didn't have Omicron in our country, and no one could have predicted the scourge that Omicron brought. And I want to also talk about the issues in aged care settings. COVID has always represented a risk in aged care. From the very first COVID outbreak in aged care that occurred in New South Wales in 2020, we established a surge workforce to support facilities where staff were sidelined through COVID infection or close contact or where they just needed support. This surge workforce has been in place ever since, available for every state and for any facility that requested it. To date, that surge workforce has covered over 80,000 shifts. And yes, at the moment, Omicron is rapidly spreading and our workforce needs to adjust. And yes, we now have the Defence Force assisting in that area. But somehow Labor thinks that they would have foreseen all of this. I want to take this opportunity to thank our aged care workforce and the surge workforce and the defence force who have all worked tirelessly to do their utmost to keep the residents of our aged care facilities healthy and safe. I want to acknowledge that working in aged care is difficult at the best of times regardless of COVID. It is a very sad fact that people in aged care facilities pass on. It's worse when they pass on separated from their families due to quarantine requirements in response to a one in a hundred year pandemic. I feel for those who work in this situation and I feel for the families that have lost their loved ones I don't care whether the resident has passed away from COVID, with COVID or without COVID. It's always sad. It's always a loss. But Labor seem to be implying that if they were in charge, things would be different. So I want to know how. It's all very well and good to stand here and throw stones when you've got no responsibility for cleaning up the shards of glass afterwards. But, Labor, how would you have addressed the situation to ensure that facilities were not locked down 
during the various waves of COVID to ensure families still had access to their loved ones. Because I don't see how. I have family in hospital right now that can't be visited by anyone because they're all operating under COVID restrictions. We're in this place operating under COVID restrictions, but somehow Labor would wave a magic wand and it wouldn't be occurring. How would Labor make sure that staff at our aged care facilities would not come into contact with COVID and would be available for 100 per cent of their shifts so they didn't need a surge workforce, so they didn't need the defence force? Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but you cannot judge our government on what you know now for hindsight. Judge us on where we are at today, on how we have responded and learnt and adapted to ensure we continue to have a strong economy, record low unemployment, the high, one of the highest vaccination rates and one of the lowest COVID death rates in the world. I think we've done quite well, all things considered. Thank you. Senator Steele-John. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This, this summer has been a summer from hell for disabled people. It has been a summer of fear, a summer of isolation and a summer of death. Disabled people have died across our community and the Morrison government bears responsibility. The incompetence, the absolute and total inability to listen to disabled people when we reach out to our government, as we have done through every stage of this pandemic. At the beginning, when we thought we were going to drop dead any minute, we put everything aside, put aside our historic knowledge that at the hands of this government, all oh, how we have suffered, we put that aside and attempted to work to keep our community safe. We did so many unpaid hours of work, organisations that have been structurally underfunded for the best part of a decade put everything on hold to come and sit with you people at a table and offer our best hopes and our lived experience and our expertise for the sole goal of keeping our friends and our family and our loved ones alive. And you did what you always do. You took our good faith and you repaid it with tokenism. And once we started to get a bit annoying, you shut us out of the process. And you failed us through the first wave. You failed to order the vaccine. You failed to roll the thing out. When it stopped working as it should have, you deprioritised us. You deprioritised disabled people to cover up your own incompetence. Through Delta, you failed to get us PPE. You failed to invest in ventilation. You failed to order the tests that your own Prime Minister was out at press conferences saying we would need. And it all came to bear in Omicron. Driven by your corporate donors, so desperate to begin making money again, you rammed down the borders and the protective mechanisms. People like the Premier of New South Wales lectured the community, lectured the community about the need to stand up to COVID, to live with the pandemic. Well, for a disabled person, for an older person, for the immunocompromised, for First Nations people, there is no living with COVID-19 unprotected, unvaccinated, unsupported, we die and we have died and we will continue to die under this government and you bear that responsibility. We had so many chances as a nation to get this right, so many opportunities to order the right vaccines, to give people the money they needed to manage 
to give people access to the PPE, to put the ventilators in the schools, to give people the confidence and ability to manage this together. And at every turn, because it was too inconvenient, because it cost your donors too much money, because it dared to suggest that there is such thing as a society wherein one and other have a mutual obligation to each other, you rejected it. And two years in, two years in, not a single person in the Australian government can tell me how many disabled people have died. Because nobody has been collecting the data. And every day, chief health officers, state premiers go out to the media, they give the COVID death figures, but they assure us so many of these people had underlying conditions. So many of them were at the end of life or had a terminal condition. Complex, co-occurring morbidities. 40% of the Australian population either has a disability or an underlying condition, and this government and state governments have written us off as an acceptable collateral casualty. Not good enough. The Greens do not accept it. We will never accept it. Senator we will Steele always gone. push Your back. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, across the country, millions of Australians have experienced a summer of COVID chaos that they simply did not need to have. More vaccine delays, a COVID testing disaster, critical staff shortages everywhere, and yet another aged care crisis. And none of it was inevitable, none of it. All of it was preventable. If only the Morrison government had listened to any of the experts that were ringing the alarm bells. If only they had listened to the experts who were saying that the government needed a plan to open up safely. At the end of last year, Prime Minister Morrison was out there urging us all to get used to COVID normal, uh, saying that it was time for government to get out of our lives, revving us up for an open summer. Uh, but unlike this Prime Minister, COVID doesn't like to take holidays, and the government should have had a plan for that. Uh, instead, the Prime Minister checked out over the summer again, and he did that as the Omicron wave hit. And at that time, it was Australians who were ready. Australians wanted to do the right thing to protect their families, to protect their communities. They wanted to get tested. They wanted to stay safe. They wanted to be able to go to work. They were ready, but the Morrison government was not. Within days of restrictions easing, and travel restrictions easing, we saw absolute chaos. We saw PCR tests being overwhelmed. We saw people lined up uh, for miles waiting to get tested, only to be turned away. No one could find a rapid antigen test uh, across the country, uh, and we were in crisis again a crisis that was not inevitable, a crisis all because the Prime Minister failed to plan again. He failed to heed the warnings again. He failed to listen to the experts again. And as early as September last year, the Australian Medical Association warned the government publicly, and we all know that they needed a plan for rapid antigen tests to support a safe reopening. The government rejected that advice, saying something about not wanting to intervene in the private market. Well, we all saw what the private market did later on. Then in October, the government ignored the calls by the Council of Small Business to provide rapid antigen tests. They dismissed calls from small business that they needed rat tests to keep their doors open. And even before that, uh, a year before that, Australian manufacturers had approached the government about providing rapid antigen tests made here in Australia for Australians. What happened with that? Government sent them away, said we don't need them. Meanwhile, other countries who had real leaders, real leaders who were on the ball, knew that they needed rapid antigen tests and started putting 
calls in, orders in, with our Australian manufacturers. So why didn't Prime Minister Morrison? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do that? Why couldn't he see what was happening overseas? That in the UK, free tests had been available since April 2021. That in Singapore, they were in vending machines. But despite all of these warnings, despite these representations from small business, despite these representations from the manufacturers, despite representations from the medical experts, the government refused to heed any of these warnings. They refused to take the advice. The Morrison government simply failed to act and they left Australians without a plan B. And it was Australians who were left over the summer to pay the price for these failures, literally at $10 to $15 per rapid antigen test, if you could find one, if you could get your hands on one. Now, I spoke to pharmacists in regional Victoria, and out of 20 that I contacted over the summer, none of them knew when they were going to get any supply of rapid antigen tests. The Morrison government turned COVID testing into a lottery this summer. They turned our health system into a lottery this summer, and Australians are still paying the price for that failure. Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I thank you for this MPI today. I didn't get a question in question time, so it's wonderful to be able to answer Dorothy Dixer. Thank you. The, I say it's a Dixer because it is clear to everyone that the Morrison government's COVID-19 response has been an overwhelming success. Has it been perfect? No. And the Prime Minister has acknowledged that, as has the leader in the Senate. However, the overall response to the pandemic by the Morrison government has been one of the best in the world. And that is simply fact. When it comes to dealing with a once-in-a-century pandemic, there is no playbook, there is no history to guide the government or decision makers on what has worked previously and what has not. Now, Labor love coming in here with their hindsight goggles on. I think their hindsight goggles work so well they could walk in here backwards. Maybe they could have tell, told me how I could have avoided getting COVID over summer which was confirmed by a rat test, which I bought at my local pharmacy. Now, there was undoubtedly things can go wrong, and they did, as we've acknowledged. But what is important is how we learn from these mistakes and how we respond to these lessons. And this is something that the government has done extremely well on any measure. You only have to look at the vaccine rollout last year. On the 21st of March, the Prime Minister announced publicly that the Australian government had a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And guess what? We saw that actually occur. We hit 80 per cent vaccinated by the end of October. Now, no one said that the vaccine rollout was going to be in a straight line or some perfect model that, uh, that Labor seemed to think was the Prime Minister's one and only job, or sorry, was it two jobs that you, you think the Prime Minister does, shows you're not fit for the job. Of course it was going to ramp up exponentially. We delayed the rollout deliberately over summer because we did not have COVID in the country. We watched what other countries did. We learned from how they rolled theirs out. And then we accepted the, those, we learnt those lessons and moved from there. There were countries that had uh, COVID breakouts that were killing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, and needed the vaccine more than we did. And, and they got it ahead of us, which I think we should all accept is the right thing. But we still met our promise to the Australian people. The Prime Minister made a promise and we met it. There were definitely hurdles along the way, such as the change of health advice on the AstraZeneca vaccine. However, the gov government responded to those changes, and now we are one of the world's most vaccinated countries. As it currently stands, Australia has over 95 per cent of the population with a first dose and over 93 per cent protected with a second dose. 
This ranks as six out of all OECD countries in the world and must be celebrated as a remarkable achievement. Now, I think it's important to remind Senator Brown that the effects of the Omicron outbreak had global repercussions which has affected supply chains around the world. It is not just Australia that these supply chains were, that, uh, these supply chains were put under pressure. But globally, we have seen issues occurring. But lucky for us, the Morrison government acted swiftly and decisively to mitigate the squeeze on supply chains and worked with industry at every level to iron out these problems. Decisions such as the change of food and grocery supply chain, close contact arrangements, undoubtedly had a positive impact on these issues. With all aspects of the COVID-19 response, the government has followed the expert medical advice. The first three rapid antigen self-tests were only approved by the TGA on the 13th of October for supply from the 1st of November. So, of course, we started from a different position because we didn't have massive outbreaks. We dealt with them at that time. Rats were not a suitable testing regime for Delta. But since then, the government has worked to ensure they are available to those who need them. The Commonwealth provides free rats to residential aged care facilities, of which we are responsible. We have already provided millions of rats to re residential aged care centres, and it was the Morrison government's response that has kept Australians safe while not destroying our economy, as the Labor Party would have. Senator Van, your time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on pages 5 to 10 of today's order of business. On page 5, we have two documents listed. Does anyone wish to take note of either document? We'll go then to page 6. From 2 to 16, uh, that does any senator wish to take note of any document? We'll now move to page 7, number 17 to 33. Would any senator like to take note of any document listed? Move to page eight. Documents thirty four to forty eight. Are there any senators that would like to take note of the do any document listed? Proceed to page nine. Documents forty nine and fifty. Would any Senator would like to take note of either document? No. We'll go to page 10, document, documents 51 and 52. Would any senator like to take note of either document? No. Then that concludes the consideration of documents. We will now go to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you. Um, on behalf of the chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, uh, I present the Delegated Legislation Monitor number two of 2022. Um, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. All of that, is of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Davey. Um, on behalf of the Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, um, I present three reports. Uh, as listed at item 19 of today's order of business. The Intelligence Oversight and Other Legislation Amendment 
Integrity Measures Bill 2020, the review of Part 14 of the Telecommunications Act 1997, and a review of the amendments made by the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Act. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Davey. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Law Enforcement, I present the report of the Committee on the Criminal Code Amendment Sharing of Abhorrent Violent Material Act 2019, together with accompanying documents. Uh, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, I present the report of the Committee on the Opportunities and Challenges of the Engagement of Traditional Owners in the Economic Development of Northern Australia. Deputy Senator, President, Senator Dodson. could I speak on that matter now or at some time? No, you can speak now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I rise uh, to take note of the final report of the inquiry into the engagement of traditional owners in the economic development of Northern Australia. The committee began this inquiry over three years ago in the last parliament and revived it after the 2019 election. When Rio Tinto destroyed the 46,000-year-old rock shelters at Jugan Gorge in May 2020, the committee suspended this inquiry to investigate that de devastating event. And there is a strong connection between these two inquiries. The committee has returned again and again to the question of how First Nations peoples can share in the economic development of the North because it poses a central challenge not just for the First Nations peoples, but for Northern Australia and the nation as a whole. The destruction of Jugan Gorge reveals how easily First Nation interests in land have been disregarded in the pursuit of wealth. And it demonstrated just how little First Nation peoples have benefited from the development of the North. Despite significant recognition of their interest in these lands over the last 50 years, most land in Northern Australia is subject to some form of uh, First Nations tenure, either under land rights regimes or native title. Yet poverty is increasing in many remote communities. This has been rightly called a cruel paradox. As the chair of our committee has said in his forward to this report, title to land is by itself not enough. Some mistakenly attribute this poverty to the collective forms of First Nations tenure held by First Nations people. They argue that First Nations tenure should be reformed to bring it in line with Western concepts of land ownership, specifically fungible free old title. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of the importance of First Nations' unique connectivity to country. And it's not surprising that those who advocate this approach often have the most to gain by assimilating First Nations tenure into mortgageable form. In his 1974 report on the recognition of Aboriginal land rights in the Northern Territory, Justice Edward Woodward described the aims of land rights as including, and I quote, the preservation of the spiritual link with his own land which gives each Aboriginal his sense of identity and which lies at the heart of his spiritual beliefs, unquote. The recognition of pre-existing collective and deeply spiritual interest in land was also the basis of the High Court Mabo decision nearly two decades later. There needs to be an innovative solution, seeking to protect these unique features of First Nations land title does not mean staying stuck in the past. We must find new, innovative solutions that will enable First Nations people to derive benefit from their land. A good deal of effort should uh, focus on seeking reform of financial and commercial systems to enable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to leverage their title while retaining intact their unique uh, characteristics. We are an innovative country, and this should not be beyond us. Several of the committee's reports relate to strengthening First Nations tenure and making it more meaningful. Central to this is the principle of free, prior and informed consent, endorsed by Australia in the, Dec in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Free, prior and informed consent 
empowers First Nations people to give or withhold consent to projects that affect them and their lands. But as the committee recognised, in order to exercise this right, First Nations communities must be well resourced and equipped so they can be free from any form of coercion in decision making. This is why the committee has reiterated its recommendations from the Jugan report that there should be a review of the Native Title Act to address the inequities between traditional owners and proponents. It's also why the committee has recommended increasing funding for the PVCs and representative bodies. It is critical that these um, institutional structures have sufficient financial resources, human resources and expertise to enable them to operate effectively within the native title and land rights regimes. Township leasing is a perfect example of the importance of these principles. Township leasing in the Northern Territory was a product of the Howard era and was originally introduced without Aboriginal support. While I share a hope expressed in the committee's report that new, uh, new forms of community-led township leasing could unlock potential, its success depends on an adherence to the principle of free, prior and informed consent. In conclusion, Madam Chair, I uh, thank my fellow committee members and our Chair and Deputy Chair for their continued interest and commitment in pursuing these important issues. I urge the government to make all efforts to implement the committee's recommendations. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I understand that uh, Senator Green. Sorry, Senator Cox, are you speaking on the same report? Please proceed. Thank you, Acting uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to speak to the tabling of the inquiry report into the opportunities and challenges of the engagement of traditional owners in econo economic development in Northern Australia. This inquiry canvassed a number of important issues regarding economic development opportunities and challenges for traditional owners, including the role of land rights, native title, representative bodies and government entities. I was pleased to see the inquiry highlighted an important point that I have continued to raise since becoming, since becoming a senator. First Nations people are not opposed to economic development. The breadth of evidence presented to the committee clearly demonstrated that First Nations people want to take up economic opportunities across Northern Australia. We want to do this while strengthening our communities and maintaining our ongoing connection to country and to culture. This was eloquently explained by Mr Yingana Mark Gyunga, MLA from the perspective of the Yunga people. Yunga are not opposed to economic initiatives on our lands. Quite the opposite. We need to create pathways for sustainable business development that upholds our traditional decision-making processes and our law and respects our authority for determining economic development on our country. There is a great desire to create and build business rather than receiving royalties that becomes sit-down money. However, in order to make the most of economic development opportunities, First Nations people need to be placed at the centre of decision making, as noted by the Kimberley Land Council. Past experience proves that when engaged by government and industry in good faith, traditional owners are empowered to identify commercial opportunities which use resources sustainably, thus protecting indigenous held core values of country and culture while building strong communities and capability. As noted in the inquiry report, there are limits to the extent that conventional approaches to economic development in First Nations communities can be effective. This is a timely reminder to governments and policy makers that we should not be imposing a uniform approach to economic development. Instead, I believe there is a strong case for looking towards new and emerging approaches to development that will improve our capacity as First Nations people to self-determine our future. The committee looked into a broad range of economic and social development enterprises being pursued by First Nations communities, including cultural enterprises, tourism, environmental enterprises, ranger programs, pastoralism and mining. Carbon farming is a wonderful example of an environmental enterprise that is already resulting in strong economic returns for traditional owners. 
As at December 2021, there were 33 Indigenous-owned, operated savannah fire management projects. The Indigenous carbon industry is now estimated to be valued around $53 million per annum. Indigenous carbon credits are, are also attracting a substantial premium on the voluntary market due to the multiple benefits they deliver both to communities and to the environment. Savannah burning and fire management generate huge social, cultural and environmental benefits that provide hundreds of jobs on country for our mob. I'm looking forward to hearing more about traditional owners becoming key players in the aquaculture and blue carbon farming industry. Indigenous ranges are another example of programs that deliver real benefits for First Nations communities. The Indigenous Ranger program not only creates jobs on country, but also provides long-term career paths in conservation and land management. The Greens strongly support the recommendation that the Australian government provide enhanced support for the Indigenous Ranger program, including the provision of a secure long-term funding to facilitate strategic planning for sustainable environmental outcomes. Renewable energy is also offers ample economic opportunities for traditional owners in Northern Australia. One example highlighted in the committee's report was the renewable energy sector strategy implemented by the Indigenous Business Australia, or commonly known as IBA. This strategy has assisted in replacing diesel fire electricity generation with renewable energy and storage solutions in remote communities. The shift to solar power has allowed MOB to live more independently on their own country. If we're going to really support traditional owners to make the most of economic opportunities, we need to advance innovative approaches that are led by First Nations people. One of these opportunities comes in the form of a First Nations trade-led strategy. At the moment, there is no foreign investment going into First Nations businesses in Australia, but by securing Indigenous inclusions in our free trade agreements, we could tap into a $100 billion Indigenous economy. And I hope the Northern Australian Committee can continue to look at the economic benefits of a First Nations trade-led strategy, especially following the table of the UK um, Australian Free Trade Agreement today. It would be remiss of me not to mention some of the government's policies and programs that actually hold traditional owners back from taking advantage of economic opportunities. One of the key barriers that comes to mind is the use of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, also known as NAIF, to fund projects that First Nations people do not consent to. Projects that harm country instead of protecting it, like the Perdaman fertiliser plant near Murujuga, or the fossil fuel projects across the top end. If we are serious about self-determination, we cannot have projects like NAIF going against the interests and the wishes of traditional owners. I would like to end this on some observations about the role of mining and resources sector that play in the economic development space for Northern Australia. As noted in the inquiry's report, the power imbalance between traditional owners and de development proponents needs to be redressed through better resourcing and institutional capacity. In line with this, I welcome the committee's recommendation for increased funding for PVCs and funding for capacity building. However, as outlined in my additional comments, the capacity to negotiate good quality agreements with proponents isn't just about resourcing. It's also due to the absence of free prior informed consent. When negotiating agreements, proponents often undertake inadequate consultation process. As evidenced in the Duke and Gorge inquiry, there are many examples of proponents not properly engaging with traditional owners on affected country. Until the principle of free prior informed consent is embedded in our legislative frameworks, First Nations people will continue to face barriers to pursuing economic opportunities that protect country and culture. It is time for Australian governments on all levels to fully implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. First Nations knowledges and culture is not a challenge to economic development in Northern Australia. It is a strength. 
Some of the best solutions to the current challenges faced by traditional owners will be those that uphold communities' decision-making processes, support the protection of country and improve our capacity to self-determine our future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Cox. Uh, I'll go to yes. Senator Cox, would you like to be in continuation? I'd like to what, sorry? Yes. Be in continuation. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Uh, oh, Senator, Senator Sukone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'll be very quick. I present the first report of the 2022 Standing um, Committee of Senators' Interests on behalf of Senator Billick and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator Feveranti Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, uh, President. I rise to speak to the table. Could I just ask Senator Feveranti Wells, are you seeking leave? I am. The, the report, I understand, was tabled before, Four. and now I'm now moving to take note of the report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I rise to speak to the tabling of the committee, uh, the committee's delegated legislation monitor, two of 2022. Before commenting on the monitor, I have just, uh, which has just been tabled, I would like to draw the chamber's attention to an instrument which the committee raised in Monitor One of 2022, which was presented out of sitting in January. The Treasury Laws Amendment Greater Transparency of Proxy Advice Regulations 2021 impose new obligations on financial services licensees who provide proxy advice. These obligations include requiring proxy advisers to provide their advice to entities that are the subject of that advice and requiring relevant licensees to be independent of their clients. Importantly, these measures will be achieved by the regulations modifying the Corporations Act without the need for amending legislation to be passed. Ordinarily, the corporation's regulations are limited to imposing penalties of $11,100 on individuals and $111,000 on body corporates. This is an important safeguard to ensure significant penalties are only imposed after careful consideration by the parliament. However, as this instrument modifies the Corporations Act, individuals will be subject to civil penalties of up to $1.1 million and body corporates will be subject to civil penalties of up to $11.1 million. Individuals will also be subject to criminal offences that could see them imprisoned for up to five years. The committee is concerned that these significant penalties are being imposed without full parliamentary consideration. Adding to the committee's concern in relation to these substantial penalties is the lack of clarity of drafting of key terms. For example, further clarity could be provided in relation to the requirement for proxy advisers to be independent of the entities which they advise. This lack of clarity could leave licensees unaware of what is required of them and may lead to inconsistent application by regulators. The committee is particularly concerned that delegated legislation is being utilised to implement these significant new obligations, which may have a major impact on the business model and operation of existing businesses that provide that provide proxy advice. While the committee does not comment on the policy merit or otherwise of these changes, the committee considers that it would be more appropriate for such significant matters to be dealt with by way of primary legislation so that these matters can receive full parliamentary scrutiny. The committee has written to the Treasurer seeking his advice regarding these significant matters. Now, turning to the monitor that has just been tabled, I would like to draw the Chamber's attention to the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment, Health Measures No. 6, Regulations 2021. This instrument establishes legislative authority for government spending on COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine compensation scheme. At the outset, I wish to emphasise that the establishment of a compensation scheme for those who suffer adverse uh, effects of a vaccine mm -hmm. is not at issue. 
What is at issue is that there is no parliamentary oversight whatsoever of crucial aspects of the scheme, such as the eligibility criteria or the level of compensation that may be provided. The committee expects that a scheme of such national significance would ordinarily be established through primary legislation. Instead, the crucial aspects of the scheme are not even included in the delegated legislation. In fact, the provision in the instrument which sets out authority for the entire vaccination compensation scheme is a mere 93 words. All of the detail in relation to the operation of the scheme is provided for by guidance material which is beyond parliamentary scrutiny and can be changed at any time and without any oversight. The committee is concerned about instruments which do the bare minimum of establishing a program and then leave the substantive content to be provided for by guidance material. Such instruments not only fail to meet what we as senators should expect technically sound and robust instruments to be, but they diminish our ability to provide scrutiny. We should be vigilant in relation to this trend going forward as it undermines our role of providing proper parliamentary oversight over the executive government. In addition to these concerns, the instrument provides no indication as to the anticipated cost of the scheme. The Senate is being asked to wave through a program with potentially unlimited spending that is supported by a legislative provision of less than 100 words. The committee considers this completely unacceptable. The committee has previously written to and received advice from the Minister for Finance and the Minister for Health and Aged Care on these issues and will now write again seeking the minister's further advice. The, committees will, the committee will emphasise in its correspondence that although the scheme is already in operation, there is a serious possibility that the committee will recommend that the Senate disallow the instrument if its scrutiny concerns are not resolved. To this end, I advise the Chamber that tomorrow I will give a protective notice of motion to disallow the instrument on behalf of the committee. Finally, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight the committee's significant concerns in relation to the failure of ministers to respond uh, the committee's scrutiny concerns in a timely manner. This includes a response from the Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction in relation to the Australian Renewable Energy Agency General Funding Strategy Determination 2021. Another significantly overdue response is a response from the Minister for Health and Aged Care in relation to the biosecurity, human biosecurity emergency human coronavirus with pandemic potential variation, extension number three, instrument 2021. Both responses were due in November last year. I would like to take this opportunity to remind ministers of the resolution of the Senate of 23 February last year concerning the engagement of ministers and agencies with the committee. In this resolution, the Senate calls on all ministers and agencies to respond to the committee's request for information within the time frames set by the committee. The committee works on a non-partisan basis to resolve its scrutiny concerns and relies on timely and constructive engagement from all ministers and agencies in order to fulfil its mandate. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor 2 of 2022, to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Feveranti Wells. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I present the committee's first report of 2022. And on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the committee's 199th report. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Just allow a few minutes for the magic of the chamber to happen. So what are we up to? I think uh, Senator Kitching has a report to uh, speak to. 
hence the, uh, the shuffle of chair <laughs> duty. Thank you very much, Senator, um, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity, so I would wish to um, speak to the tabling of the Senate Economics References Committee's report into the Australian manufacturing industry. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak on the report of the Senate Economics References Committee on Australia's manufacturing industry. I want to thank my colleague, Senator Chisholm, the chair of the committee and the other members of the committee for the work that has gone into this report. I also want to thank Sen um, Mr Mark Fitt, the committee secretary, and other members of the secretariat for the support that they have given to the committee's work. This is a timely report as we are nearing the end of this parliament and the voters will soon have an opportunity to decide our country's course for the next three years. Among, I think, the many issues that will be before the voters will be industry policy. And as the majority and minority reports now before the Senate make clear, the voters will have a choice because the policy approaches um, from the coalition and from the Labor opposition are different. This report documents the sharp decline in Australia's manufacturing cap capacity over the last 30 years. As a share of the total economy, manufacturing has fallen from about 16 per cent in 1986 to 7 per cent today. Over the past 20 years, employment in manufacturing has fallen by 100,000, while employment in the services sector has correspondingly risen. Australia has shifted from a manufacturing economy to a services economy. This seismic shift in the Australian economy has been the direct result of the economic reforms of the Hawke and Keating governments between 1983 and 1996, particularly the demolition of the tariff wall that had sheltered Australia's inefficient and non-competitive manufacturing industry since Federation. I don't make any apologies for those reforms. I'm glad of them. I'm glad of the consequences of them. Despite the cost to Australia in terms of manufacturing employment, the Hawke-Keating reforms have been of huge overall benefit to Australia. One of the reasons that we have had 30 years of almost uninterrupted growth and prosperity is that inflation has been held down by waves of very cheap consumer goods from Asian countries, which means that wage gains achieved through higher productivity have not been eroded by inflation as they were before 1983. But we have to acknowledge that the world of 2022 is not the world of 1983. Under Deng Xiaoping and his successors, the People's Republic of China seemed to be heading towards becoming a genuine market economy, towards integration into the global rules-based trading system represented by the World Trade Organization, and towards becoming a reliable and responsible trading partner for Australia. Instead, under President Xi Jinping, China has reverted to a state-directed economy in a quest for regional hegemony in both the economic and political spheres and to a trade policy which rewards subservience to the Chinese Communist Party's agenda and punishes countries such as Australia, which defy Beijing's diktats. This development has exposed the perils of over-reliance on a single trading partner, a single market for our exports and a single source of imported manufactured goods, particularly high-end, high-tech goods. And we find ourselves dangerously exposed here. Remember, we didn't have enough PPE in the last couple of years. Indeed, as Labor's Trade and Resources Shadow Minister Madeleine King, who may I say would serve excellently in these roles in government, has called for a diversification of Australia's trade profile. She has argued, as have I, that we should be doing much more to engage with India, and especially our neighbour to the north, Indonesia, which has a fast-growing middle class, as well as other regional ASEAN nations. Our dilemma has further been cruelly exposed by the supply crisis brought on by the COVID pandemic, now entering, unfortunately now entering its third year. So as I've said, we face excessive shortages of masks, of personal protective equipment, respirators, of vaccines, more recently of rapid antigen tests. It must be acknowledged that a contributory factor that it has been the difficulty in securing these products at a time of universal demand for them, not least in the source country. So we may, must face up to the fact that Australia's manufacturing policy settings are no longer fit for purpose. We cannot go on with an economy that relies on bulk exports of raw materials such as iron ore and coal to pay for a stream of manufactured goods from China and other Asian countries. No one, 
certainly not I, no one is suggesting that we should return to the high tariff re regime of the decades before 1983. As the US under President Trump discovered to its cost, erecting tariff barriers just invites retaliation from trade part trading partners, starting a trade war which finishes up harming both sides. But Australia does need to take serious measures to stimulate a revival of manufacturing in this country, both for reasons of national security and so that we are never again caught short by a supply crisis of essential manufactured goods, as we have been over the past two years. The Labor members of the Senate Economics References Committee have made a series of carefully considered and economically responsible recommendations, which will, if implemented by an incoming Labor government, set our manufacturing industry policy in a new direction. They include measures to facilitate both public and private investment in manufacturing, both for export and for the domestic market. They propose measures to increase the level of superannuation fund investment in manufacturing industries. They propose significant increases in support for research and development to improve and stimulate the development of self-sustaining manufacturing. Most importantly, they urge the revival of Australia's vocational education sector, particularly by ensuring that vocational courses in occupations with current or forecast skills shortages are accessible and affordable. Only by doing this can we restore the skills base needed both for a viable defence manufacturing sector and for high-tech medical and scientific production, so we obviously which we obviously need much more of. Labor state governments, such as the Andrews government in my home state of Victoria, have begun this process by reviving the TAFE system after it was allowed to run down so dangerously by previous governments. But I think this requires national leadership, and that must come from a Labor federal government. I'd also like to note that Senator Patrick has supported the position taken by the Labor members of the committee. And I would say uh, that Senator Patrick has shown his usual good judgment. In his additional comments, aptly titled, Stop Just Exporting Rocks, Senator Patrick makes the point that as important as the resources sector is to the wealth and property prosperity of our nation, we cannot be content just being a quarry. No one is suggesting that we should abandon our resources sector. A rush to do so would, to do this would leave a huge revenue gap, not to mention the social devastation. Indeed, what would we replace this with in the short term? What services would need to be cut? What is clear, though, is that we need to couple this with more diversity in our economy. We rested on the economic windfalls that came in year after year in the lead up to the GFC, and now we're behind the eight ball when it comes to diversification. Part of the problem is this we lack complexity in our economy. We haven't invested enough in research and development or upstream value-added te value industries. And we heard uh, quite a lot of this in the evidence uh, on one of the hearing days. According to the, Atlas Harv the Harvard Atlas of Economic Complexity, an index that measures the, the sophistication, diversity and opportunities of various nations, Australia ranks, ranks 86 in the world on the list behind Iran, which is at 80, Albania is at 83, Paraguay, Paraguay is at 85, so Australia is at 86. While in many ways this is a simplistic measure, it does point to a problem. In contrast, Singapore, a country with almost no natural resources and that has to import both water and sand, ranks number five on the index. Since gaining independence in, Singapore, in 1965, Singapore has invested heavily in research and development to become a world leader in numerous industries, notably in fintech and pharmaceuticals. There is no reason Australia cannot do something similar if we put our mind to it. And of course, we also have the great example of Israel. Ensuring Australians are better educated, better trained for work, reskilled, has never been more important. If we don't do this, our economy is going to go backwards. We won't remain at 86. We'll be out of the atlas of economic complexity. Productivity growth should be front and centre on our list of policy priorities. From flight recorders, electronic pacemakers, Google Maps, pen penicillin, the bionic ear, plastic lenses, Gardasil and Wi-Fi, and even the Hills Hoist, Australian brains have provided countless inventions to, better, to the betterment of humanity. But we've stopped inventing things and we've stopped making things, and these success stories belie that today we have the same export profile as Uzbekistan. We all watch with horror as a former treasurer in the other place 
go to the local car industry to leave Australia. That was unacceptable and unforgivable. The men and women who worked in this industry, their families and loved ones, have not forgotten. When it comes to manufacturing in this country, we must have reformers and thinkers. Um, there is a dissenting report, which I presume Senator Scar, through you, Chair, Acting Deputy Chair, will speak to. Um, but there was a lot of interest, I think, from all committee members. Thank you. Senator Scar, do you wish to make a contribution on this report? Uh, yes, please, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. So I'll give you the call. I could. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and look, I do at the outset, I would like to recognise the outstanding contribution which Senator Kitching made uh, in relation to uh, this inquiry, and I do commend her in relation to that, and I echo her sentiments with respect to the outstanding job which the Secretariat uh, undertook in relation to preparing this report. And it is, uh, for those who are interested in looking at it sometime, uh, it is a, a good compendium of different views with respect to the future of manufacturing in our country. So where do we agree? In the first instance, we certainly agree with respect to the importance of manufacturing to our country. Unlike Senator Kitching and the majority members of the report, I am far more optimistic, far more optimistic with respect to the current status and the projections with respect to our manufacturing industry. All the evidence suggests that the federal government's modern manufacturing strategy has actually been successful, has been successful in terms of supporting critical parts of our manufacturing industry and addressing some of the concerns which Senator Kitching referred to. We are also in the, on the same page with respect to the importance of research and development, also with respect to the importance of vocational educational training. And again, I would say to the Senate, that there are many, many initiatives which have been extraordinarily successful to promote uh, both of those areas in a targeted and proportionate way. And it is there, it is that point at which our views diverge. Whereas the majority of report members of the Labor Party, Senator Patrick, believe in increased government-driven interventionist approach to promote manufacturing, we, being the dissenting members, uh, myself and Senator Bragg, believe that the approach is far better, one which is targeted and proportionate in this respect. And I want to touch on three areas which caused us substantial concern and led us to write such a strongly worded dissenting report. The first is the centrepiece, the centrepiece of the majority report, which is the establishment of what can only be called a mega manufacturing industry fund a $15 billion manufacturing industry fund, which is at the centrepiece of the majority report. And can I just say, in relation to the reasoning which supports this, this key recommendation of the majority report, the reasoning in the majority report is inconsistent. At section 5.2 of the majority report, it is stated, and I quote, the opportunity exists for government to establish a framework for manufacturing without running the risk without running the risk of favouring specific sectors or business models. And yet then, at section 6.9 of the majority report, it is stated, the committee supports a range of incentives and stimulus measures, including the provision of equity, co-investment, direct government investment, and facilitating private sector investment, including by superannuation funds. And I'll touch on that later. Hence, there's a gross inconsistency a gross inconsistency that goes to the heart of this key recommendation from the majority report. The reasoning then culminates in this key recommendation too, which provides the committee recommends that the Australian government establish a manufacturing industry fund to provide a range of co-investment incentives to the manufacturing industry in conjunction with the private sector. Mr Acting Deputy President, I say, instead of, instead of looking to subsidise private sector enterprises, look at the barriers to investment, look at the barriers to growth, look at the barriers to job creation and address those barriers instead of taking money out of the hands of Australian taxpayers and through a government siphon provide it to the private sector. There is a material issue going to the heart of this majority report. 
And I asked those Labor senators who were supporting it, supporting this initiative with respect to this mega manufacturing fund, why can't the particular venture attract equity investment or debt support? Why does it need government support? If the private sector will not invest its equity in a venture, nor commercial lenders advance sufficient debt funds, why should the government risk taxpayers' money? In our view, Mr Acting Deputy President, the focus should be on government policies which drive productivity and remove barriers to private sector investment. The second concern I want to raise in relation to the majority report goes to superannuation funds and the role of superannuation in, in our economy. In recommendation three, the majority report refers to the establishment of, and I quote, a superannuation task force to explore, develop and recommend structural changes and possible incentive-based programs and regulations to increase the level of Australian superannuation fund investment in Australian manufacturing industries, particularly those with an export focus, end quote. Senator Bragg and I strongly disagree with this recommendation. Superannuation funds should make investments in the best financial interests of the Australians who own those funds. The purpose of superannuation is to provide for the retirement of the Australians who work to earn those superannuation funds, not to support some collateral purpose, however well-intentioned. Any initiative which does not recognise this fundamental principle should be rejected. Government should not view superannuation funds as a potential pool of capital to be mobilised to achieve government policy objectives, however well-intentioned. The proposed task force and what it might lead to in practice is scant on detail. Phrases such as structural changes and possible incentive-based programs and regulations are a cause for substantial concern. At best, they may result in the distortion of decision-making processes to try and achieve a public policy aim which is collateral to the purpose of superannuation. At worst, they could drive or mandate by regulation, mandate investments which may not be in the best financial interests of members who own the superannuation. It is their superannuation, not the government's. The third area of concern is in relation to a number of recommendations relating to industrial relations matters. And whilst the, most of the language is vague and general in nature, it is cause for substantial concern that what it does is signal an intention for a far more centralised and interventionist industrial relations approach. And if, Mr Acting Deputy President, if I can just give you one example, there's a proposal here that the 2016 Australian Building Code actually be reviewed. Now, that building code is absolutely essential to underpinning the rights of Australian construction workers, subcontractors, small businesses, to freedom of association on Australia's construction work sites. It is a source of great concern to Senator Bragg and I that that, that 2016 Australian Building Code is being proposed for a review. We are extremely concerned that what that signals is that a future Labor government would be concerned, would be concerned to removing some of the protections against those members, in particular the CFMEU, have, who, in terms of their construction division, have not conducted themselves in accordance with Australia's industrial relations laws. And that causes Senator Bragg and I a great deal of concern. So with those uh, comments, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Stilgeon, I believe you wish to make a contribution on the Sterling Income Trust. Sterling Income Trust, yes. Yes, I just alert you that the hard marker is 20 past seven. But, how, but, I'll, get, but I'll give you the call and then you can go into continuance. Thank you. Um, having heard first hand the experiences of the victims of the collapse of the Sterling uh, First Income Trust, I want to acknowledge that the situation that has unfolded uh, should not have been allowed to happen. Retirees involved in the scheme sold their homes to free up funds and then move into uh, re rental properties managed by Sterling First. They expected to stay there comfortably for the rest of their lives. Instead, the victims of Sterling First were ripped off. 
with some left without their savings or indeed homeless. Instead of years building community and enjoying their retirements, uh, these older people have spent years lobbying, campaigning and trying to get justice for their circumstances, left behind and falling through the gaps within the law. People with a track record, such as those behind Sterling First, should not be able to sell financial products, and regulators such as ASIC should have intervened earlier to stop what was happening and avoid people being ripped off. I am pleased to read that some of the recommendations within these reports uh, include uh, that, such as that the Australian government take all necessary action to support investors in the sterling affected by the sterling uh, group company collection, including those who invested in the Sterling Income Trust and Silverlink preference shares, being able to access compensation scheme, uh, the Commonwealth Compensation Scheme of Last Resort, and that the Australian Government expand the scope of the Compensation Scheme of Last Resort to include managed investment schemes. I hope that these recommendations are picked up and actioned quickly uh, so that those deeply impacted get justice and can get back to their retirement in peace and joy. And I thank them uh, for their active advocacy um, and their determination uh, to ensure that their story was heard uh, and that their representatives uh, take notice of the injustice that had been done to them. Do you wish to go into continuance? No, no. not on that one. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I also um, want to speak to this report. I was the instigator of this inquiry before the Senate, uh, and it is true the devastating impacts on the victims of this financial collapse and the absolute failure of ASIC and the government to take timely action to address these issues. Well, uh, back in 2015, ASIC first had complaints about the Sterling Income Trust. Purportedly, they inquired into them. Then, in 2017, the state government had concerns about the scheme and referred the issue to ASIC in order to see uh, ASIC address the issue of their concerns. Now, the issue here is we have an investment product that is both a um, retail investment uh, where people invest in a managed investment scheme and it is at the same time a leasing arrangement. It was too good to be true, but no one told these vulnerable consumers that that was the case. They were told by the proponents of this scheme that they would be able to pay uh, their money up front, get a lease arrangement that would last 40 years, and at the end of those 40 years or their death, they would get all of their money back. They were told that this was ironclad and that their money was held in trust. Now, we've already seen through determinations uh, before AFCA that this company engaged in false and misleading conduct and that that has resulted in calls on the insurance uh, of these companies uh, in order to have those initial claims paid out. Now, the issue now is we know that this company engaged in false and misleading conduct, but we haven't seen adequate action taken from ASIC in regard in that regard. They were very slow to act. We've been told that they might be looking at um, uh, referrals to the Department of Public Prosecutions and the like, but frankly this is all too little too late. The product, dis the product disclosure statements the product, the product disclosure statements of um, these products were also false and misleading. And the buyer beware approach of ASIC, where our companies can say and do what they like and the regulator takes absolutely no accountability 
for what is said in a, in a product disclosure statement is, what, is part of what has seen these people lose their money. The product disclosure statements, one of which was withdrawn uh, in around 2019 um, because ASIC asked for it to be, because it was false and misleading. What did the company then go and do? It just put out more product disclosure statements with different variations, which conned people, more people out of their money into making this investment. It seems to me like all of the product disclosure statements attached uh, to this company would, if ASIC had looked closely enough, been false and misleading. When ASIC went and visited uh, the residents uh, who were renting homes through this scheme, uh, they did not disclose to them that there were problems with the scheme, and the people who were in those homes were none the wiser. They didn't know that their money was on the verge uh, of being lost and that, frankly, the company had already spent most of it, even though they had been told that it was held in trust. They had no uh, expectation to complain at the time because they did not have the insight and oversight as to how those investments were performing. But ASIC refused to look uh, and to, to intervene before the company collapsed. As to the State Department, the State Department uh, of DEMAS, yeah, uh, Department of Consumer Protection, DEMAS, they referred the issue to the Commonwealth back in 2017. They had legal tenancies in place. They had legal tenancies in place. Uh, but yes, they acknowledge that the nature of an investment that overlooks uh, a tenancy and the way it intersects is clearly an issue that federal and state governments need to look at together, which is exactly what the Commonwealth, uh, exactly what our committee has recommended. It's recommended uh, that this issue uh, be reviewed. I endorse the recommendations. I am uh, wholly horrified by what has happened to these victims of this financial collapse, and I wish I had longer to debate the issue tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We've hit the hard marker that uh, still income trust is in continuance. And Senator Scar, you know, we had to make your contribution on the next occasion. Minister. Uh, in accordance with the provisions of the Parliament Act of 19, sorry, 1974, I present a proposal for works within the parliamentary zone relating to the installation of a sculpture at the National Gallery of Australia. And I seek leave to give a motion in relation to the proposal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I give notice of the motion relating to the proposal, the full terms of which will be delivered to the clerk. By order, we move back to government business. Clerk. Government business, order of the day number one, mitochondrial donation law reform, Mabes Law Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. The whipping sheet indicates to me that there are no further senators that wish to speak on the bill. If no one indicates they wish to get the call, I will. Senator Wong to be incorporated into the Hansard. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution? Otherwise, I'll give the minister the call to sum up the debate. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill has been named in honour of Maeve Hood and the tireless work of her family to raise awareness and build support for those people in our community suffering from mitochondrial disease. It has been named the Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform Maeve's Law Bill 2021. Maeve is a young child who suffers from a type of severe mitochondrial disease. She can't talk, she can't walk independently. This also means, heartbreakingly, she may not see her next birthday. Despite these incredible challenges, Maeve is a fiercely loved family member, a little sister, a daughter, a niece and a granddaughter. Her family describe her as the most beautiful and sensitive little girl. However, even with the challenges they face, Maeve's parents, Sarah and Joel, are paving the way for other families to avoid their heartache, to have a biological child who does not suffer the debilitating effects of this disease. That's what Maeve's law seeks to achieve through carefully crafted process. 
Maeve's law will create this pathway through amendments to the Prohibition of Human Cloning for Reproduction Act 2002 and the Research Involving Human Embryos Act 2002. These amendments will harness new assisted reproductive technologies that will provide parents with the option to have their own biological child while minimising the risk of transmission of mitochondrial disease. These technologies fall under the umbrella of mitochondrial donation, a term that encompasses IVF-based assisted reproductive technology. With the help of a donor, it minimises the risk of a mother passing mitochondrial disease onto her child. It is new and it is complex, but it is not untested. Under stage one, mitochondrial donation will be legalised for lab-based research and training purposes. This will be followed by allowing some families to access the technique as part of a trial at one carefully selected licensed and Commonwealth funded clinic, making this technology more readily available in a range of clinical settings within stage two will be the subject of a separate decision of government. This decision will be informed by the success of stage one, expert opinion and community consultation. In developing Maeve's law, we have looked at the experiences of the United Kingdom, where mitochondrial donation was legalised in 2015. We have also had close regard to the outcomes of the 2018 Senate inquiry and consultations undertaken by the National Health and Medical Research Council over 2019-20. The development of this bill has been informed by the government's direct consultations. There has been extensive engagement with experts, scientists, clinicians and researchers, members of the community more broadly, advocacy groups, ethicists, our state and territory counterparts and fundamentally, of course, Sarah and Joel Hood. Collectively, this input, expertise and direct experience has shaped the introduction of this technology through the careful two-stage process proposed. Mr Acting Deputy President, I acknowledge that not all members of the community or this Senate uh, are comfortable with the use of this technology. And that is why a conscience vote has been called on this bill. And while our government is committed to providing families with access to this technology, we are also committed to ensuring it is being delivered safely and effectively every step of the way. For this reason, Maeve's law has inbuilt protections and safeguards. The bill provides for five different types of licences, with corresponding steps in stage one and two. Each of these licences will require an application to the NHMRC, which, after careful vetting, will then closely monitor the activities of that specialised clinic. In honouring Maeve, this bill seeks to offer hope. It offers hope to those parents who wish to avoid the possibility of passing on severe mitochondrial disease to their biological children, a disease that leaves one baby born each week with disabling suffering and with a life that will likely be cut short at around five years of age at most. Maeve's law will help to bring an end to this suffering. It will provide the pathway that gives parents greater certainty of opportunity to have biological children who are free from severe mitochondrial disease and for those children to have the best possible start and opportunities in life. On behalf of the government, I thank the key stakeholders and the broader community for their valuable feedback during the public consultation, which has been immensely important to inform the development of this bill. I also acknowledge uh, the personal work of the Minister for Health, Mr Hunt, uh, and indeed the commitment of the Prime Minister uh, in his work uh, with those uh, who have been affected by mitochondrial disease in seeking to bring this reform to the parliament. I thank senators for the various thoughtful, heartfelt contributions that have been made from different perspectives around the chamber, uh, but I do commend this bill in its presented form to the chamber for passage. I thank the Senate. I understand that there are amendments proposed to the bill, therefore we will go into committee of the whole. To put the question for the second reading. My apologies. I put the question that the bill be now read a second time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. We are now in the committee of the whole. Sorry? Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to human cloning and research involving human embryos and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to move amendment 1542 standing in my name. 
Uh, it seeks to amend Schedule 2, uh, and in effect, it's about introducing a degree of accountability and transparency to the MRT process that is the subject of the bill and the debate. Um, I, I'm particularly keen to uh, advance this amendment in light of the evidence that we were unable to actually ascertain as we undertook the inquiry through the Community Affairs Legislation Committee. Uh, which tabled this report, Mitochondrial Donation Law Reform, Maves Bill 2021 provisions in August 2021. Uh, we participated in what felt like a very rushed hearing, um, and perhaps that's why uh, today it's really important that we do take the time. We've had the time to have a look, and my amendment uh, really responds to the fact that when we look at the UK, the only other jurisdiction in the world where this uh, scheme, this technique is being operated, we were unable to get any data to explain to us about what was going on, to get an indication of what had happened in the five years that this scheme has been in place in the UK. And I don't think we need to make the same mistake in Australia. Australians expect us to uh, be transparent about what's going on, and Australians investing uh, $10 million, if this bill should pass, in a new technology that uh, requires radical change to the laws of this country to allow techniques that have been illegal for the last 20 years, uh, we deserve to know what's going on. So um, I believe that the long-term effects of germline editing should absolutely require a higher level of oversight from expert government agencies that's currently provided for in this bill. Um, and I, I do believe that there is a role for the existing government bodies to oversee this process as they, they would do in normal circumstances. So we need to let the efficacy and safety of these techniques first be proven through the rigours of scientific process before we, leg the, uh, we um, legalise them, and they should be um, given the scrutiny that is outlined in my amendment. I urge senators to vote for this common sense measure of a higher degree of accountability than currently exists within the bill. Does any other senator seek the call? Uh, senator Still John, I saw you first, then I'll, then I'll come to Senator. Uh, President, I'm more than happy for, for Senator Watt to go first, actually, right, if that's okay. Uh, Senator Watt, would you like to take the call? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, I would like to speak against uh, this amendment. Um, with greatest of respect to my colleague, Senator O'Neill, we have different views on this, this subject. Um, this uh, amendment changes the definition of gene technology to include mitochondrial donation. This would, in practice, require the addition of the gene technology regulator to become involved in the regulation of mitochondrial donation. Uh, in my view, um, this is an unnecessary additional step. Uh, it would duplicate and confuse matters given the expertise and responsibilities that already sit with the NHMRC Embryo Research Licensing Committee. Um, for those who aren't aware, the NHMRC Embryo Research Licensing Committee was established in 2002 and is responsible for overseeing the Research Involving Human Embryos Act 2002 and the Prohibition of Human Cloning for Reproduction Act 2002. Uh, these, of course, are the two laws which Maeve's law seeks to amend. Uh, as such, the committee considers applications for licences to conduct research involving human embryos. Um, issues those licences or chooses not to issue those licences. It monitors activities covered by those licences and other, other related activities, such as reporting to parliament and maintaining information. Uh, membership of this committee is comprised of individuals with expertise in research ethics, uh, assisted re reproductive technology, law, embryology and the regulation of assisted reproductive technology. Given both the responsibility of this principal committee for the relevant legislation and their expertise in the relevant law and scientific fields, uh, in my view, it is the most appropriate and qualified group within Australia to oversee the licensing regime outlined with Maeve's, within Maeve's law. So, as I say, um, uh, I understand where Senator O'Neill is coming from uh, on this, but in my view, the existing committee that uh, operates within the NHMRC umbrella is the appropriate body uh, to do this work, um, already does this type of work, and there's no need to um, uh, add a further regulatory body to this system. Thank you. 
Uh, Senator Still John has the call. Thank, thank you. Just get the mask off there, Mr. Tim Press. Um, all right. So in um, in talking to this uh, piece of legislation, this uh, amendment by uh, Senator O'Neill before the chamber, um, I want to make clear that as I will be, I'm the spokesperson for the Greens, obviously in the health space, and I'll be making contributions to this legislation. But we too have. Uh, decided as a party that this is a conscience vote. Um, so the contributions that I make in relation to these amendments are reflective of my personal position and don't necessarily reflect the views of my colleagues, um, and my vote won't necessarily be in the same direction as it is a conscience vote. Um, I'll come to the amendment directly uh, in a moment, but I just want to offer a couple of uh, a really quite authentic observations. Um, in relation to the conscience debate that we've been having um, on this legislation to this point. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, last night we had a couple of contributions, uh, some which uh, were directly referencing uh, so-called traditional ways of coming into the world, traditional forms of reproduction. Um, and other contributions which alluded to there being a traditional way uh, in which a human being comes into the world. Uh, and as a disabled person, I feel an obligation to draw the Chamber's attention to the reality that the fact that I sit here today um, alive um, and an MP for WA is a testament to uh, the reality that the definition of what it is to be a traditional human being uh, and to live evolves over time. Had I been born a couple of hundred years ago, uh, I would have been left to the wolves. Had I been born 50 years ago, and less in, in some places, it would have been the traditional course of life for me to in be institutionalised and never see the light of day. What is the traditional way of going about life and the traditional supports that we provide people? These are definitions that evolve over time. And not only in that social space or not only in that historical context, medically, I, like so many other people in the world, are the product of a caesarean birth procedure. Now, there was a time when such a procedure did not exist, and the traditional way of medicine, the traditional way forward, would be uh, for myself and for my mum to have died. Now, luckily, over the course of time and the advancement of science, we have improved medical practices. And those improved medical practices enable us to offer better life chances to kids, to babies, to mums, to parents to live good, happy, healthy lives. There is no such thing as a fixed point in time whereby the traditional state of things can be defined. Now, on the amendment specifically, um, it is my view uh, that this would have the effect of blurring uh, the lines in relation to the regulation and oversight um, of this procedure um, and slow down the trial and implementation stage. The challenge, well, one of the challenges we have here is that this could well create confusion as to the responsible regulatory body, in my view, requiring the gene technology regulator to become involved in the regulation of mitochondrial donation, in my view, could well have a duplicative effect. That's before you even lift the lid, go beneath and ask yourself where the expertise lay. Now, currently within the NHMRC, we have an uh, embryo research licensing committee um, that is proposed to have regulatory oversight of this process. With the change proposed by the amendment, um, the gene technology regulator would also have oversight and regulatory responsibility. Hence, potentially, 
the confusion that I have stated before. But also I think we have this other question to consider with the amendment, and that is simply that currently the regulator is responsible um, for, and I'll quote here directly, um, agriculture and genetically modified material. I would never want to see it, Mr Acting Deputy President, that a baby born due to these procedures would at any point of their existence uh, be identified, designated by a government regulator or any other body as a genetically modified material. That's not appropriate and totally unnecessary given the fact that within the NHMRC there are a team of folks within their IVF division that have been doing uh, work on facilitated reproductive uh, procedures for, well, since, 2000, since the early 2000s. These are a team of the nation's experts, more than capable of, in my view, carrying out this uh, oversight role as proposed in the legislation uh, before the chamber today. And for those reasons, um, I personally will not be supporting the amendment. Senator Pratt. Um, I want to endorse uh, the comments of Senator Jordan Steele. John, these regulations need to be separate. We have regulation for reproductive technology and we have regulation for genetically modified material, which people are not. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, <coughs> Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, I do think this is a need. There is a need for an arm's-length regulator. Uh, two techniques that are very novel and revolutionary. I would uh, posit that even those that are passionately in favour of this bill uh, uh, do understand the, the revolutionary techniques we are talking about uh, in terms of, uh, for the first time, uh, transferring genetic material between uh, uh, two human. Uh, cells um, for the purposes of reproduction. Uh, we are. This is at the cutting edge uh, in the world of these techniques. We have heard through this debate that only the United Kingdom is the only other country that has legalised uh, this approach to date, uh, and to date there has not been a successful uh, uh, live birth emerging from mitochondrial donation in that country. So it is something that we should ensure uh, has a significant level of oversight and regulation. And I know that some have raised the point that uh, the uh, Office of Gene Technology Regulator may not be the appropriate body uh, to regulate human gene therapy. Indeed, um, there was a review of the National Gene Technology Scheme in 2018, which did conclude uh, that the definition of GMO in that act be amended to exclude a, a human being from the definition that's consistent with those that have argued against this amendment. However, that amendment has not been made. That recommendation has not been acted on. And what no one else has uh, put forward in this debate at this stage is that that review also said, also said that the review notes that this amendment may result in the need for another existing or new regulatory body to expand its scope of regulatory activity to ensure that appropriate regulatory oversight is provided in this area. Now, the National Health Medical Research Centre uh, Commission sorry, is a great body, a fantastic institution in this country. It is not a regulator. It is not a regulator. It is a provider of health advice and research uh, to governments and other organisations. It is not an arm's length regulator of an activity. Uh, I do not I say that without any casting any aspersions on the people who work in the NHMRC or the persons that will be part of the embryo licensing research committee that this bill would form. I'm sure they are all very good people, but they are people that are involved, directly involved, in the provision of these techniques uh, and therefore cannot themselves sit at arm's length. I have that, had, that has been uh, admitted to me in discussions where there has been the admission that many people on the ELRC will have conflicts of interests. Will have conflicts of interest. Now, they will be disclosed, I'm sure, in the appropriate manner. But they are not, by, just by the mere fact of having those conflicts of interest, they will not be an arm's length regulator. In my view, not proceeding this amendment would be inconsistent with the recommendations of the recent review of the National Gene Technology Scheme. We do not yet have a separate regulator established. That has not been considered 
the national the 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 um, uh, uh, the, the, the Gene Technology Act has not been amended in the way recommended by that review in 2018. So we are putting the cart before the horse here to exclude uh, um, regulation from the OGTR before a proper consideration of the recommendations of that review, unless we move this amendment. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks by Senator O'Neill and Senator Canavan. Uh, and indicate to the chamber I will be supporting this amendment. Um, I am prompted to my feet in part by the comments, which I do respect, um, from Senator Steele, John, um, because I do fear for those who are watching this debate, they may form a view that those of us who do not support the bill are somehow against medical progress or medical technology. We are not. In fact. There, I, do, I do agree with Senator Steele, John. Research, technology, progress, things that save lives, those should, those should occur. And you know, Senator Steele, John, makes a very valid observation about how his own personhood demonstrates the capacity of, mental, of medical research and, un, and advanced understandings that people with a disability not only survive births that they wouldn't have decades ago or centuries ago, but indeed are able to live lives fully participating in the community. And I say to Senator Steele, John, two of my three children would not have survived their births had it not been for things like cesareans and other medical interventions. And I think we all have stories like that in this chamber. We all do. One of my children didn't survive her birth. She died of a genetic condition, a genetic condition for which there is no known cause and no known cure. And yet I can't support this bill because in my mind and based on both ethical convictions and the paucity of the scientific evidence, I have serious concerns. So just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. And my concern and the way I think about the need for regulation and oversight here is not dissimilar to how I think about regulation and oversight when it comes to extraordinary powers. Say, for example, in national security space. The view I bring to those legislative considerations is the more intrusive a power, the more uh, intrusive a power, the more necessary it is that it has appropriate oversight. This is an incredibly intrusive power. Let's be clear about it. If it passes this parliament, it is an incredibly intrusive intervention in human existence. We are, we are not only going to intervene in one of the most personal situations of the human existence, that is how children are conceived, but we are going to do it in a way that is novel, that is untested, that will alter mitochondrial DNA. And we don't yet know we don't yet know what the outcome of that is on human beings. We simply don't. We have theories, but we don't know. And indeed, the Senate report, this very chamber's own report, said that that was a foundational question that needed to be answered. And it hasn't been answered. What we know is that the United Kingdom does not have data to provide. I believe it's six licenses they've issued. I could stand corrected, it might be eight, but they've got six. And no baby's been born, and we just don't have that data. So if, although I will be voting against this bill, even if this amendment passes, I think it's important that if this bill does pass this parliament, there is appropriate oversight. And Senator Canavan is right, that we've had a bill that has got such significant intervention into the human condition, the very nature of who we are as human beings, and we haven't identified the appropriate oversight body for that, to me, is a fundamental flaw of the legislation. Now, it may be right that the um, Office of the Gene Technology Regulator is not the most appropriate body, and if, the, you know, if this bill were to pass and the government wanted to come back and find a different oversight model, I'd be open to that. But I think there must be something. 
The office of the, office of the um, gene technology regulator is in the Department of Health. And in absence of having any other body, I think it's appropriate that that is the body. And I, again, come to the comments of Senator Canavan about not having a, a tension or a conflict of interest between the practitioners or the, or, and, and the oversight bodies. That's a fundamental, foundational principle when it comes to how we deal with national security legislation and intrusive powers. So I think it's incredibly important that this bill is appropriate oversight should it pass. This may not be the perfect solution, but it is better than what is currently in the legislation. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I think it's important to clarify in the context of this debate that the gene technology regulator and the review that was done recently into them specifically found that they are not an appropriate body to oversight gene technology in people. That review recommended that the Act be clarified that people are not regulated under that Act, which is what this legislation before us today does. And when we look at the ongoing ramifications of the, gene uh, of, um, the Human Embryos Act and reproductive technology, it's not correct to say that there is not further regulation than via the NHMRC. The, G the states have handed back much of their powers that relate to gene technology uh, to the federal gene technology regulator. But in the case of reproductive technology, the states retain that power uh, when um, reproductive technology uh, is rolled out and when it's implemented. So the NHMRC can only is in and of itself already limited in how far it can go before it then reaches the next stage uh, of uh, clinical trials or rollout because it can't get to a clinic in the state of Western Australia, for example, until uh, the state government there also takes laws through parliament. And then it has its ho whole new set of ethical considerations with hospitals and providers that it again will do through its own state regimes. I think it's really important to put that on the record. Thank you. Senator Still John, and then I'll come to Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Press. Um, I don't want to acknowledge uh, Senator Keneally's contribution in the debate this evening and, and thank you for sharing your lived experience and bringing that lived experience to the debate today. Um, as somebody who does that a lot myself, from a different perspective, it can be a really tough thing to do. Um, and I'm sure the entire Senate uh, will join me in extending to you our deepest empathy on that terrible loss. I would also like to uh, read into the record for, for the benefit of the Chamber, because I, I think that there is there's a very uh, legitimate uh, there's a very legitimate red flag that goes up in your mind when you hear about a new technology, uh, a new procedure um, taking place in a jurisdiction overseas um, that has not yet produced, um, has, has been articulated by others in the debate, um, peer-reviewed research that we can reference here in the debate today. That's a legitimate red flag that would come up into people's minds. It's something that hit me when I first looked at this legislation. In fact, I'll be quite open with the Chamber tonight. When I first had this legislation land on my desk as a, a newly minted health folks, um, I had a bit, of a, a bit of a sickness come into my stomach, to be quite honest, because my initial view on looking at the legislation, just you know, skimming it, would be that there would be some pretty inherent risks in the legislation put before us, uh, that we uh, could be heading down a path without enough research and enough information. Now, why did I have that concern? I had that concern, again, I'll come back to both my personal experience as a disabled person uh, and the, the community's broader experience. Our experience as disabled people uh, is that 
If there is a, historically, if there is a socially acceptable or medically applicable way to delete us from the social fabric, um, to eradicate us, uh, that is the path that is taken. And I'm sure I, I would hope many in this place would know uh, that quite notably, or no, not at all for the first or last time during the uh, Second World War, uh, one of the first uh, acts of the Nazi regime was to implement something called the T4 program. And the goal and principal purpose of the T4 program was the elimination of what the regime named as useless mouths. Vans would trawl through communities, collect disabled people, take them to a central institution, where they would be euthanized and burned. Disabled people, people with, uh, with uh, psychosocial uh, disabilities, so many that the town in which the primary furnace was based uh, was blanketed uh, in what the residents initially believed to be snow, but which actually turned out to be human ash. What, now, while this program is, is more well known, although not well known as it should be, um, what's less well known is that its inspiration um, was not drawn from some satanic death cult or uh, depth of deepest depravity. Um, it was modelled on a framework used uh, in the United States uh, state of California, which more or less stayed in place until the late 60s, uh, whereby government-sanctioned sterilisation of disabled women uh, was state policy for the purpose of eliminating disabled people. So if there's any community with a right to look at a piece of legislation like this suspiciously, it would be the disabled, gov uh, disabled community. And I brought that critical lens uh, to, to this debate. In doing that, I consulted with the Mitochondrial Foundation, with, with many organisations advocating for the bill and the opponents of the bill. And what I discovered rather than a rushed and headlong uh, attempt to introduce a vehicle by which disabled people may be deleted or somehow expunged from society, um, what I discovered was, in fact, uh, a pretty conservative bill. A pretty conservative bill. A bill consisting of three stages, the first stage of which, as the Senate knows, is a 10-year trial. A 10-year trial. This means that over that 10 years, if we take the figure as being correct that about 56 kids are born a year with severe mitochondrial disease, um, and that the average life expectancy can be as low as a couple of years and up to 12, that'll mean that if we pass this law today, hundreds of children will be born and die of mitochondrial diseases before this treatment even becomes available in Australia. A very conservative, a very conservative framework. During that time, there will be oversight again by groups of people which I would put to the Senate are some of the best experts in the country in relation to facilitated reproductive procedures. Now, this question of the validity or existence of the scientific uh, output of the, of the United States, uh, of the United Kingdom's trials, have been such part of the Australian discourse that one of the key medical professionals involved uh, in the framework in the United Kingdom uh, has written to me, and I want to read their letter uh, verbatim into the record for the benefit of the chamber. Dear Senator. I congratulate the Australian Government in their effort to bring forward legislation to allow mitochondrial donation to reduce the risk of disease in children born to women who carry uh, pathogenic uh, mtDNA variants. I am the clinical lead for the licensed mitochondrial donation program in the United Kingdom. I understand that concerns have been raised in Australia regarding the lack of information available from the UK in regards to babies born of mitochondrial donation since the legislation was passed in 2015. The UK legislation and regul regulation has allowed for such treatment to take place in a programme that was to be uh, cautiously uh, introduced. As with all licensed fertility treatment in the United Kingdom, 
regulated by the Human, the human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Uh, confidentiality of patient and offspring is paramount. Our program has progressed with small numbers of suitable patients involved, and it is imperative that their uh, privacy is uh, guarded. We will publish the data in due course. Uh, this lack of clinical information should not be interpreted to imply concern about the uh, technique, but is to safeguard the privacy of infants and their families. Yours faithfully, Dr. Jane A. Stewart, MD, FRCOG, consultant in reproductive medicine. Um, I also have, me, have here with me a uh, letter from a, a Mary Herbert, PhD, uh, from the same Newcastle uh, facility centre, uh, who goes into great detail um, in relation to some of the challenges that have faced um, the UK programme, not least, not least the reality of COVID-19. So when you ask the scientists who have dedicated their life, let us remember that we are in the middle of a global pandemic where our lives more than ever, ever before are in the hands of scientists where the constant catch cry of most, though not all, of the members of this place is to follow the health advice. We have here clear statements from leaders in their field speaking to the reasons for the absence of data which we can analyse to this point. And I would put it to the Senate today not only that we will have time, as the United Kingdom recovers from COVID, to gather the UK data, but we shall also have 10 years of our own data. 10 years if the trial is able to be conducted methodically uh, and appropriately, which will be ensured as it is overseen by the experts in this field at the NHMRC. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Sorry, um, did Senator Birmingham? Did you did you want to go? Look, just I just wanted to very briefly, in response to some of the um, further points that have been made, um, I think it's very we, we should be very clear that if this amendment is not passed, we will have uh, less regulation on human gene therapy than we have on animal gene therapy and plant gene therapy. That is the reality. With animal gene therapy and plant gene therapy, they are regulated by the Office of Gene Technology uh, Regulator. Uh, it's a specific arms-length arms regulator. It is a regulator, not an advisory body, not a research body. It is a regulator through and through an independent one, a statutorily independent one at that. And that's appropriate that for something as significant as gene therapies that we do have an independent regulator. In the review that has been referenced by a number of people, the review of the Gene Technology Regulator, they say, they say that stakeholders have identified a potential gap in regulation pertaining to the modification of humans. So it is true that they, they do conclude that the OGTR might not be the best body to, to regulate human gene therapy. They're saying there's a gap today. There's a gap in human gene therapy. Of course, almost all human gene therapy uh, research and, and clinical practices are, are prohibited in Australia. There's a few very limited uh, research trials occurring. But, but they're saying there's a gap. Now, this bill does nothing to fill that gap. This bill would instead make this gap a wide chasm because we would remove as perhaps as uh, um, uh, in a, uh, un undesigned for it, it is, the OGTR is, we would remove that oversight and replace it with a subcommittee of the NHMRC, which is not a regulated body. Indeed, if you go to the, to the uh, statement of expectations the government has given the NHMRC, its most recent statement of expectations, there is not the mention of the word regulation, regulatory or anything to do with regulation. That statement says that the NHMRC is the Australian government's key entity for managing investment in and the integrity of health and medical research. It is not a regulator. It is not a regulator. If we do not pass this amendment, we will effectively have self-regulation of human gene therapy. It is not appropriate that we have a lower regulatory oversight to human gene therapy than we would for animal and plant gene therapy. Minister. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, 
Uh, at, the, uh, at the outset, I just want to acknowledge that in debates like these, in these uh, free and conscience votes that occur, we sometimes see you know, the best of contributions across our chamber, and contributions that do draw uh, on the personal. And I acknowledge uh, Senator Steelejohn's contribution, Senator Keneally's contribution, uh, indeed, in, uh, in the other place. Uh, the member for Mayo, I know, spoke uh, with great uh, passion uh, um, and emotion uh, about the circumstances of her grandson uh, with mitochondrial disease and the challenges that uh, her family was facing uh, in relation to his diagnosis. Uh, I think it's important that we also acknowledge the different perspectives that senators come from. Uh, and whilst the standing orders always provide that we shouldn't reflect upon the motivations of any other senator, especially in a debate like this, uh, I think it's crucial that uh, we respect those different perspectives informed by those different life experiences, by those different values, by uh, the many different factors that each senator will bring to pass in, uh, in this debate. And I do that regardless of the uh, political position or ultimately the votes that will be cast on a debate as each grapple with uh, what is a very sensitive technology uh, with ethical considerations that needs to be approached carefully. All that said, Chair, uh, I support the words of Senator Watt uh, in relation to, uh, to the explanation he provided uh, as, to, uh, as to why I do not support the amendment before the chamber and would, uh, would discourage senators from supporting the amendment. The Embryo, Embryo Research Licensing Committee of the National Health and Medical Research Council would be responsible under uh, this bill uh, for regulating mitochondrial donation in humans. It is an expert regulatory approach that will be applied. Uh, it is a body well equipped to undertake that role in terms of its expertise. It has been in place under the Prohibition of Human Cloning for Reproduction Act uh, since 2002. Um, uh, if this amendment were to succeed, we would see a duplicative arrangement, uh, an overlap of uh, regulatory functions as well as of acts potentially. Uh, it is the government's clear view. Oh, sorry, I should say used to say in the government, uh, but it is, uh, it is certainly a clear view that I present and, uh, and urge senators to consider uh, that, uh, that the consultation has led to an approach that provides for clear oversight that will entail strong safeguards, uh, but, uh, but that um, we do not need to be imposing uh, other uh, layers that, as other contributors to this debate have acknowledged, may not even be an appropriate entity to do so in these circumstances. Are there any other speakers? Okay, then I will uh, put the question that the amendment be amendment one be agreed to. All those that, that opinion say aye. 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 Uh, all those opinions say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Yep. Ring the bells.
order, stop the bells. Just to explain to the Senate, is, it is my intention, because this is a conscience vote, to use the people that are sitting in the whips chair. And if there's no one sitting in the whips chair, I will we'll seek uh, guidance from the mover of the motion. So this, we are dealing with the first. Um, we're dealing with uh, amendments one and two on sheet one five four two, um, uh, in two parts. They've been moved by Senator O'Neill. So I'm putting that the first section and then the second. So the first question is that amendment one be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Twenty-nine ayes and thirty-two noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just wait for those senators not particip participating in the debate to leave the chamber, and I'll wait for the minister and others to get back to their positions. And I'm waiting for someone to seek the call. Sorry, uh, I've jumped ahead of myself. I now need to put the next section, and that is that section 47 in item 103 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. My apologies. So the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller. Pardon, this one hasn't been tested on the voices. I'm very sorry to be so confusing. So the question is that section 47 in item 103 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. And ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. So the question is that section 47 in item 103 of schedule 1 stand as printed. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as Senator Seselger, are you seeking the call? Just a moment. We just need the microphone on. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I don't think one-minute bells were appropriate. I am told that there were some uh, who were uh, hoping to get down for this vote who weren't at the last one, and I'd request that there be four-minute bells. Uh, I just advised the Senate. I did uh, seek the guidance of the whips, and they informed me one-minute bells. But if it's if it's the wish of the Senate, then we will ring them uh, for four minutes. Is that the wish of the Senate? Uh, ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. 
The question is that section 47 in item 103 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And I'm assuming, Senator Canavan, wherever you are, that you don't wish to proceed with 1543? Thank you. Senator Canavan. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this, uh, this bill, Senators would realise, uh, establishes five different types of licences. Um, it effectively establishes two stages uh, to uh, introduce mitochondrial donation into our laws. As has been described, this is, will be a, a, a new or revolutionary form of um, human gene therapy that is prohibited under our laws today. So because of that, uh, the bill seeks to uh, establish uh, some trial and research licences in the first stage. Uh, there are three of those that are uh, particularly specified in this bill. Uh, and then, uh, following the research and trials, uh, the bill highlights or, or outlines two additional bills: a clinical research uh, licence and a clinical practice licence that would be then uh, allowed for to uh, to um, provide for widespread adoption of mitochondrial services to the broader population outside of research and trials. Uh, I, I am a little concerned here that the approach adopted in this bill uh, continues some of the deficiencies we have seen emerge in the Senate on the use and overuse of delegated legislation. So this bill establishes a regulatory framework for mitochondrial donation. However, uh, um, at, the, uh, at the conclusion of the research and trial phase, so-called stage one in this approach, uh, there is no specific uh, conditions to be placed on the licences that will uh, apply to clinical practical practice trials. They're not. Yes, Senator Steele, John. President, I draw your attention to Senator Antic, who is moving about the chamber without a mask. I would ask that you request he wear one, in line with the rules. Sure. Uh, senators are aware of the rules, and uh, I remind them of that. Thank you. Oh, so, yeah, sorry, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President. So, as I was saying, um, to be in this so-called stage two of the bill moving to clinical practice trials, the conditions which would apply uh, to, those, uh, to those licenses are not set or not outlined in, in this bill because, of course, we haven't done the research and the trials, so understandably the government uh, cannot at this stage outline in detail uh, those, 
those particular um, uh, uh, regulations. For example, the explanatory memorandum to this bill says that organisations will not be able to apply to the ERLC, the Embryo Research Licensing Committee, for either of the two clinical practice-related licences until a particular technique is specified in the regulations for this purpose. The explanatory memorandum goes on to say that stage two would commence only after mitochondrial donation techniques suitable for use in clinical practice have been prescribed in the research involving Human Embryo Regulations 2017. So keep in mind, Senators, what we are doing here if we do not amend this approach. We will continue the uh, trend that we have seen, whereby the parliament delegates enormous power to the executive, to ministers within that executive, uh, to make effectively laws in the future that do not or are not subject to the full oversight and scrutiny of this parliament. I want to recognise the fantastic work that Senator Ferravanti Wells and uh, Senator Carr. Uh, and others on the scrutiny of delegated le legislation committee has done in this space. They have produced two groundbreaking reports, reports that I'm sure uh, will, will stay on the shelf uh, for many in this place uh, for decades, about the overuse and risks of delegated legislation. Indeed, Senator Veriventi Wells, in, in tabling the final report to this place last year, commented that, in theory, delegated legislation should only deal with purely technical and administrative matters, but this is no longer the case. In practice, delegated legislation now often deals with matters of policy significance, as a, a, an already unsatisfactory situation is becoming un intolerable. I couldn't agree with those words more, that here, as senators, is in this place, we should be the House of Review. We should be holding up standards that hold the executive to account on matters, on matters of policy significance. And this is clearly a matter of policy significance in terms of setting the conditions that would apply to a unique, novel and revolutionary form of human gene therapy. Because, and, and, and also, clearly, I should add, I should add, Senator Ferriventi was just succinctly summed up in that comment that, that there should this, the delegated legislation should be there for technical, administrative matters, stuff that's urgent, stuff that can't necessarily go through a full parliamentary process. The government in the Alex, or the proposal, the government did put this bill forward. The government bill, an expansion memorandum, says that the stage one process will take 10 plus years. 10 plus years. So the delegated legislation we are, we are uh, approving, or would approve without this bill being amended, uh, would not necessarily be exercised for another three federal elections. A completely different Senate would be here, uh, and they, had, they would then at that point have no direct parliamentary oversight apart from the disallowable process uh, to deal with the new regulations that may be set at that point. Because another good point that has been made by Sarah Vendor, Senator Vera Van Walsh's committee is that we should have sunsetting clauses on delegated legislation. They should sunset. Well, this will be, uh, this will be if we approve this, there will be more sunlight to the executive in this bill than would exist in Nordic countries in summer. There'll never be a sunset over the next, because it's 10 years. It's going to be 10 years before they even do it, before they consider it. How could we in this parliament today, where we don't know what the developments will be on human gene therapy, we don't know what will happen in the UK, we don't know what will happen in other countries, we will give a blank check to, the, to an executive in 10 plus years' time to write their own regulations then. Now, yes, I admit we'd be able to disallow them. We can do that, but we all know that's inadequate. It doesn't go through the committee process properly. It doesn't have to go through both houses. Uh, uh, there are very rarely any public hearings associated with the disallowance, and of course we, it's an up-and-down vote. We can't have this process. There's no committee of the whole in a disallowance process. We cannot amend the regulation. We are somewhat uh, hands-tied when it goes into dealing with delegated legislation, even in a disallowable sense. So I propose here in the amendments here um, that I will be moving um, uh, uh, tonight that uh, that we. Uh, we should uh, seek to remove the stage two licences from this bill. These amendments would not stop mitochondrial donation research and trials continuing. As, as I've outlined, they've, they've got 10 years of those to go, at least. So that would not stop these amendments would not stop that occurring and the progression of this technology happening. All it would mean by agreeing to this amendment is that on the conclusion of those trials and research, uh, that the government of that day 
or members or senators of that time uh, put forward additional legislation which would then govern uh, the regulatory framework uh, for clinical practice trials. Now, in my view, these amendments, these amendments become even more important, become even more important given the fact that uh, we did not agree uh, to the regulatory oversight of the Office of Gene Techn Technology Regulator. Because I accept the decision of the Senate that's occurred here, that we will, we will have scrutiny through the National Research Medical um, National uh, Health Research Medical Council. Uh, that, that body, as I've outlined, is not a regulatory body. There is at least some question marks here over there are gaps in the regulatory process. So surely, before we proceed with clinical practice trials, uh, we, should, we should ensure that a full parliamentary process uh, occurs and that if these gaps remain, or the gaps I perceive, and plenty of other senators, it was a very tight vote before, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if those gaps remain, then we would um, uh, seek to, uh, uh, we could seek to look at how we fix those and fill those gaps at that point. Uh, these are common sense amendments that I would encourage all senators to adopt. They do not stop, slow down or in any way prevent the progression of mitochondrial donation technologies. They simply make sure that the scrutiny of this parliament and its integrity is maintained and we do not continue the trend where the executive of this country takes more and more power and authority from the parliament where it should reside. Uh, before I move on, Senator Canavan, are you seeking leave to move uh, Amendments 1 to 55. To together. move um, amendments 1 to 55 on sheet 1519. Thank you. Who's seeking the call? Is leave granted? Oh, is leave granted? Beg your pardon. Yes, leave is granted. Senator Watt. Thanks, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I am opposing this amendment. Um, in my view, uh, the problem with this amendment is that it, it will delay the clinical application of mitochondrial donation. Um, I have spoken and many others have spoken in favour of the clinical application of it in the highly regulated framework that is being put forward. If this amendment were to succeed, it would result in mitochondrial donation remaining in the clinical, clinical trial phase. Um, and a clear path has been set out from stage one, the research stage, to stage two, the clinical practice stage, in the legislation, uh, and I would encourage those who voted for the legislation uh, to vote against this amendment um, so that we can see clinical application of mitochondrial donation in addition to research. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy okay. President. Uh, I do rise in support of Senator Canavan's amendment, uh, and I do so for many of the reasons that he outlined. And but my, my plea here tonight is for those senators who are voting for the bill to consider voting for this amendment. This amendment is a common sense one that ensures the primacy of the parliament. There is actually, and I think some of the people who are voting for this bill have acknowledged, there is actually a slight leap of faith we are taking here given that the paucity of evidence out of the United Kingdom. Senator Steele, John, I, I, you said that there is an understandable red flag for some members and senators. And while I respect the position you've put, I think just that is a red flag. And I think for those members who are supporting this legislation, it is worth considering this amendment. Ask yourself this question. Given how little we know based on scientific evidence and research that is available to us now about this novel and untested technique, why are we willing to sign away the parliament's ability to revisit, to examine the results of something we won't have for 10 years time? I actually struggle to think of another example of when a parliament would agree to simply give away its decision-making authority and its primacy to an executive on such a vexed and significant question. For example, national security laws. 
We regularly ask for them to be sunsetted. We regularly ask for them to be revisited by the parliament. We regularly ask that they be reviewed in order to ensure that those extraordinary or interventionist powers are being used appropriately. Here, it's not about whether or not the power is being used, it's whether or not, whether or not the evidence should prompt us to think anew about the technology we're authorizing. So even if you do agree with Senator Watt, and I respect his point of view, that you would like to see the clinical application of mitochondrial donation, it is still worth considering whether or not we should be, as a parliament on principle, giving away that decision for something that might happen, in, that, that, that the bill says can happen in 10 years' time, without having the parliament examine the evidence, examine the, 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 the data that will come from those trials. Uh, now, I, I, I am clear about the fact that I have been clear with the chamber that I, I don't support the legislation. Um, but I do repeat that my view, in the, as I did with the last amendment, that, sh that this amendment improves the bill. And if it is the will of the chamber that the bill is passed, I would like to see the bill improved. And I think Senator Canavan has highlighted one of the areas of the bill that no matter what your position is on the final um, outcome, you could see the benefit to the parliament uh, and to, um, to those members, who, some of whom might still be here in 10 years' time and some of them might not, uh, but that we should allow the parliament to make that decision and not have it delegated by authority to the uh, executive. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. There are checks and balances in this bill, including parliamentary scrutiny. It is a disallowable instrument in terms of the regulations that are issued by the NHMRC, which would take us from stage one to stage two. But what I think is also incredibly important to recognise is that to put this out into clinical practice in the states and the clinics, it requires state parliaments also to amend their laws. We don't need this extra layer of regulation. We have plenty of opportunity as a parliament to monitor what the NHMRC does in its regulation and to disallow that instrument, inquire into that instrument, if we like, uh, through a parliamentary committee process uh, in order to engage on those issues. It is simply unnecessary to require this parliament to come back and re-legislate all of these provisions. Uh, this amendment removes the clinical practice stage of, in all of these <coughs> schedules. It is unnecessary. We will have an opportunity to disallow um, future regulations if it was considered ethical to do so. But I also think the chamber needs to understand that state parliaments will also be legislating on this matter before it uh, goes to clinical practice stage. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I don't know about people in this chamber, but I find so much goes on. You've got to try and remember what you did even a couple of days ago. What we're talking about here is a period of 10 years ago. If I ask people in this space to think back 10 years, you know, where were you? What was the technology like around you? What was going on? Making a legislation uh, in, in this instance about a, a type of technology that is really very, very novel and a type of technology, and I do want to repeat again, that the committee that inquired into this bill sought to find information out about but couldn't get that information because even where a trial has been in operation in the UK for five years, data and information to inform our practice is impossible. So after half of that period of 10 years, as this bill seeks to push out to, a period of five years, the UK has still been unable to give us anything to work with. 
to fashion ideas around this. Now, Senator Keneally has made the point that there are people who are going to vote for this bill, and I, it's pretty clear from what I've said and my stance on other issues that I'm going to be voting for uh, against the passage of this bill. Uh, but I, I endorse the comments of both my colleagues, uh, Senator Canavan and Senator Keneally, that the role of the Senate is to provide a degree of oversight and care in considering the legislation that is advanced to us from the House. And in this instance, with a technology that is so potentially significant, possibly positive, but unknowable at the moment because of a lack of transparency, we should be more mindful than those, were, those who were in the UK about what we do. And the timeline that is set here, I think, is just too far. So I commend senators to give serious consideration and to support the amendment that is before Senator Canavan. It does not prevent the legislation going through. It, does, it is not at odds with the legislation, even for those who are voting for it. But it is a measure of care and concern for good parliamentary practice. And if senators of this country aren't up for the task of looking to good parliamentary practice, then I don't know who's going to do the work for us. We're here, we're in the front line. We should support this amendment in the interest of Australians. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I, I just wanted to quickly make a point in response to a point that was made. Uh, a point was made that somehow in the future we could re-legislate, re-litigate um, if, the, if there are issues and errors. Um, that, that is practically true, of course. That can be done. Uh, oh, sorry, theoretically true. But in practice, in practice, it's not going to deal with the problem that this amendment uh, uh, highlights. Uh, because we all know in this place that to get a bill through both houses of parliament, effectively the bill has to be a government bill. Uh, it's almost uh, an impossibility for a private senator or even a group of senators uh, or a group in the other place to start a private bill and have it proceed through both houses, signed by the governor general, and becomes into law. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because the government controls the numbers in the house almost invariably, and 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 of course they control largely the time and. and procedure here in this place. The problem this amendment seeks to deal with is the fact that in 10 or plus years' time, we, we, by passing an unamended bill, will give the government untrammeled, almost untrammeled, very lack of scrutiny to make the regulations as they see fit. And the only way that the alternative is, oh, well, there could be some, some legislation that deals with that. Well, that legislation would have to come from the government to pass through. So, so in both cases, either done through the regulation or legislation, it is controlled by the government. That's the way this parliament works in practice. And so I repeat my points here that we have had a lot of discussions, extensive discussions, about the, uh, the unfortunate trend of more and more delegated legislation being housed in the executive and less and less scrutiny occurring from this place. We have an opportunity here tonight to stand against that trend, to push back against that trend. And I think it's one we should take. Senator Steele John was seeking the call. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you very much. Um, just briefly, I'll, I'll be stating my uh, my uh, opposition to the uh, amendment offered by uh, Senator Canavan. Um, the effect of this amendment, in my view, uh, would practically be uh, to result in mitochondrial donation remaining in its clinical phase uh, either in perpetuity uh, or for longer than is needed. And I think what is potentially in danger of being lost in this debate is the reality, as I said at the beginning of our debate on this issue tonight, 56 kids are born with severe mitochondrial disease every single year. Nothing in this bill, not a single part of it, um, is a cure for those 56 kids that are born every year. Those families, those parents will start to live with the unutterable pain of watching someone they love more than anything in the world 
slip away, knowing that there is nothing that they can do. The mitochondrial foundation support of this proposal, the advocacy that the community has displayed, is not in a hope of finding a cure or legislating a cure for those who they love and know they will lose. It is an attempt to prevent such pain and suffering from visiting itself upon anyone else. Now, the legislation before us today, and I say it again, it's a very conservative piece of legislation. Ten years is a long time. And for ten years, kids will be born and they will pass away and families will be torn asunder. What we have before us tonight is a question of whether at the end of that 10-year period there is a potential for a treatment widely available to the public that would prevent such a tragedy from visiting itself, visiting itself upon any other families in this nation. This is a well thought out three-step process, clinical process, a scientific process. And I remind the Chamber that we sit here in a global pandemic and we owe our lives and our health to science. Our lives and our health to science and to that idea that we will put our faith in public health professionals, that we will put our faith in scientists. Now at any time if it comes to the, set, the attention of the Senate that information has been put into the public arena that would seek to want us to hold one of these stages, then disallowable instruments are open to us. I find it ironic that some contribute into this debate who have utilised the disallowable instrument effectively are speaking now to its ineffectiveness. If they would like it to be a more effective instrument, May I suggest that they liven up the idea of voting uh, for the disallowance of regulated instruments among their party room colleagues. If more people voted to disallow instruments more often, it would happen more often. That is the solution if you think that is a problem. Members of the government, members of the Senate could sit down with Senator Farah Vanty Wells with the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislations Committee. We've got many good ideas about how to improve the oversight powers of this Senate. How I would love to see this place play its role as the House of Review, rather than the role of the subservient rubber stamp of the executive. Would absolutely love it. You bring a bill tomorrow that solves some of those problems, you come back to the next sitting. With that attitude, I'll meet you there. But let's not confuse that with what is before us today. What is before us today is an opportunity to say for the next generation of parents there may be a solution on the table that will prevent this suffering. There have been a lot of conversations in here about unknowns, scientific unknowns, ethical unknowns. Very interesting that we're talking about science and ethics and that this is playing so much part of this debate. It's good to see. Hope it heralds a return of a conversation of ethics and conscience and science in this place. We shall see when the debate concludes. But let us at this moment take this step forward. And if we are concerned with questions of uncertainty, let us comfort ourselves with the knowledge that one thing at the moment is certain which is that 56 kids will lose their lives to mitochondrial disease every single year. Let us hold that as the statistical evidence it is and let it compel us, let us, let it compel us to act, to ensure that this suffering, to take the opportunity that is presented to us by this legislation to ensure that this suffering is not visited upon others. And let us not, 
let us not pretend uh, that amendments put before this place, presented to us as improving oversight, proving the ability of the executive, uh, of the legislator, le legislature to, to, uh, uh, to oversight this program, will have anything more than the effect of prolonging the outcome of that much needed research, the potential of that so hoped for preventative measure. So I will not be supporting this amendment offered by Senator Canavan, um, and I urge all of my Senate colleagues, as they take this vote tonight, and not to allow themselves to become unmoored in a consideration of what might be, keep yourself focused, fellow senators, on the reality of what is. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have to confess that often in this chamber the tone of the debate is so much less than I might have hoped it would be when I first came here, but I have to uh, indicate that with the freedom of conscience vote, I think something quite significant is happening in the chamber this evening. Pe people are thinking, people are putting their view, and they're doing it with eloquence. As a former English teacher, um, I, I absolutely rise to the turn of phrase that I hear. Uh, above other rights in a way that I have serious... Oh. <laughs> We're getting an echo there, but... Uh... <laughs> I, I think you're right to continue. Well, Senator well <laughs> I, I was attempting to um, make positive commentary about the contribution then of Senator Steele John when I was rudely interrupted by somebody from the House who obviously isn't up to the standard of the debate here in the Red Chamber. How, however, um, as a former English teacher and with a, an Irish Catholic family background, the lift to the language of the lyrical appeals to me. And I hear that in Senator Steele-John's contribution. But the fact is, and we should remember this when we're dealing with this piece of legislation and all the amendments that we're seeking to advance, is that if we actually rely on the scientific evidence that is available to us today, it's a blank sheet. For five years this has been going on in the UK. And for whatever has been advanced, and I know that the families in the UK would have had the same level of hope as Senator Steele Johns has just, just um, put on the record here today. But hope is not a strategy, and desire is not science. And our job is not just to be purveyors of hope, but deliverers of solid legislation that provides sufficient protection to the Australian people. And if senators take the time to read the report that was put together under the chairmanship of Senator Askew, who I have to say approached this whole issue with a very open mind, the recommendations that are being advanced here tonight as amendments will do good work, in my view, to improve the quality of what is undertaken in this country and to provide protection to Australian residents who, as Senator Steele Johns, will be suffering already. The despair and the sorrows and the, 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 the loss of a sense of what their life might have been like not too long after the birth of a child who was much longed for. So I, I caution against being captured by a discourse of hope and call on you to be hard-headed to deal with the facts and the scientific reality that after five years there are no reported live births in the UK. And how many families have been taken on a journey of hope that has delivered nothing? We don't know. I hope there is hidden evidence. I hope there is hidden data. I hope that there are families. But I can't make legislation on things I can't see and a hope that is, I think, sadly, displaced and misplaced. Minister. Oh. 
Thanks, thank, thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Look, very, very briefly, I want to reiterate uh, some of the points uh, Senator Watts and Still John uh, have made, uh, which is that uh, this bill provides for a carefully staged approach. Within that staged approach, there are regulatory regimes put in place in terms of the type of licensing regime that, uh, that would have to be applied by the NHMRC's Embryo Research Licensing Committee. And there are strong criminal penalties that apply to those sorts of licensing regimes to provide for an effective regulatory approach. Stage one around this, yes, is focused on clinical trials. It then moves uh, through, should, um, should of course the evidence be there uh, in terms of supporting uh, the evaluation of those stage one clinical trials, uh, it then moves to a stage of treatment. Um, there would need to be regulations made, as you've heard, uh, but as is the case in so many, so many fields, those regulations are disallowable. The parliament would not lose the opportunity to have a say. The parliament would absolutely have a say as disallowance motions are moved on a regular basis. Maybe not as regularly as Senator Steele John would like, um, and, uh, and as a government minister, I wouldn't encourage too many more of them. Uh, but it is absolutely the right of every member of either chamber uh, to move such disallowance. And then, of course, the power of such disallowance is it must be voted on. It must be debated, or else the disallowance is considered to have been carried. Uh, so that is a significant power that senators carry when that is the case. As others have noted as well, uh, there are further provisions which would enable states or territories uh, to enact laws for authorising, uh, providing yet further restrictions that, uh, that could be applied. Uh, so I contend that, uh, that these amendments uh, of uh, Senator Canavan's are unnecessary, uh, Chair, and urge the Senate to uh, oppose those amendments and respect uh, the proposal that is being developed as part of the consultations undertaken. Uh, Senator Pratt. I think it's very important to note that current research licences under the NHMRC are reported on very regularly to this place, and that that is um, a very, very robust process. It is of great concern to me that we would be inserting new processes for oversight in this, uh, when it comes to embryo research that deviates from the robust processes we already have, because that is when mistakes and errors happen. There is no reason for this legislation to be amended so that embryos uh, in this research area are treated any differently from the myriad of uh, IVF research that already takes place and is regulated under the NHMRC. There have been no other senators seeking the call. I'll put the question that the amendments 1 to 11 and 13 to 55 be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those of that opinion say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring of bells.
order. Stop the bells. So the uh, question is that amendments 1 to 11 and 13 to 55 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. And it being 9 p.m., the committee reports to the Senate. And pursuant to order, I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Oh, you're the first speaker. Uh, please leave the chamber quietly, please. I intend to call Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I want to talk about the, the dustbin fire that is ethics and honesty in, in Queensland under the state Labor government there. We've got a state Labor government, and hear this, everybody, a state Labor government that sent goons from the Premier's office to raid the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. So this is Queensland in 2021-22, where the Premier's office sent goons to raid the Office of the Integrity Commissioner. So they sent the Integrity Commissioner home, and they went into her office, and they got the laptop. There was a secret laptop in her office. And do you know what they did to this laptop? Do you know what they did to this laptop? They went and wiped it. They wiped this laptop. So we don't know what's on this laptop. You know, it could be photos of a prominent politician with a footballer. It could be photos of a prominent ex-politician getting wads of cash in a car park. It could be, I don't know, the conscience of Stephen Miles. Uh, it could be the taxpayer-funded polling that, that Labor have used to run Queensland uh, over the last uh, 30 years or so. So these, these goons raided the Integrity Commissioner's office got the laptop and then wiped it. Now, this, this sounds like a, 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 a page that's fallen out of a draft of a script for a Jason Bourne movie, and I wish it was, but it's not. This is public governance in Queensland in the 21st century, where we've got an effective one-party state, where uh, the, the dominant Labor Party have entrenched themselves in the bureaucracy and in the judiciary, and anyone who dares, dares raises issues about the governance of, of, of that state is ostracised. So we've had the integrity commissioner chased out the door. We've had the, the state archivist. The state archivist has, has been chased back to New Zealand, and the state archivist has become a whistleblower. And for the, this person's efforts, they are treated 
effectively as a criminal, with, with, with the Premier and the henchmen and henchwomen in her cabinet continually attacking him and attacking what he is saying. And this is quite, quite interesting, uh, Mr. President. What the State Archivist has said is that, is that, that his reports, when he submitted them, his annual reports, when he submitted, were, were edited by the minister's office. So these reports were put in. He had raised concerns about issues to do with the public governance, the public keeping of, of records in Queensland. And, and what would happen is the Premier's office or the, the Minister's office would sit there and they'd get the, the, the tipics out or they, they'd get out the, 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 you know, the, the nikos and, and black it out or they would just yeah, redact what they didn't like and send it back. Now this, this isn't the, the, um, the, the beacon of, of a liberal democracy. This is something that you would see in some despotic South American regime where, where public ser servants who do not agree uh, with the ruling dictator are sent off to sent off to camps, but welcome, welcome to Queensland, welcome to Queensland, where goons raid the office of the Integrity Commissioner. Now, Mr. President, the other issue that, that I'm concerned about in Queensland comes down to, to, to what we need to do with our economy, and in particular, how we ensure that the resource sector and how we ensure that the agriculture sector is, is, is drought-proofed. And that means the building of more dams. So it is the building of, of Urana, it is the building of, of, of Hell's Gate, and it is also um, the, the rebuilding, uh, hopefully, of Paradise Dam. And I've spoken about Paradise Dam in this place for every sitting fortnight. And, and Paradise Dam is the worst infrastructure fail in the history of this country. The worst infrastructure fail in the history of this country. And, and what do we see yesterday is that the Premier of Queensland has come out and said, oh, whoopsie, whoops a daisy, made a bit of a mistake here. We built a billion dollar dam, you know, we didn't do it properly, we used clay glue instead of cement. Uh, we better do something here. Oh, by the way, our federal government, we need $600 million. Welcome to Queensland in the 21st century, where it has been run as a one party state, where, where ethics, have, got in a, 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 have left the building, got in a taxi and have gone over the border, where, where we've got the greatest infrastructure fail in the history of Federation, well, welcome to Queensland. And I'll be doing everything possible to ensure that we get Scott Morrison and Barnaby Joyce returned in the coming election and also that David Crucifilli becomes Premier in Senator three McGrath. years' time. Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you, Mr President. Last week, the Australian Electoral Commission published po political donations data from 2021 uh, in their financial year. And guess how much the fossil fuel companies gave to the Liberal, National and Labor parties? More than $1 million. There's no doubt that the dirty donations from Woodside, Chevron, Minerals Resources are influencing WA's second-rate climate policy. In 2020-21, Woodside donated $232,000 to the Liberal and National and Labor parties. In return, they received the green light from the WA government to go ahead with the climate-wrecking Scarborough Gas Project. The Scarborough Project will do irreversible damage to the Murujuga rock art and the Seven Sisters song line. It will also release 1.6 billion tonnes of carbon pollution into the atmosphere over the next 25 years. Chevron also donated a total of $74,650 to the Liberal National and Labor parties. Chevron's WA gas plants are responsible for producing millions of tonnes of emissions into our atmosphere every single year. In fact, Chevron's Gorgon um, gas project, the world's biggest attempt at a carbon capture storage project has been a big, expensive failure that continues to leak huge amounts of pollution. Mineral Resources, a lithium and iron ore company, donated a whopping total of 222,400 to the major parties. And it's no surprise that the Mineral Resources plan to develop the oil and gas basins in WA are out of line with limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. At a time when we need urgent climate action, we have governments handing out blank cheques to big corporations and billionaires to enable, enable those climate-wrecking projects. 
WA gas industry is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in my home state. And if we add up the current and the proposed gas projects, WA is on track to emit 41.6 million tonnes of CO2 every single year. This is equivalent to nearly half of our total emissions each year. So how did we get here? It's clear that the millions donated from the fossil fuel industry to the major parties every year has influenced their continued support for coal and gas. The WA government will tell you that major oil and gas projects like Scarborough will create jobs. Well, what they won't tell you is that the oil and gas extraction industry employs less than 1 per cent of WA's workforce. In fact, the WA government is seeking to create jobs for West Australians and it's off and is better off supporting literally any other industry except the gas industry. As long as there's big money in politics, we will see fossil fuel companies setting our climate policy in this country. But the time's up. People can see the urgent climate action that is delayed because the Liberals and Labor take millions in donations from big coal and gas corporations and the billionaires who own them. So what will the Greens do about it? For our starters, we are the only party to plan a ban on all political donations from coal, oil and gas industries. We will cap all other donations to $1,000 per year and we will limit the amount the political parties can spend on their elections. We will stop the revolving door of ministers and advisers moving from politics directly to the fossil fuel industry. And we would establish a National Integrity Commission to hold all politicians accountable. The Greens have a model for strong corruption watchdog that is already passed here in the Senate, spearheaded by my colleague Senator Waters. Establishing a federal anti-corruption commission is in the term of the government that was pledged to make, that was made by this Prime Minister at the last election. The big parties have voted against our reforms because they don't want to bite the hand that feeds them. At, but in a balance of power after the next election, the Greens will push the next government to reform election funding, clean up politics and achieve urgent action on climate change. Thank you. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr President. I rise to congratulate the Prime Minister and Minister Lee, the Environment Minister, for the new announcement of $1 billion in new reef funding. Now, uh, I guess it's not always um, uh, an obvious link for me to be standing to talk about that kind of environmental policy, but I think it is terrific. And as somebody who's based in Townsville in the heartland of the Great Barrier Reef, uh, I know only too well uh, the passion for which uh, our communities feel about the health of the reef, uh, reef fishing, reef tourism. Uh, as a, a weekend and, and holiday activity. I also uh, am pleased because this funding gives hope to North Queensland farmers because it is recognition, recognition of the terrific work that they have been doing to date and to discredit the absolute rubbish that's been spread about uh, farming uh, and their impact on the Great Barrier Reef. The Senate inquiry on the reef regulations, the Queensland reef regulations, heard the extraordinary lengths that cattle and cane farmers have gone uh, to to reduce their environmental impacts, whether it be planting trees, reducing fertiliser and chemical use, sharing knowledge and encouraging each other using the latest technology. Uh, they've all, we also heard about land-based runoff that affects just 3 per cent of the Great Barrier Reef and that AIMS uh, doesn't consider farming to be the major threat to coral. In fact, that is water temperatures. But try telling that to the Queensland Labor government. Regulatory overreach, threats of huge fines, never-ending paperwork, no recognition for work already done, refusing to engage in on-farm extension offices and ignoring all evidence that proves that their narrative and increased regulation was just plain wrong. The 2021 Queensland Government Water Quality Report Card gave farmers an A rating for reducing fertiliser use and increasing water quality. So why then does it continue to regulate them so harshly? We then had the Catter Party come out and say that the funding is demonising farmers because it has been used to address their runoff. 
Well, nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm here to assure farmers we will not be standing over you with a big stick. We know your livelihood depends on good land management, less erosion, less chemical use. And it just so happens that in helping farmers to achieve this has the added bonus of showing the world how much farmers care for their greatest natural asset. A federally funded trial in North Queensland Burdekin District, run by North Queensland Dry Tropics NRM, has resulted in a 2,000 tonne reduction in urea use and a corresponding 1,200 tonne reduction in nitrogen entering reef waters with no loss in productivity between 2017 and 2022. These are the sort of programs that we will be sponsoring because we believe farmers are the best managers of the land because it is profitable farmers and prosperous communities that are the best environmental managers. And the best part of this announcement is that urban runoff will now also be studied. Long-time sewerage outflows have been suspected of offsetting farmers' nitrogen reduction efforts. And this is a massive win. It will show farmers not to blame for all nitrogen in reef waters, uh, because cane farmers uh, and milling operations are growing. The prices are up, they're great employers, they have a crop that is a terrific carbon sequester, and we are now discovering more and more alternate uses for cane fibre, uh, which makes that crop again more profitable. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with Pacific Biotechnologies Re uh, Regen Aqua Algal Water Treatment System. Now they have been treating a prawn farm a runoff um, and have been able to successfully trial the treatment of human sewerage and turn that into farm fertiliser, the perfect circular economy uh, of taking human waste and using it to increase uh, farm productivity. I have met with them. They have drawn serious interest from the federal government and it could be a game changer for reef management not just here in Australia but around the world. So again, I congratulate this government because it is only a prosperous economy that it can uh, look after its, its environment. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you, President. I rise this evening to acknowledge the tremendous, powerful speeches given by two remarkable Australian women at the National Press Club today. Two women who have not only changed the national conversation, but I believe who have and will continue to change the nation. Whose bravery and courage, not just today, but every day, they have raised their voices, raised truth to power, has amplified and electrified a cultural movement for change that I believe will deliver an Australia that is safer and better, especially for women and children. As a nation, I believe we owe Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins so much. I hope everyone in this parliament has listened to their speeches today. There is so much to say and to reflect on in their speeches. But in the short time I have available to me this evening, there is one word which both Ms Higgins and Ms Tame used, which I want to reflect on, and that word's accountability. Ms Higgins said, without accountability, we are back to a world where we are describing the problem being seen as sufficient. And Ms Tame said, in regards to the sexual abuse of children and others, there can be no progress without accountability. It is time to deliver accountability, whether that's in implementing the recommendations of the Jenkins report or in doing the work required to be able to measure progress under the National Plan to reduce violence against women and their children, because it is accountability that will be essential to delivering the change that is so desperately needed. And I am not naive to the challenges involved in that. To deliver accountability requires tough conversations and tough considerations. It requires us to reflect deeply, honestly, and it requires an earnest and unwavering commitment to change to challenging conversations, and it requires transparency. I believe there is much for all of us to learn from these two remarkable women. As individuals, yes, but more importantly, as parliamentarians and as legislators, as community leaders. 
because it's up to our generation within these walls, within this chamber and this parliament to respond to their calls, to deliver the accountability that they demand and to deliver change. I want to be part of a parliament that is accountable to the people it serves and to the people who work within it. Senator Henderson.